Now today we are going to talk about the drugs used in congestive cardiac failure, right? Before really I go to the use of the drugs, I will tell you some basic problems which are present in a patient with cardiac failure. Once you know the basic problems in a patient with cardiac failure, then you will be able to understand what kind of drug will be useful to solve those problems. First I will talk, talk to you about the normal heart, how the normal heart work and giving you an analogy. Then we will talk about what happens in a failing heart. So let's go with a very simple analogy, right? And in this analogy, I will make a graph, right? You know Frank Starling's law, Frank Starling's law states that whenever, do you know Frank Starling's law? You don't know it. Okay, listen. What is Frank Starling law? According to Frank Starling law, whenever you are filling the left ventricle or right ventricle with the blood, if you put more blood in the right ventricle or left ventricle, it will contract more. If you will put less blood, it will contract less. It seems very logical. For example, here is left ventricle, right? Let's suppose there is more ventricular filling. If there is too much ventricular filling, then naturally at the end of diastole, and diastolic volume will be low or high? It will be high. If there is more cardiac filling, it more venous return, end diastolic volume will be high. When end diastolic volume will be high, then before the contraction, stretch on the myocardium will be high. Because more you put the blood into the ventricle, more it stretches the wall of the ventricle. It's very easy to understand, even a small kid can understand that in the ventricle, if you're putting more and more blood, it is stretched more and more. Now, Frank Starling law says, more you stretch the ventricle, more it contracts within physiological limit. You should not stretch to rupture it. Basically, myocardial contractility are the basic principle. More you stretch the ventricle, more it contracts. It means more you put the blood in, more it will eject. So it's the intrinsic regulation. And if you put less blood, it will eject less. So it is intrinsic regulation that if more blood is coming in, it will contract more strongly. If left, left, less blood is coming in, it will contract less efficiently. Is that clear? Now, this is end diastolic volume. And if we put end diastolic volume here, I will make a larger diagram, right? That if we put end diastolic volume on the x-axis, end diastolic volume, right? And here we put the contractility, contractility of the ventricle. All of you know, when end diastolic volume is increased, contractility is increased, isn't it? Right? And this is the normal curve of a healthy heart, right? What we are showing in this healthy curve, that whenever end diastolic volume is progressively increased, cardiac output or contractility is progressively increased. Now, contractility can be measured by the stroke volume or it can be measured by cardiac output. Is that right? Now, the point which you have to understand that normally heart is operating at which point? Heart is normally operating in a healthy heart. How much is the end diastolic volume? About 140 ml. Healthy left ventricle, when it is fully, you know, loaded with the blood, it is about 140, 150 ml. And then it will start contraction. And normally, when blood has one, uh, left ventricle has 140 ml and it will do healthy contraction, about 50% blood will be ejected. So what will be the stroke volume? Yes, about 70 ml. So it means when left ventricle has how much blood? End diastolic volume is 140, right? And at this end diastolic volume, how much blood is going out? 70 ml. Is that right? So normal heart is operating at point number one at this point. Normal heart is operating at this point. Now, if you increase the venous return to the heart, healthy heart, for example, you give me a drug which constrict my vein, then more blood will be coming to my heart. Then heart has to have more end diastolic volume. Then heart has to have more contraction and more cardiac output. Is that clear? If you give a drug which dilates my veins, then blood will pool into veins venous return will decrease and cardiac filling will decrease, contractility will decrease. So again, if you give in a healthy heart, first I'm talking about the healthy heart, if you produce venoconstriction, right, that will take end diastolic volume from 140, 
42, let's suppose 200, then naturally this in this direction contractility will move, maybe out of 200, now it is ejecting 100 ml. Still it is maintaining how much ejection? 50 percent. Is that right? And if you give veno dilator, then end diastolic volume is reducing, contractility will also reduce and it will move in this direction. Is that right? So this is a healthy curve, right? In a healthy myocardium, where increasing end diastolic volume increases cardiac output, decreasing end diastolic volume decreases cardiac output. Now we go to the what happens in a failing heart. What happens in a failing heart? Now, now you imagine that my left ventricle develop a disease, suppose ischemic heart disease. And due to repeated ischemic attacks, my left ventricular myocardium becomes weak. And if my when my left ventricular myocardium becomes weak, do you think its contractility will increase or decrease? Decrease. Then what will happen? This type of heart which is having reduced contractility power, what it will do? For a given 140 ml, will it eject 70 ml? No. At 140 ml, maybe it will eject 50 ml. Is that right? So, it means the whole curve will drop down, right? Now, let me make the curve of a failing heart. This is a curve of the failing heart. What I show? For every given end diastolic volume, as compared to the healthy, there is less cardiac output. Is that right? If you increase end diastolic volume in a fill, filling heart, for example, you take it 200, again at 200 normal heart gives so much output, but this heart is giving less output. So what we really see, the first curve was healthy heart curve, function curve, and this is filling heart curve. What is the difference in them? That even though both conditions by increasing end diastolic volume increase contractility, but contractility produced by healthy heart is more and contractility produced by the failing heart is less. Is that clear? It means, let's suppose I develop myocardial infarction and that myocardial infarction is a large area which is infarcted. So, large area of the left ventricle is not pumping well. So, immediately my cardiac output will drop. Because if a big area of left ventricle is infarcted and not pumping, overall contractility of left ventricle will drop. So what will happen there? From point 1, my heart will start falling and point 2. So this is what will happen to a from healthy heart shifting to a failing heart. The contractility drop from higher level to low level on the graph. Now, when contractility will drop, then what will happen? We will make a diagram here about the hemodynamics of a failing heart. Let's suppose this is the heart which is very weak. There's a very poor contractile heart. Now what should happen to this heart which is poorly contracted? Cardiac output is less. Cardiac output is more or less? Cardiac output is less. Whenever cardiac output is less, let's suppose this is carotid sinus. When heart is poorly pumping, blood flow to the carotid sinus is less and carotid sinus will inform to the central nervous system that blood pressure is falling. Now here is your central nervous system. So in the failing heart, as cardiac output will drop, is that right? Pressure in the sinus system will drop. That will inform the central nervous system about the dropping cardiac output. That will stimulate the which system? Vasomotor system. This is an emergency. Sympathetic nervous system is activated. So that will lead to sympathetic outflow. That will lead to sympathetic outflow. When in the filling heart, when cardiac output drop, then sympathetic outflow is decreased or increased? Increased. Sympathetic outflow is increased. We will talk about what is the purpose of this sympathetic outflow. Let's suppose this is right side of the heart and again you keep in your mind that here is the arterial tree and there is, yes what is here, venous system and just make for understanding two capillary networks and we will see now what really happens in the compensatory mechanisms. And in this reference, especially, I would love to mention the role of kidney as well, so that that role of the kidney and renin angiotensin system should be integrated. That I will show here. Let's suppose this is the blood flow through kidney. 
Is that right? Now we will see what really happens to this patient. Left ventricular contractility become less, cardiac output become less, pressure in the bearer receptor sensing system, blood pressure sensing system, we have less pressure, central nervous system brings sympathetic outflow. Now what the sympathetic outflow will do? Remember, initially it will be good for the heart, in the long run it will be bad for the heart. How it will be good for the heart? Look here. It will stimulate SA node. Sympathetic outflow will stimulate SA node. So heart rate will go up, increase heart rate. It will stimulate the ventricular contractility. So positive inotropic, so increase in stroke volume. So in this way, these two things heart has done initially in a good way. That as soon as blood pressure fall, cardiac output fall, blood pressure fall, sympathetic outflow come, heart rate increases, stroke volume increases. And when heart rate and stroke volume increase, when there is increased heart rate into increased stroke volume, what happens? What will increase? Hadayat. When heart rate increase, stroke volume increase, cardiac output increase. So this is an attempt by the sympathetic nervous system to reverse the falling cardiac output. Now, this attempt is good only for a short time. In the long run, it's very, very bad. As sometimes you go into crisis and you, you may do some short term measures which are good for you and sometimes if those short term measures go for a long time, they may, may become bad for you. Is that right? Why this is bad? Listen carefully. If failure is just for 2 hour, 5 hour, 10 hours, no problem. But failure is for months and years, increase sympathetic activity Right? That will produce pathology in the heart. Why? What is the problem? Let me tell you. What's the problem? When sympathetic nervous system, not only it is stimulating the SA node and ventricular contractility, sympathetic nervous system will also stimulate the arterial tree. Let's suppose these are the arterioles. Sympathetic nervous system is also stimulating the arterioles. Sympathetic nervous system is also stimulating the venules. Now what will happen? Listen carefully. When arterioles are stimulated, arterioles will dilate or constrict. If arterioles are constricting, it is good for failing heart or bad for failing heart? It's very bad. You know why? Because when arterioles are getting constricted, now for left ventricle to push the blood from the arterial tree to venous tree becomes more difficult. Because arteriolar constriction lead to increase resistance for the left ventricle to push the blood from arterial side to the venous side. So do you think heart will be happy with this situation or sad about this? Very sad. It is already feeling hard. It's like a sick donkey which could not perform well. At the top, you ask this donkey to perform against more resistance. This donkey is performing against more resistance. This is one bad thing which happens. Is that right? Another bad thing, look at it. You constrict the vein. Venous system constrict the veins. If all the veins become tight, more venous return, more cardiac filling. And if cardiac filling becomes too much, right, heart will again suffer. I will explain why. Now here we have to talk about a law which they know very well. Laplace's law. What is that? Pressure is equal to tension by? Tension by? Radius. Jamie is good. Now this law you should be very clear about. What is mentioned, meant by the tension? Tension is the power generated in the myocardial wall. When myocardium contract, it develops a tension in the wall. And when myocardium develops a tension, contracting myocardium will develop tension, that produces the pressure here. That tension results into what? Pressure. This is the tension which produces the pressure so that a cardiac output should be maintained. Plus, this tension is working on a radius of the heart. Now, what is the relationship? Listen carefully. If you increase the tension, pressure generated are more. And if you increase the radius, pressure generated are less. So, we can say the pressure which left heart can generate, pressure which left heart can generate right, is directly proportional to tension and inversely proportional to radius. Is that clear? Now already there is a trouble. This is a healthy heart or sick heart? A sick heart. Its capability to produce tension is more or less? Less. Of course.
course, it is uh, having an infarction and some of its part is not producing tension. So total tension which this heart is producing, failing heart, total tension which it is producing is more or less, less. So write down here. That tension in a failing heart, no. no. This is a primary pathology. Tension generated, tension which can be produced in a failing heart is less. Is that clear? Is disease heart? But look at it. The stupidity of the sympathetic nervous system. Short term benefit, long term damage. What is the long term damage? I told you when long term arterioles remain constricted, long term arterioles remain constricted, then it has to generate more pressure or less pressure. It has to generate more pressure to push the blood through narrow arterioles. So this is a stupid thing that already it is very sick heart, it cannot produce tension. And from sick heart you are demanding more pressure. If sympathetic nervous system is activated, it will keep the arterioles narrow. And if arterioles remain narrow, then it has to produce too much tension to produce too much pressure so that it can push the blood through the system. Now, it is just like a sick donkey and you are asking it to do work, too much work. Is that right? This is one problem. So, sympathetic nervous system, it, here it is doing a favor to the hemodynamics of failing heart or it is producing a trouble for that. It's a trouble for that. Trouble number one. Now, look at the trouble number two. Heart is already working very hard against the very vessels which are progressively getting narrow. Another trouble starts simultaneously that it produces venoconstriction. When it produces venoconstriction, sympathetic nervous system produces venoconstriction, it is done with all the best intention. But sometimes with the best intention, you may even kill the other person. Sympathetic nervous system is doing good intention that it is leading to venoconstriction. Intention is that if there is venoconstriction, there should be more venous return. And if there is more venous return, there should be more cardiac output. But the problem is this, that if you are constantly keeping more venous return, it means cardiac filling is more. If cardiac filling is more, then radius is increase. increase. And if you are making the radius high, can heart produce pressures? It will further fail. So primary problem in a failing heart was that it cannot produce tension primarily. Is that right? Due to that reason, it could not produce a pressure to maintain the cardiac output. Secondary trouble comes due to sympathetic nervous system that it constricts the arterioles. So now heart has to pump against more resistance and pressure is required more than the normal situation and tension is less than the normal situation. At the top when venoconstriction occurs and diastolic volume become too much and radius increases. So smaller tension divided by larger radius produces very little pressures. So what is happening to this unfortunate heart? That Intrinsic problem is this, that there is capacity to produce smaller tension and due to increase venous return, radius is more. So smaller tension divided by larger radius is producing too little pressure. So progressively heart capability to generate pressure is reducing. But due to arterial contraction, constriction, demand for pressure is more. So heart will further fail. So what will happen to this heart? Look at it. Because it cannot produce pressure, it means whatever is coming in, can it push out? No. So what will happen to this heart? It will dilate. Why it will dilate? That normally initially it was receiving 140 ml and healthy situation ejecting 70 ml. Now it may be having 240 ml and ejecting only 40 ml. So every time it gets more blood and eject less blood. So progressively dilate. Now look at the misery of this heart, sick, tension, very poor and progressively radius is becoming larger and result is worth progressive drop in the pressures, progressive drop in cardiac output. That is why when heart becomes dilated, feeling heart, real good doctor will get upset. He knows a very good doctor know whenever heart start dilating, it means radius is progressively increasing and if heart was already failing, the doctor has an idea that tension development capacity is less and progressive dilatation lead to further drop in pressure generation, further drop in cardiac output. Okay, this was one trouble. So sympathetic nervous system in the long run is good or bad? Long term is good or bad? 
repaired. Now look the second mechanism which second mechanism is renin angiotensin aldosterone excess. It comes with all good intention and kills the situation. First sympathetic nervous system came to help and hurt the heart. Now renin angiotensin system will come with good intention to help the heart but make the trouble for the heart. Now let me tell you what renin angiotensin system will do. You already know. If heart, when heart will start feeling, then renal perfusion is more or less. If renal perfusion is decreased, then naturally there is more renin production or less renin production. So in this patient, kidney will produce more renin, more than normal. Now what are the reasons of more renin? Number one, that blood flow to kidney is less. So baroreceptor system of juxta glomerular operator senses that there is low flow and low pressure, it will release renin. Secondly, when there is less flow to the heart, uh, sorry, less flow to the kidney, then glomerular filtration is more or less? Less. less. When glomerular filtration is less, then the amount of sodium reaching to macula densa is more or less? Less. So macula densa also senses there is something wrong and it also releases further increase in renin. At the top already, sympathetic nervous system is Overstimulated, understimulated. It is overstimulated. So from sympathetic nervous system, some fibers are coming to the juxtaglomerular operators. They also stimulate the juxtaglomerular operators. What will happen? More renin. So it means in failing heart, this progressive increase in renin. Now there must be some benefit in the biological system. When there is so much renin, you know it, that renin will convert angio tensinogen into angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin converting enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme will work on angiotensin 1 and convert into angiotensin 2. So it means in a failing heart there is progressive increase in circulating levels of angiotensin 2. Now there must be advantage of it and there must be disadvantage of this. The biological system is doing this thing that whenever renal perfusion is down, of course angiotensin 2 will become high. Now what are the advantages of angiotensin 2 in failing heart? And then we'll talk about disadvantages as well. We have just discovered that when there's less renal flow, the more renin angiotensin aldosterone excess stimulated, right? First tell me why, what are the advantages? Because if body is doing this game, that in failing heart it is increasing renin angiotensin aldosterone system, there must be some sensible benefit and later on I will tell you there is also damage. Number one, look when angiotensin 2 is more plus aldosterone is also, aldosterone is also more. Now you imagine, look at the whole system. When angiotensin is more, angiotensin constrict the veins. Intention is that, that when there is constriction of the veins, there should be more venous return and more endastolic volume so that there can be more cardiac output. But actually for failing heart, diameter will become dangerously increased. So it will help or it will deteriorate. Deteriorate. Intention was good that normally in a healthy heart, when you constrict the veins, increasing venous return usually increases cardiac output. But in a failing heart, increasing venous return unfortunately increases the radius so much that further drop in the performance of the heart. This is one good intention which turns out with bad result. Secondly, Angiotensin 2 was trying to support the blood pressure because in cardiac failure, blood pressure goes down. So angiotensin 2 to support the blood pressure does, what is this? Arteriolo-constriction. When arteriolo-constriction is done, do you think it is good for failing heart or bad for failing heart? Bad for failing heart. So there another trouble added that now you have demanded more pressure from a failing heart. Is that right? So what is happening? Angiotensin 1 is angiotensin 2 is producing venoconstriction as well as arteriolo constriction. By venoconstriction, it is progressively increasing the radius, and by arteriolo constriction, it is uh, progressively increasing the resistance against which heart has to pump. Is that right? These are troubles. Then another trouble. Aldosterone is also there. Aldosterone will retain salt and water in the body. This salt and water which is retained by the kidney will increase blood volume or decrease blood volume. And increased blood volume will increase venous return. So ventricular filling is more and radius is more. It's good or bad? Bad. 
what I'm trying to put in your mind, the purpose of all this discussion is that patients with chronic heart failure, they overstimulate sympathetic nervous system and these patients have chronically overstimulated renin angiotensin aldosterone system and both these chronically activated system really damage further to the failing heart. Now another thing. Not only the system will produce venoconstriction, arterial constriction, and salt and water retention, angiotensin to stimulate sympathetic outflow. And if there's a strong sympathetic outflow, further arterial constriction, venoconstriction, good for heart, bad for heart? Bad for heart. So it means these neurohumoral compensatory mechanisms are dangerous for the heart in the long run. Then I tell you another thing which is very important. If angiotensin 2 level and aldosterone level remain chronically high, they act as growth factors. This is one of the latest news is that these substances, if they are chronically high, they act as growth factors. So what really happens? Angiotensin 2 will stimulate the myocardial cells produce their hypertrophy. And myocardial cells will abnormally start producing connective tissue. Do you think heart which has abnormally hypertrophied cells, not normal hypertrophy, it is pathological hypertrophy and geometry of the cell is abnormal. At the top, cells are producing a lot of connective tissue. Do you think it's good heart or bad heart? And at the top, aldosterone produces fibrosis in the heart. These are the very new research. The aldosterone, when it is chronically high, it produces fibrosis in the heart. So these fibrotic changes and all distortions in the uh, myocardial geometry eventually lead to progressive failure of the heart. That as months keep on passing, we say heart is undergoing abnormal structural changes and abnormal morphological changes due to excessive stimulation of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone excess. And this whole dangerous changes in the heart morphology in a lump sum, they are called cardiac, cardiac remodeling. So this is another trouble. Is that right? Now you imagine that we have learned very well all these things are in the long run very bad for the heart. Now we apply these things here on the graph. Now we apply these things on the graph. Listen again, go back. What happened? Heart was performing at the normal position. Due to some disease, contractility of the heart is reduced and cardiac output drop. For the given end diastolic volume, now stroke volume is less, cardiac output is less. At this point, there is activation of sympathetic nervous system, there is activation of sympathetic nervous system at this point, and at this point, when cardiac output has dropped, sympathetic nervous system is activated as well as renin, angiotensin, aldosterone excess is activated. Is that clear? Now, what will happen due to this? For example, sympathetic nervous system produce venoconstriction. So end diastolic volume will increase. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system retains salt and water in the body. End diastolic volume will increase. Angiotensin 2 produces venoconstriction. End diastolic volume will increase. So all these things will increase the end diastolic volume. When they will increase the end diastolic volume, heart will move from this point to this point progressively. Point number three. What we really see? That end diastolic volume which was previously how much in healthy heart? 140. Now here it has become 240. But with 140 in healthy heart it was 70 ml out. Is that right? With 140 in diseased heart maybe it was only you can say 35 ml out. Is that right? By retaining too much fluids in the body and producing too much constriction, what did we do? We increased the end diastolic volume too much. But when end diastolic volume was increased, we are expecting a big increase in cardiac output. But unfortunately, cardiac output is increased only mildly from here to here, maybe 35 to 45. Did it go to normal level? No. Why did not go? One major reason was that the myocardium was weak. And another reason was that we are constricting the arteries. Of course, if you are increasing the end diastolic volume, heart will love to contract and produce cardiac output. But if you are constricting the arterioles, 
it means heart has to produce ejection against higher resistance and if heart has to produce ejection against higher resistance can disease heart can produce that much output no due to that reason curve which was supposed to move upward it moved very little up again by increasing the end diastolic volume biological system was expecting we have done great that filling the heart more we are going to have very big cardiac output but it does not happen because biological system has done stupid thing that no good thing it has done increase ventricular filling and bad thing it has done arterial constriction and due to increase arterial constriction cardiac output could not be increased as much as much was expected so there's little increase in cardiac output so filling heart is operating now under which circumstances in the long run point number 3 now if you don't treat this patient and patient keep on suffering with excessive amount of angiotensin 2 and aldosterone heart will undergo structural changes pathological remodeling and when heart will become too weak then what will happen it will further start moving to the dropping situation cardiac output will further drop you see end diastolic volume is progressively increasing but now cardiac output is increasing or not increasing not increasing do you think it's all happening good or bad it's bad so this is the donkey with a lot of end diastolic volume and has to work against too much resistance its back is breaking is that right and drugs have to work to improve it now let me tell you uh, do you have the concept of pre load and after load right but they, do you have more or less i will just tell in a very few words what is pre load pre load is the amount of blood in the ventricle at the end of the diastole on which ventricle has to produce contraction so what is pre load pre load is load in the ventricle before the contraction and what is pre load end diastolic volume so actually what is this increasing we say end diastolic volume is increasing actually we should say there is pre load increasing what is pre load the load in the ventricle before it contract and what is after load after load is the resistance against which ventricle has to perform and that is the arterial constriction from today onward you have to remember that if you produce veno constriction pre load is increased right and diastolic volume is increased if you produce veno dilatation then blood will move less pre load is decreased and if you produce arterial constriction after load is increase heart has to pump against more resistance and if you do arterial dilator drug after load is decreased is that right now with this graph we'll make another analogy here that let's suppose this is your heart i told you heart is a donkey let's suppose this is your heart right this is like donkey and this donkey has end diastolic volume here this is a load on the heart what is this this is a load on the heart before it starts its performance is that right first look at the normal then go to abnormal in healthy donkey usually it has how much here 140 ml and it will move upward and healthy donkey after moving against this resistance what is the resistance arterial low contraction total peripheral resistance after load so pre load is over it and this this is after load after load so donkey carries the pre load and performs against after load and then it will of course then it will come back but it's a very stupid donkey you know what it will do out of 140 ml it carried it work on 140 ml it will leave only 70 ml here and bring 70 ml back with it and again carry more blood and develop how much again and that's only volume of 140 go up right so every minute how many cycles it will do 70 to 80 cycles it relaxes here is the diastolic situation here is the peak of systole in diastolic situation it take how much blood 140 ml normally it does have 50% ejection and then come back to this position and again take up the load and goes up then come back again and this is what is happening this analogy is clear now in filling heart what happen first of all look at this 
This donkey is crying. It's very sad. Let look at the heart of the donkey. Now this is crying donkey. Why it is crying? The reason being that its one leg is broken. Three leg donkey. Right? This three leg donkey. Now its contractility and performance is more or less. Now, what you do? This is normal preload. Now it was moving very slowly upward. And it was taking less performance there. So central nervous system is sitting here and kidney is sitting here. They think why the performance is less. Sympathetic nervous system fire. As well as angiotensin, renin angiotensin, aldosterone system fire. What are the results? Do you think now this three-legged donkey, which is a weak donkey, when the compensatory mechanism work, preload is increased or decreased? Increased? Now look at it. Very weak donkey with extra load. Do you think? It's a happy donkey or sad donkey? Very sad. This is happens. This is truly what happens to a failing heart. That when failing heart, when sympathetic nervous system is activated, as well as renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated, venous return is more, and this increased venous return put too much load in the ventricle, but this ventricle cannot contract. So it will become more weak. Somehow it will go up, and it will become so much confused that out of such a big load, it will leave little load there, and again slip back. Is that right? Another thing. Increase neurohumoral compensatory mechanism like sympathetic nervous system and renin angiotensin aldosterone system, it will produce arteriolar constriction. Now look at it. This angle has increased. What do you think? Now this donkey has to go all the way up with more load. This three leg donkey, right? And compensatory mechanism is putting more preload and increasing this after load, the resistance against which it has to perform. Preload is increased by venous return and fluid accumulation, you know, salt and water retention. And afterload is increased by arterial construction. Do you think its performance will progressively improve or go down? At the top, chronically elevated, you know, what is this? Uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone will further make the health of the donkey weak. Is that right? So, failing heart has these troubles, excessive preload, excessive afterload and very weak contractility and progressively failing. Is that right? Now, we want to help this donkey. Here is the pharmacology enters, right? We have correlated the physiology and pathology. Now we go that we have discussed this was normal curve physiology. This is the pathology and now we'll see how this pathology can be reversed by pharmacology towards the normal side. Now what we have to do, it's very easy to understand. What should we do? If you want to help this donkey. Yeah, what about preload should be increased or decreased? Decreased. Right? Number one, this is weeping too much. So, first treatment should be you should somehow reduce the preload. Donkey will pray for you. Right? From a failing heart, first management trick is reduce the blood volume and venous return. Preload, reduce the end diastolic volume. Second help is that it was going to work on very high resistance, turn it down. Reduce the afterload, pharmacologically. When you want to reduce the preload, you will give the drugs which should dilate the vein or constrict the vein? Dilator. Yeah, the drugs which are veno dilators. The point which you have to correlate, the failing heart is a sick donkey with a lot of preload, lot of and diastolic volume, you must try to reduce the venous return to the heart so that load should be less. So give vena veno dilator so that when veins will dilate, look here. In failing heart, you give the veno dilator. So there's less blood returning to the heart. And advantage of veno dilator is very easy. That radius will reduce. With given tension, it will produce better pressures. Now correlate three things in your mind. Number one, Laplace's law. Number two, Altered physiology, number three is this graph. All these things are disturbed in a failing heart. When you give venodilator or you give diuretics also to reduce blood volume. You get it? So we can give venodilator and we can give diuretics. 
Diuretics do three things. Number one, diuretics, everyone knows, produce diuresis, excessive loss of salt and water. And that reduces the blood volume. And when blood volume is reduced, when blood volume is reduced, naturally venous return is reduced and preload is reduced. So diuretic number one, they reduce the blood volume. Secondly, diuretic also do venodilator as well as arterial low dilator. Is that right? So in a failing heart, you must give venodilator drugs, you must give diuretics, to and both of them reduce the venous return, reduce the end diastolic volume, reduce the preload. So cardiac efficiency will become more or less. Yes. Right. This is, you imagine in place of donkey, and if we reduce the burden on you, your performance will become less or more? Hopefully more. But if it doesn't improve, I'll tell you what we'll do. The special drug for you. Now listen. So what happens? That we reduce the preload. First you understand in analogy. Analogy when reduce the preload, donkey is happy. Okay, let's make it happy. To someone at least. Tears are still coming but somewhat happy. Right? Number one. Number two, work on this. When you reduce the preload, end diastolic volume is increasing or decreasing. So this will move backward now. This pathological change will move backward. And when you are giving venodilator, it will start moving backward. Is that right? When it is moving backward and you have given venodilators and diuretics, do you think venous return is more or less? End diastolic volume is less. So radius is now smaller radius same tension with smaller radius will produce better pressure cardiac output will go up is that right cardiac output will go up now one more thing that not only this why don't you reduce the slope also be merciful to animals animal rights are there including the heart yes number one reduce the preload plus you reduce the afterload and if you reduce the afterload, you are going to be good your, to your donkey. You reduce it like this. How you do reduce afterload? Arterial low dilators. Now we need drugs which are arterial low dilator as well. So basic principle is dilate the veins. So less load on the heart, preload. Dilate the arterioles. Heart has to pump against less resistance. So pump will be more effective or less effective? More effective. Is that right? So what we are doing? That when you give venodilator, you reduce the radius. With the same tension, you produce more pressures. At the same time, you give arterial dilator. When you reduce arterial dilator, the pressure to be generated are more or less. When you do arterial dilatation, heart to maintain good output has to produce more pressure or less pressure? Less pressure. So again, remember, when you... It means that when you do arterial or dilatation, what really happens that, for example, heart is here. When you dilate the arterioles, what will happen? Contractility will go up or uh, cardiac output will go up or down? Cardiac output will go up, so it will move like this. What is happening? As soon as cardiac output went up, further reduction in end diastolic volume. Are you understanding? So it, it will not go straight up, it will go like this. These are good news or bad news for the failing heart. So this is an initial help. Try to reduce the preload on the donkey and try to reduce the resistance against which it has to work. Most of the donkeys become okay. Most of the failing heart are okay with this type of management. Reduce the preload and reduce the afterload. Is that right? Now what are the advantages of this thing? Listen now carefully. When you give venodilator and arterial or dilator, Hadayat, please be attentive. When you give arterial dilator and venodilator, something very important occur. Cardiac output will drop or it will go up? Increase. When cardiac output will increase, sympathetic nervous system is relaxed. And increased sympathetic activity also decreases. Good news, bad news? It's good news, number one. Number two, when venodilator preload is reduced and afterload is reduced, cardiac output goes up. So renal perfusion goes up. When kidney is well perfused, renin angiotensin aldosterone system relaxes. So again, it's another good news. So most of the time, to improve the function of this donkey, that is, feeling hard is reduce the preload and reduce the afterload. 
reduce the blood volume, reduce the venous tone, and reduce the arterial tone. So give the venous dilator as well as give the arterial dilator. But some donkeys are really very sick. Most of I'm talking about special situation. Not about you, special situation. <laughs> that what happens that, for example, heart is really very, very bad. You reduce, you know, too much load, and you reduce the too much, what is this? Slope, after load. Yeah. Veins are fully dilated, artery all the fully dilated, it should perform well, but still working very less, what you will do? Now you are angry, forget about the donkey's right, bring the whip out and start beating it. Please perform, I'm going to die. Yes, positive inotropic drugs. The third group of drugs which will come into uh, this situation is positive inotropic drugs. So classically, we should have Veno dilators, preload reducers, rather write it down. Now this is the crust of management. Preload, preload reducers. And we need what thing? After load, after load reducers. This is a very humane treatment of the donkey. Is that right? That reduce the burden of the donkey. Reduce the resistance against which it has performed. Most of the good donkeys will start performing. But if donkey does not perform still, then you go for severe stimulation. And that is, what is the, that thing? Positive inotropic drugs. Like Digitalis or Milrinon, Enrinon. And what they will do, on the given end diastolic volume, they will simply take it upward. Or dopamine or dobutamine. Who said dopamine, dobutamine? Yeah, dobutamine and dopamine are basically intravenously constant infusions. Orally drug which is only available in America is digitalis. Is that right? So anyway, so or, for example, heart is very much failing. At this point, if you give positive inotropic, it will simply go up. That's right? But when you give venodilators and arterial dilators, if you give purely venodilator, it will move like this. Okay, now let me tell you, these are the points. Heart is failing at this dangerous point. Now, let's look at the graph, the effect of the drugs. If you give purely venodilator, if you look at the purely venodilator, it will move in this direction. Is that right? Because venodilator will reduce the end diastolic volume. If you look purely arterial dilator, it will move in this direction. When arterioles will dilate, its performance will go up. With increasing performance, end diastolic volume will decrease. Is that right? And if you give purely positive inotropic, its performance will go up. Like this. Is that right? But when you give a combined drug, all of them, what really happens, that heart moves from this curve, moves into middle position. Right? That... You give venodilator, it comes here. You give arterial dilator, it moves like this. You give positive anotropic, it moves at this position. Uh, right? Yes. Uh, diuretics are just going to bring the preload down, right? No, no, no. Diuretic do three things. Every doctor knows that diuretics only expel the volume out. Right. This is not true. Actually, long-term use of diuretics, number one, reduces the blood volume. Number two, produces venodilatation. Number three, it produces arterial dilatation. That is why they are so commonly used in congestive cardiac failure. Because, number one, by reducing the blood volume, diuretics by reducing the blood volume, and by producing venodilatation, they reduce the load on the heart, preload on the heart. And by producing some degree of arterial dilatation, they reduce the slope. Is that right? But the most wonderful drug, the most wonderful drug in systolic, in cardiac failure, now are considered angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. The best drugs which are presently considered are angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitor. Let's look at the performance of those drugs. How they correct the disturbed pathology and its disturbed mechanisms. Now we are going to talk about which drugs? Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Of course they are captopril, Enalapril, lisinopril, many drugs, you can read it from the book. The point which I have to explain is, when you put the patient on ACE inhibitors, what will happen? 
that angiotensin 1 cannot convert into angiotensin 2. It means angiotensin 2 level will go down. Now look at the mechanism. First we will discuss on the donkey what angiotensin inhibitors are doing, angiotensin converting enzyme or captopril is doing here. Then we will talk about the, okay here, what captopril is doing here. Then I will talk about what captopril is doing on this. Then I will talk about what captopril is doing with this. So that MC could come in any ways, you should be able to handle it, right? Let's suppose you give captopril or enalapril to the patient, a failing heart. Now what are the functions of captopril? Main function is they should reduce the level of angiotensin 2 plus they should increase the level of bradykinin. These two things happen. Is that right? Because angiotensin converting enzyme normally convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 plus normally the same enzyme destroys the bradykinin. So when you block the enzyme by the captopril or enalapril, when enzyme is not working, angiotensin 1 is not converted into angiotensin 2 and bradykinin is also not destroyed. When bradykinin accumulate in the body, bradykinin is vasodilator. Bradykinin dilates the vein and arteries both. Number one. Number two, it's good for the cardiac failure patient. Secondly, there's very significant drop in angiotensin 2. Now we'll talk about what happened to this donkey with drop in angiotensin 2. When angiotensin 2 is less, when angiotensin 2 level is less, venoconstriction is less. So veins will dilate. So venous return will decrease. And diastolic volume will decrease. Radius will decrease. So pressure generated will be more. When angiotensin 2 produces uh, reduced angiotensin 2 level and failing heart, reduced angiotensin 2 level after the captopril or enalapril, when they reduce, they produce venodilatation, venous return to heart, decrease. So end diastolic volume will move from 4 position to 3 position. Is that right? So angiotensin 2, by re reduced in angiotensin 2 level, produce venodilatation, which can reduce the preload, reduce the end diastolic volume, and from 4, it will move to 3. Number 2, look here. When you are doing venodilatation, the load on this is more or less, less, so it is helpful. This is one point that we can say angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, captopril, act as preload, captopril, act as preload reducers. Number two, when captopril reduces angiotensin 2, then arteriolar constriction is decreased, arterioles dilate. If arterioles will dilate, what will be the result? If arterioles are dilated, if arterioles are dilated, afterload decreases. Heart has to pump against more resistance or less resistance? Less resistance. So cardiac output will be less or more? More. And of course, pressure to be generated are less. Is that right? Because it is dilated. So second thing is that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs, captopril, also work as afterload reducer. So single drug can reduce the preload and can reduce the afterload. It means single drug can reduce the load from here and reduce the slope. Is that right? Third action, look at the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. When angiotensin 2 is less, when angiotensin 2 is less, aldosterone is less. When aldosterone is less, salt and water retention is less. Salt and water is lost. Blood volume is low. When blood volume is low, what will happen again? Preload is reduced. So reducing angiotensin 2 reduces the preload by two ways. Number one reduces the preload by inhibiting aldosterone activity by production uh, by reducing the levels of aldosterone, by reducing the salt and water retention, or by increasing the salt and water expulsion from the body. Secondly, by direct veno dilatation. Then there's arteriolo dilatation. Then look. Another function is achieved by reduced angiotensin 2. What is the next function by, uh, advantage of reduced angiotensin 2 level? I told you one is venodilator, other is arteriolodilator, and other is reduce aldo function. So this is a very big one more advantage by reducing angiotensin 2. I told you angiotensin 2 is a very powerful stimulant of sympathetic nervous system. Angiotensin 2 
increase central sympathetic outflow, angiotensin 2 stimulates the sympathetic ganglion, angiotensin 2 stimulates the sympathetic nerve endings. But when angiotensin 2 goes down with captopril or nalapril treatment, then what happens when angiotensin 2 is less? Then sympathetic activity becomes yeah. less. When all the sympathetic activity becomes less, we know dilatation. Further we know dilatation. So we know dilatation or preload reduction is due to multiple reasons now. Don't just tell one reason and forget about it. If someone asks you how angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors of captopril help a patient with a cardiac failure, first concentrate all the mechanism which reduce preload. Number one, when angiotensin 2 is less, angiotensin 2 mediated venoconstriction is lost. Number two, when angiotensin 2 is less, aldosterone is less, salt and water is lost. Again, preload is reduced. Third, when angiotensin 2 is less, sympathetic activity is less and uh, sympathetic venomotor tone is reduced. All of these things are leading to preload reduces. Clear? Then angiotensin 2, directly, I told you, when angiotensin 2 levels are less, Angiotensin 2 mediated arteriolo constriction is also reduced. Plus, when angiotensin 2 is less, sympathetic output is less, sympathetic activity is less. So, sympathetic system mediated arteriolo constriction is also lost. So, it means two arteriolo constrictions are lost. One is when you give captopril in the patient body, two types of arteriolo constrictor influences are lost. One was giving the captopril when you reduce angiotensin 2. So, direct angiotensin 2 mediated arterial construction is abolished. Number two, angiotensin 2 in deficiency reduces sympathetic outflow. So sympathetic system mediated arterial construction is also lost. So donkey will be happy or sad? Happy. Is that right? Mustafa? Really happy, right? So what we are talking about that angiotensin to uh, captopril or anelapril reduce the preload, reduce the afterload now, the same thing we can say in another way. Now, listen carefully. When heart is underfilled, first listen, heart is overfilled, then underfilled. When heart is overfilled, the pressure during the diastole on the wall is less or more? More. So, we say diastolic stress on the myocardial walls. When you reduce the preload, diastolic stress on the myocardial wall is less. It is a good news for the heart. Number two, when arterioles are dilated, then systolic stress on the wall is reduced because heart is supposed to produce less tension and less pressures because it is beating against less resistance. With a little activity, it can produce good output. So now in two terms more I introduce that there is diastolic stress on the myocardium and there is systolic stress on myocardial wall. Whenever you reduce the preload, there is reduced diastolic stress on the diastolic stress on the my ventricular walls. And whenever you reduce afterload, there is reduced systolic stress on the ventricular walls. Is that right? When these stresses are reduced, problems like hypertrophy will be increased or decreased? Problems like hypertrophy will be decreased. So Captopril or anelapril, by chronically reducing the renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity, they reduce the diastolic stresses on the ventricular walls as well as they reduce the systolic stresses on the ventricular wall, which reduces the total growth stimuli on the ventricles. And that helps the ventricle to reduce or regress pathological remodeling. You understand it? Plus, I told you that high levels of angiotensin 2 and high levels of aldosterone can directly act on myocardial cell and alter their geometry, alter their contractility and produce, force those cells. It's very sad. Myocardial cells, real function is to do contractility. But aldosterone and high angiotensin 2 force those cells to dysfunction. First they become fat and then they become dysfunction. What is dysfunction? Rather than contractility, those cells start producing, they start producing extracellular matrix. Do you think this is a normal function of myocardial cell? No. It's just like that you are becoming doctor and someone asks you to sweep the something very dirty. It's a misuse of you. So, we make the myocardium free of this trouble. 
that when captopril and allopril are given, what happens? That chronic growth stimulation, abnormal growth stimulation by the angiotensin 2 and aldosterone is reduced. Fibrosis in the heart is reduced. Pathological hypertrophy is reduced. Pathological production of end, uh, extracellular matrix is reduced. Or simply we say patho progressive, progressive pathological remodeling is reduced. But latest news are not only progression is reduced, they say when you start these drugs after a few months, doctors have seen the already whatever pathological changes were in the heart, that regress. So, angiotensin 2 and aldosterone by chronic elevation were not only producing preload problem and afterload problem, but they were also directly increasing systolic and diastolic stresses on the myocardial wall. Plus, they were stimulating the genes in a pathological way to produce growth and hypertrophy and extracellular matrix. Everything is reduced. We say geometry of the heart which was here, when heart come back here, geometry of heart will become better. The globular heart will become normal shaped heart. What is the normal shape of the heart? Of course, you should know your doctors, isn't it? That left ventricle best perform at wind shape. I've just told you that when heart is failing, progressively, radius is increasing. In failing heart, radius is increasing and it is becoming globular heart. Every cardiologist will tell globular heart is a bad heart. Why we were giving venodilator to reduce the end diastolic volume so that cavity should come not in balloon shape but in a normal shape. We reduce the afterload so that heart pump well eject the retained end diastolic volume so that cavity should become normal. And at the top, an angiotensin 2 and aldosterone are reduced, geometry of heart become normal. I want to know, Jamie, please, what is the normal geometry of the ventricle? What is the normal shape of the cavity? It is not spherical. Yeah, he says something like this. I feel it is something like, like pear. You remember cone to eat? No, no. Use a medical term. You, he remembers some fruit. You remember something to cone. Medical term. What is the normal shape of the left ventricular cavity? Elliptical. Is that right? So, spherical heart go back to its elliptical shape with big radius to smaller radius. So we were discussing about the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, right? And we have discussed in detail the role of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs in case of patients with congestive cardiac failures. And we have discussed the benefits as well. But I would like to repeat a few words again that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors uh, not only reduce the morbidity but also reduce the mortality in the patients with cardiac failure, right? You know the reasons. What are the reasons? Why the morbidity and mortality both are reduced? One reason is that they reduce the preload and afterload on heart, on ventricles. One reason is that these drugs reduce the preload and afterload on the heart. So naturally they reduce the stress on the heart. So heart is able to work in a better way. Number two, that these drugs pathological remodeling, pathological remodeling process in a failing heart, right? That also improves the and mortality in the long run. Then these drugs also increase the patient's quality of life or you can say these drugs also reduce morbidity and mortality by reducing the chances of myocardial infarction, reducing the chances of arrhythmia in these patients and reducing the chances of yes, reducing the chances of chances of stroke in these patients right so all these things together right eventually lead to reduced morbidity and mortality in the patients with congestive cardiac failure right now again i will repeat that these drugs are 
one of the most important drugs in congestive cardiac failure and these drugs should be given in all the patients which, with congestive cardiac failure, right? Actually, all the patients with re reduced ejection fraction, reduced ejection fraction, whenever ejection fr fraction is less than, less than 35%, whenever ejection fraction is less than 35%, right, a, a angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs show beneficial effects. And it is stated that lower the ejection fraction, better is the benefits. More beneficial are the drugs, right? Now just name a few drugs. Of course, one name, right, everyone knows that is Captopril. Captopril, about the Captopril, you must know that this is active drug. Is that right? But remaining ACE inhibitors are basically pro-drugs and these pro-drugs have to pass through the liver to be activated. The other important drugs in this group are Enalapril, they are Enalapril, Lysinopril, right? Ramipril, Ramipril and Fosino, Fosinopril, right? Now one thing which you have to remember that most of the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs are pro-drugs. They have to pass through the liver and get hydroxylized over there and then they convert into active metabolites right the only active agent in this drug is captopril which does not require activation in the liver so important point about the captopril is that it is an active agent does not require activation in the liver other drugs are pro drugs and they need to be activated in the liver before they start their action another important point is that except for sino for sinopril all drugs go out of the body through the kidney right again most of the drugs in angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor group they are eliminated through renal system except for sinopril for sinopril has balanced elimination it has balanced elimination from the body it goes out of the body through liver as well as from the kidney another important point related with this group of drug is that all these drugs can be taken orally and preferably they should be taken empty stomach because food retards their absorption, right? Now, we will talk about some important uses of ACE inhibitors other than congestive cardiac failure, right? There are so many uses. I will just talk about few important uses of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drug one use we have already discussed that is congestive cardiac failure especially when ejection fraction is reduced second use of this drug is that these drugs are very commonly used as antihypertensive agents so they are used in hypertension right third important use of this drug is uh, group of this drug is that these drugs are used after recent MI, right? Patients with recent myocardial infarction, right? When someone develops myocardial infarction, uh, during the acute phase, you must start angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors so that on the injured heart, on infarcted heart, ventricle area, preload and afterload can be reduced and stress on the injured heart is reduced and they say that patient with the recent MI who are started on the ACE inhibitors they also have long term reduced morbidity and mortality right then these drugs are very important uh, in patients with diabetic nephropathy diabetic nephropathy let me explain 
little bit about the pathology of diabetic nephropathy and then I will explain how these drugs are good in diabetic nephropathy patients, right? Look, let's suppose this is the nephron, right? And you must be knowing that here is afferent arteriole, these are glomerular capillaries and here is efferent arteriole. This is afferent arteriole and this is efferent arteriole. And here are mesangial cells. Here are mesangial cell and mesangium. Now, in diabetic patient, right, there are two types of problem. Number one, basement membrane of glomerular capillaries is damaged and proteinaceous substance oozes out. Proteinaceous substance from the glomerular capillaries goes to the mesangium and glomerular basement membrane and damages the mesangium as well as glomerular basement membrane. And these proteinaceous substances right which go to the mesangium due to disturbed permeability process here they lead to the growth of mesangium and pathologies in mesangium right number two more important is that in patients with the diabetes they develop arterial arteriolosclerosis they develop arteriolosclerosis mean hardening of the walls of the vessels in afferent arteriole as well as these patients develop arteriolosclerosis in efferent arterioles. Again, in diabetic nephropathy, in diabetic patients, they develop thickening of the walls of the efferent arterioles as well as thickening of the wall of the efferent arterioles. When both arterioles are constricted, is that right? The blood flow to glomeruli is reduced. The blood flow to glomeruli is reduced. And in these patients, an important point is that angiotensin 2 plays a very important role. What is the role of angiotensin 2? That angiotensin 2 act on the receptors on efferent arteriole. This is yeah, angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 work on the receptors on efferent arteriole and keep them constricted. And when the patients with diabetes right angiotensin 2 normally act more on the efferent arteriole and less on the efferent arteriole because angiotensin 2 has more receptors on efferent arteriole and keep that constricted and due to this constriction there is glomerular hypertension there is high pressure in the glomeruli and that further leads to leakage of proteinaceous substances and further damage to the mesangium and mesangial growth and expansion produces damage to the glomerular operators. Is that right? Now what we really do? If we give these patients with diabetic nephropathy, captopril related drugs or ACE inhibitors, there are multiple benefits. Number one, that in these patients, ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors will reduce systemic blood pressure. They will reduce systemic blood pressure. Naturally, when systemic blood pressure is reduced by the ACE inhibitors, overall damage by the systemic blood pressure to the glomerular structure is reduced. Number two, when you have given angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs, right, naturally angiotensin 2 level go down. And when angiotensin 2 levels go down because this drug is given, captopril or enalapril or related drug, when angiotensin 2 levels are less then angiotensin 2 cannot keep the efferent arterioles constricted. So what really happens that efferent arterioles dilate. When efferent arterioles dilate blood can easily move from the glomerular capillary to the efferent arteriole and forward and pressure in the glomerular capillary is reduced. It means there, there is reduced glomerular hypertension. There is reduced glomerular hypertension. It's worth repeating, let me tell you. In patient with diabetic nephropathy, when you give the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, what really happens that angiotensin 2 level go down and angiotensin 2 
with low levels cannot keep the efferent arterioles constricted. So there is slight dilatation of efferent arterioles, right? When there is slight dilatation of efferent arterioles, then uh, blood in the glomerular cap capillaries moves forward easily. So pressure in the glomerular capillary bed is reduced or we say that glomerular hypertension is reduced and leakage of you can say pretinaceous substances right to damage the mesangium and to damage the glomerular basement membrane is also reduced and that reduces the progression of diabetic nephropathy is that right then one more factor which is there is that overall reduction of angiotensin 2 overall reduction of angiotensin 2 also help in a very special way what is that special way you must remember now they say that angiotensin 2 act as a growth factor act as a stimulatory growth factor for mesangial cells angiotensin 2 can stimulate the growth factor act as a growth factor angiotensin 2 act as a growth factor on the mesangial cells and uh, if you are giving naturally if angiotensin 2 is acting as a growth factor on the mesangial cells so it means it is also leading to mesangial expansion and further diabetic nephropathy but when you give ACE inhibitor drugs angiotensin 2 level is less not only efferent arterioles dilate right but there is less growth stimulatory uh, action on the mesangial cells and there is further reduction in the progression of diabetic nephropathy right so this was something about the uses of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors that these drugs are used in congestive cardiac failure these drugs are used used as antihypertensive agents these drugs are used as uh, very importantly used in dab to reducing the progression of diabetic nephropathy even lately they have it is found that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are also useful in diabetic retinopathy is that right when there is angiogenesis in the retina there also that prog that, deter that deteriorative action of the diabetes on the retina is also reduced in the presence of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors right after this now we will talk about some important side effects of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors right the adverse actions of captopril, enalapril and related drugs right one of the very easy way to remember the side effects of this group is that just right here capto Peril. right captopril the side effects of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors they can be easily remembered from the capto word captopril and let's see how number one c stands for cough right that in many patients who take angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors some of them develop dry cough right now why they develop the dry cough actually you must be knowing when angiotensin converting enzyme is inhibited then bradykinin is not broken down because angiotensin converting enzyme not only break down uh, you can say convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 but the same enzyme is also responsible to destroy bradykinin so what really happens that when you are giving captopril and related drugs what really happens is that there is increased level of bradykinin which is not destroyed by the enzyme as enzyme is inhibited by the drug and increased level of bradykinin in the lungs right and some other mediators as well that produces in some patients cough right so dry cough is one of the important side effect of the ACE inhibitors but you have to remember one thing that later on we'll talk about a drug that is called angiotensin ARBs another group of drug is ARBs angiotensin 
receptor blockers angiotensin receptor blockers right these drugs do not produce the cough we'll discuss later why number one number two that these drugs sometimes produce angioedema angioedema what is angioedema it's a rare but very dangerous complication in angioedema what happen patient may develop rapidly swelling of the nasal mucosa or throat mucosa in the larynx or pharyngeal area right and it may be very dangerous situation or swelling of the nose swelling of the lips swelling of the buccal mucosa and pharyngeal and laryngeal mucosa and that may produce life threatening situation especially related with the breathing right uh, in these cases why it happens there are two reasons there are two theories one reason is that in some patients accumulated bradykinin precipitate precipitates angioedema and second theory is that captopril and related drugs as inhibitors inhibit the complement 1 esterase inhibitor c1 esterase inhibitor when c1 esterase are inhibit inhibitors are inhibited then complements are unduly activated let me tell you c1 esterase inhibitors we'll discuss this in detail in immunology yeah what is this product but this substance is normally present in our body and important function of this substance is it does not allow the undue over activation of classical pathway of complement system some people believe that ace inhibitors inhibit this protein when this protein is inhibited then in some patients there is undue activation of classical pathway of complements and that produces lot of complement fragments like c3a c5a which produce activates the mast cells and mast cell release histamine and other vasodilator and uh, increase permeability factors and mast cell release mediators may uh, may also precipitate angioedema anyway whenever you give ACE inhibitors and if a patient develop angioedema you must stop the drug immediately and usually within few hours angioedema disappears then the next side effect is that protein urea that is protein urea that in some patients ACE inhibitors right produce protein urea exact mechanism is not known but some authorities believe that Uh, basically these drugs activate some immune process against the glomerular basement membrane in some patients and that may precipitate protein urea then the next is t4 taste changes taste changes right probably these drugs interfere with the taste buds and disturb their function so patient is unable to enjoy his most delicious food and his taste perception is altered or taste uh, is not perceived properly right then o for hypotension hypo tension now it's worth mentioning that hypotension is one of the very important side effects of ace inhibitors right and this is something you must remember that some patients right when you introduce the first dose first dose of ace inhibitors they may develop severe hypotension now why this severe hypotension develops right this type of severe hyper, hypotension hypotension is seen in the patients who have increased plasma renin levels right patient with increased plasma renin activity what are who are these patients these patient may be patient of congestive cardiac failure or patient who are salt depleted in these two types of patient patient with congestive cardiac failure and patient who are salt depleted right they develop increase renin activity in the body and if you give such patient ace inhibitors in full doses right they develop severe hypotension that is why in such patient if you have to start the ace inhibitors you have to start very carefully you should give the first dose at a very low amount 
Is that right? That first dose should be much reduced and preferably when patient is going to the bed. Is that right? So this is something important that this drug can precipitate hypertension, especially first dose hypertension in the patients who have increased plasma renin activity. And in these patients, what should we do? That we should give the first dose in a very small amount, right? Then P for pregnancy actually these drugs should not be given in pregnancy right I must draw something like this these drugs are phytotoxic as soon as diagnosis of pregnancy is developed uh, if patient is on these drugs these drugs should be immediately stopped because these drugs can cross the uh, blood placental barrier go to the baby and produce phytotoxicity. So they are contraindicated in the pregnant females, right? And R stands for rashes, right? Like many drugs, these drugs may also uh, produce rashes in the skin by interfering with the, for example, drug may bind with the skin components and activate the immune system against the skin or drugs may stimulate the mast cells and release a lot of histamine and rashes are produced anyway these drugs may also produce rashes then another important thing is that these drugs may produce reduce i i for increased 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 potassium level right and increase renin level when you introduce these drugs First of all, I will tell why the renin level go up. Actually, when you are giving ACE inhibitors, then angiotensin 1 cannot convert into angiotensin 2. So, body develops deficiency of angiotensin 2. Normally, angiotensin 2 inhibits the further release of renin. But after the introduction of these drugs, when angiotensin 2 levels go down, right, then angiotensin 2 is unable to inhibit the juxtaglomerular apparatus and there is more release of renin. Secondly, when you are giving these drugs, and angiotensin 2 levels are less in the body naturally then aldosterone is not released so aldosterone levels are also less and you must be knowing that aldosterone is a hormone which re retains sodium and water in the body and it lead to expulsion of potassium through the renal system again aldosterone is a hormone which normally retains salt and water in the body and expels potassium so naturally when aldosterone levels are less in the patient who is on the ACE inhibitors when aldosterone levels are less then potassium cannot be expelled from the body effectively and some patients may develop some degree of hyperkalemia right and L is for low what is low in these patient right number one angiotensin two level is of course low in these patients as well as aldosterone level is also aldosterone level is also low in these patients right do you have any question okay no question now we are going to discuss the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and their comparison with a newer group of drug that is angiotensin receptor blockers. This new group of drug is ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers. The important drug in this group are losartan, welsartan, candisartan. Again, the important drugs are losartan, welsartan, and candisartan. Now, how do these drugs work? ARBs, right? They basically directly block the angiotensin 2 receptors. For example, you must be knowing that angiotensin 2 receptors are present on smooth muscles of arterioles. This receptor is blocked by ARBs, right? So, angiotensin 2 cannot work here. Angiotensin 2 cannot work on arteriolar smooth muscle receptor. In the same way, angiotensin 2 cannot work on the venous smooth muscles right in the same way 
if arbs are there then angiotensin 2 receptors are blocked on zona glomerulosa and angiotensin 2 cannot work over there right so what these drugs are doing look at this is angiotensin 2 angiotensin 2 work normally on the arterioles and produce arterioloconstriction it works on the veins and produce venoconstriction but in the presence of arbs angiotensin receptor blocker it cannot produce arterioloconstriction and cannot produce art venoconstriction so these drugs arbs by blocking the receptors produce arteriolo dilatation as well as veno dilatation is that right secondly you know normally angiotensin 2 work on zona glomerulosa and produces aldosterone which lead to salt and water retention right but if you have given the patient arbs then naturally angiotensin 2 cannot work on its receptors on the zona glomerulosa and aldosterone is not released and salt and water is not retained in the body so up to now what did we learn that arbs by blocking the angiotensin 2 receptors can lead to arteriolodilatation venodilatation when arteriolodilatation is there you know total peripheral resistance is reduced and diastolic blood pressure goes down when venodilatation is there naturally when what really happens venous return to heart is reduced cardiac output is reduced systolic blood pressure is reduced in the same way when arb is blocked the action of angiotensin 2 on the zona glomerulosa so aldosterone is reduced and salt and water is not retained in the body blood volume is reduced venous return is reduced cardiac output is reduced is that right and systolic blood pressure is reduced due to these reasons these drugs are quite effective in patient with hypertension or we can say they are one of the very important antihypertensive drugs secondly by reducing the uh, venous return to the heart that is reducing the preload and uh, by producing arteriolodilatation they reduce the afterload so arbs produce reduction in preload and afterload so stresses on the heart are reduced so these drugs can also be used as substitute of ace inhibitors in patients right who can, can, cannot tolerate angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors is that right in the same way arbs also act on the angiotensin 2 receptor right they block the angiotensin 2 receptor at other sites as well as you know angiotensin 2 receptors are present on the sympathetic nerve endings right and arbs can block those receptors so angiotensin 2 cannot stimulate the sympathetic nerve endings in the same way these drugs also block the action of angiotensin 2 on the hypothalamus where normally angiotensin 2 produces thirst right those receptors are also blocked in the same way angiotensin 2 mediated efferent arteriolo-constriction is also blocked by these drugs right so practically what we see that arbs are having lot of actions similar to angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors the real difference is that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors inhibit this group of enzymes these are the enzymes angiotensin converting enzymes which are present in pulmonary vascular bed and these enzymes are normally converting angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 as well as these enzymes destroy the bradykinin angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors were blocking these enzymes so that there, were, there was less conver conversion of angiotensin into angiotensin 2 right and of course when angiotensin 2 is reduced angiotensin 2 mediated actions are reduced so we can say that inhibitors reduce angiotensin 2 dependent action by reducing the production of angiotensin 2 but arbs reduce the angiotensin 2 mediated actions by directly blocking the receptors of angiotensin 2 ACE inhibitors also do one more action that when they inhibit this, these enzymes, these enzymes not only convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 but normally these enzymes also break down bradykinin and when these enzymes are inhibited, uh, bradykinin is no more destroyed effectively and rising levels of bradykinin can produce cough and angioedema, 
right so those patient who are given angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and if they develop cough or they develop angioedema right we can switch to these patient from angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor drugs to ARBs right because ARBs will not inhibit these enzymes so uh, bradykinin will keep on undergoing destruction process right and does not accumulate and when bradykinin does not accumulate then cuff is not produced risk of angioedema is reduced right and because these enzymes are working in the presence of ARBs, even though angiotensin 2 is produced, but because its receptors are blocked, so angiotensin 2 cannot work, right? So in a nutshell, what we can say? So what are the uses of ARBs? The uses of ARBs are, number one, that they can be used as substitute uh, of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors in patients with congestive cardiac failure where angiotensin Converting enzyme inhibitors are not toler tolerated, especially due to persistent dry cough or due to angioedema. Number two, ARBs, that, that is angiotensin receptor blockers, they are also used as antihypertensive drugs. Is that right? Uh, when we come to the side effects of these drugs, ARBs, there is a very interesting thing. Most of the side effects of ARBs and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are similar. We can say that adverse effects profile is same except ARBs do not produce dry cough and they do not have a risk of angioedema. So we have already discussed the side effects of ACE inhibitors. So you can say all the side effects are also present for ARBs except there is no cough and there is no angioedema. And again it is worth emphasizing that both of these drugs are fetotoxic, both of these group of drugs are contraindicated and both of these drugs are contraindicated in patients with pregnancy or females who are pregnant. You should not give ACE inhibitors and females who are pregnant, they should not be given ARBs. Is there any question? Okay. Now we shall discuss the role of beta blockers in congestive cardiac failure, right? Uh, why the beta blockers are used in congestive cardiac failure? It seems counterintuitive, but let me explain why. You know, patient who has congestive cardiac failure, it means chronically his heart is producing less cardiac output. If heart is producing less cardiac output, naturally then sympathetic nervous system is activated. And if someone's sympathetic nervous system is chronically activated in congestive cardiac failure, initially it may be beneficial that it increase heart rate, increase contractility, maybe support the cardiac output. But in the long run, if sympathetic nervous system is overstimulated in patient with congestive cardiac failure, in the long run it produces dangerous complications. For example, that this may produce pathological, pathological remodeling in the myocardial tissue right and heart may go into progressive failure. Secondly, increased heart rate <coughs> may also deteriorate cardiac function. So studies have proved that ju judicious use of beta blocker uh, not only improve the systolic function but also reverse the cardiac remodeling. These days the two commonly used beta blockers in congestive cardiac failure are metoprolol Metoprolol, which is a longer acting beta blocker, and second is carvidolol. Carvidolol. This is a very, very special type of drug. Why? <coughs> because this drug is not only blocking the beta 1 and beta 2 receptors, but it also blocks alpha 1 adrenergic receptors. Right? Carvidolol progressive failure. Secondly, increased heart rate <coughs> may also deteriorate cardiac function. So studies have proved that ju judicious use of beta blocker uh, not only improve the systolic function but also reverse the cardiac remodeling. These days the two commonly used beta blockers in congestive cardiac failure are metoprolol, meto Prolol, 
which is a longer acting beta blocker and second is carvedolol carvedolol this is a very very special type of drug why <clears throat> because this drug is not only blocking the beta 1 and beta 2 receptors but it also blocks alpha 1 adrenergic receptors right carvedolol this blocks alpha 1 adrenergic receptors right as well as it blocks beta 1 adrenergic receptors as well as it blocks beta 2 adrenergic receptors so generally we say that this is alpha blocker as well as non-selective beta blocker carvedilol by blocking the alpha 1 receptor right it, it produces arteriolodilatation and venodilatation and when it produces arteriolodilatation and venodilatation naturally what happens that when arteriolda dilated by alpha 1 blocker action of the carvedilol after load on the heart is reduced and when veins are dilated by alpha 1 blockade that will produce reduction in preload so we can say by its alpha 1 adrenergic blocking action adrenergic receptor blocking action it reduces the arterial dilatation it produces that it produces the arterial dilatation and venodilatation at the same time because it produces beta 1 blocking action by blocking the beta 1 action it reduces the heart rate right which uh, and secondly by blocking the beta 1 action it reduces the release of the renin as well right so again let me repeat it that in congestive cardiac failure beta blockers are now used but very important thing in severe and acute intractable cardiac failure beta blockers should not be started in acute phase very acute phase of congestive cardiac failure beta blockers should not be given because they're negative inotropic but as soon as patient is little bit stable you should start the beta blockers carefully right so that patients you can say <coughs> heart rate should reduce as well as patient should be not having chronic overstimulation of the heart by the adrenergic stimulation so that uh, cardiac remodeling should be reversed the detail about the beta blocker drugs and their side uh, side effects and contraindications are discussed in the lecture related with the antianginal drugs right then we will talk about the congestive cardiac failure and role of diuretics now we'll talk about congestive cardiac failure and role of diuretics right diuretics which are used there are two types of diuretics which are used uh, in congestive cardiac failure one group is thiazides which are mild diuretics and number two is loop diuretics like furosemide right furosemide or ethacrinic acid or there is bumetanide so thiazides and loop diuretics these two groups are used in congestive cardiac failure thiazides are used in patient with milder problem is that right but if there is severe cardiac failure and you need lot of diuresis then the drug of choice is loop diuretics so again thiazides are mild diuretics loop, loop diuretics are strong diuretics and thiazides usually do not uh, uh, they lose their efficiency when there is significant reduction in GFR but the beauty of loop diuretics is that they keep on working even when uh, GFR is significantly reduced so we can say with filling heart and with filling dropping GFR the drug of choice should be loop diuretics now we have to think that how diuretics help the patient in congestive cardiac failure right actually diuretics produce number one loss of salt and water that is diuresis and natriuresis when salt and water is lost from the body then naturally blood volume is reduced and venous return is reduced ventricular filling is reduced preload is reduced so this is one way how diuretics help secondly diuretics also produce some degree of venodilatation that again reduces the venous return and preload 
right and thirdly diuretics also produce some degree of arterial load dilatation and reduce the after load everyone knows the diuretics produce diuresis but you have to remember the diuretics also act as vasodilators is that clear to everyone now uh, another diuretic which is sometimes used in advanced stage of failure is spironolactone that is spironolactone 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 is a very mild diuretic but it has a very special function the how it works spironolactone basically binds with the aldosterone receptor and when it binds with the aldosterone receptor it antagonizes the action of aldosterone on the aldosterone receptor so we can say the patients who are given with given the spironolactone uh, their aldosterone loses its action you know uh, patient with congestive cardiac failure they are having higher level of aldosterone which is normally retaining salt and water and expelling the or throwing the potassium out of the body through renal mechanisms am i clear now when you give spironolactone what really happens that aldosterone mediated salt and water retention is not there right and aldosterone mediated uh, loss of potassium is also not there so what are the advantages number one that it reduces aldos uh, you can say spironolactone reduces the salt and water retention in the body in congestive cardiac failure patients number two aldosterone also prevents the hypokalemia because spironolactone also sorry spironolactone also prevent the hypokalemia by preventing the action of aldosterone right and another very important thing is that normally high level of aldosterone stimulate the myocardial cells right this is very recent this uh, you can say finding that higher level of aldosterone uh, chronically high levels of aldosterone as it is seen in congestive cardiac failure that basically stimulates the myocardial cells and these myocardial cells may undergo hypertrophy and spirino spironolactone also blocks the aldosterone receptor within the myocardial cells so spironolactone also reduces the chances of aldosterone mediated myocardial remodeling pathological remodeling or pathological hypertrophy right but again don't forget spironolactone is meant for what advanced stage of cardiac failure now we will talk about congestive cardiac failure and role of direct vasodilators direct vasodilator there are two types of vasodilators are used they are venodilators and there are yes arteriolo dilators in venodilator side the best drug which is used there is isosorbide dinitrate isosorbide dinitrate and on arterio dilator side the drug which is used is hydralazine which is a very important arteriolo dilator hydralazine we'll discuss hydralazine in detail in anti hypertensive drugs here i will only mention that in the patients of congestive cardiac failure who are intolerant to ace inhibitors and beta blockers the patient with congestive cardiac failures which are intolerant to ACE inhibitors and intolerant to beta blockers right again the patients who have congestive cardiac failure and we cannot use due to side effects uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or we cannot use due to contraindications of side effects the beta blockers then we use combination of isosorbide dinitrate as a venodilator and hydralazine as an arteriolo dilator you must be knowing that arterio uh, isosorbide dinitrate when it will produce powerful venodilator naturally venous return to heart will be reduced and end diastolic volume will reduce preload will be reduced and uh, when you give the hydralazine with it 
it is strong arteriolodilator so total peripheral resistance is reduced and that lead to after load reduction in the failing on the failing heart so the combination of isosorbate dinitrate and hydralazine produces reduction in preload as well as reduction in after load in patient with congestive cardiac failure so heart can perform better is that right but again i would repeat it that this combination of drug is usually used when patient is intolerant to ace inhibitors and beta blockers today we are going to discuss about the positive inotropic drugs right which are used in severe heart failure positive inotropic drugs which are used in severe heart failure before watching this dvd you must uh, watch the dvds which are about the basics of the heart failure but i will recap little bit about the concepts related with the heart failure before i start explaining the drugs right now first of all we should be able to define what is heart failure right before i go to the drugs let's have few important concepts number 1 what is heart failure heart failure is a clinical syndrome it's a clinico pathological syndrome produced due to structural or functional defects in the heart which is produced to either there is some structural defect in the heart or there is some functional defect on the heart right so heart failure is a clinico pathological syndrome which is produced due to structural or functional defects in the heart which due to which due to which heart is unable to maintain enough cardiac output due to which heart is unable to maintain enough cardiac output to meet the <coughs> demands of the peripheral tissue right remember what is the problem in heart failure heart failure is the clinico pathological syndrome which develops due to structural or functional defect in the heart right and the result is that heart is unable to maintain enough cardiac output right to meet the demands of the peripheral tissues now there are few terms and related with the heart failure let's discuss them as well for example heart failure can be classified according to the cardiac output of the failing heart heart failure can be classified according to the cardiac output of failing heart for example according to this concept heart failure is divided into two categories one is called high output high output heart failure and other is called yes low output heart failure now let me explain what is high output cardiac failure and what is low output cardiac failure actually low output cardiac failure is more common one of the example of low output cardiac failure can be that let's suppose that here is your left ventricle and unfortunately this left ventricle develops ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction and due to this ischemic damage to the heart myocardium cannot contract well so it is unable to it is unable to produce the normal cardiac output you know normal cardiac output is yes normal cardiac output is about 5 liters per minute is that right now if heart is severely ischemic and it has ischemic cardiomyopathy such heart does not have good contractility and rather than producing 5 liters per minute let's suppose it is producing only 3 liters per minute so of course 3 liter blood per minute cannot meet the demands of the body peripheral tissues so we say the heart is failing to meet the demand of the peripheral tissues but while the heart is failing to meet the demand what is the real cause real cause is reduced cardiac output so such situations where body peri demands by the peripheral tissue are normal demand on the cardiac output by the peripheral tissue the normal but due to structural or functional defects in the heart heart is unable to produce even the normal cardiac output such such failure is called low output heart failure opposed to that there are some other conditions in which heart is doing its there is 
primary defect is there is exaggerated increase in the demand on the cardiac output. For example, patient with hyperthyroidism, patient with hyperthyroidism. If someone has severe hyperthyroidism, right, what will happen? You know, hyperthyroidism increases the metabolism all over the body. When metabolism of the peripheral tissue is increased, then oxygen demands are also increased. In hyperthyroidism, the demand on oxygen is increased too much and tissue demand more oxygen, tissue demand more perfusion. It means in hyperthyroidism, heart has to produce more cardiac output to meet the exaggerated demands of the peripheral tissues. Now, let's suppose there is a patient who has hyperthyroidism. With that, he has some mild dysfunction in the heart and when hyperthyroidism develops, right, heart which was previously producing 5 liter, now it step up its cardiac output up to 10 liter per minute, right, but the tissue demand is 20 liters. Listen, if I develop hyperthyroidism, my peripheral tissues are demanding 20 liters of blood per minute and my heart increases cardiac output from 5 liter to 10 liter and due to some intrinsic defect in the heart, I am unable to increase my cardiac output more than 10 liters. So, in spite of the high output, my heart is unable to meet the very exaggerated demand of the peripheral tissue, right? And this type of heart failure should be called high output heart failure. In the same way, in very severe anemias, also there can be high output cardiac failure. Now, another concept related with the cardiac failure and that is remember high output cardiac failure is less common low output cardiac failure is more common then another concept which is related with the cardiac failure is that there is left ventricular failure there is right ventricular failure and there is biventricular failure. Let me draw a diagram and explain it properly. Let us suppose this is the it's a very simple diagram. Here is the left heart pumping the blood into systemic circulation. From the systemic circulation, blood is coming back to the right heart through the major veins. Then right heart will pump the blood to the lungs, right? So, now, let us suppose, and this is from here the blood get oxygenated and then it is going to yes left side now one point which i want you to understand very important that between the left heart and the right heart there is systemic circulation and between the right heart and the left heart there is pulmonary circulation now if there are higher pressure in systemic circulation if systemic circulation become congested and high pressure, the point from where fluid can leak out is systemic capillaries. Fluid can leak out from where? Systemic, systemic capillaries. And if this pressure in the pulmonary system very high, right, the fluid which can leak out is pulmonary capillaries. Is that right? Because fluid cannot leak, look here. For example, if there is left ventricular failure, now listen carefully, if there is left ventricular failure. My left ventricle is unable to pump well. Now, whatever it is receiving, it cannot move forward. So, what will happen? Due to that reason, back pressures will increase. Left ventricular pressure will increase. Then left atrial pressure will increase. Then pulmonary, pulmonary what is this? Arterial pressure will increase. Is that right? Oh, sorry, pulmonary venous pressure will increase. But from the pulmonary vein, fluid cannot leak out. Then pulmonary capillary pressure. This is the pulmonary capillary. Pulmonary capillary pressure will increase and eventually even pulmonary artery pressure will increase. Now, in this case, we can say left ventricular failure will lead to higher pressure in pulmonary circulation due to its back pressure, due to back pressure. But you know pulmonary arteries, 
cannot leak. Pulmonary veins cannot leak. Only pulmonary capillaries can leak. So, uh, due to high pressures, hydrostatic pressures, pulmonary capillaries will start leaking the fluid out and that will lead to pulmonary edema. That will lead to pulmonary edema. Of course, it clinically manifests as this, this is left ventricular failure leading to pulmonary edema. Clinically, patient come with dyspnea, orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Now, but if someone develop right ventricular failure, if someone develop right ventricular failure, then whatever right ventricle is receiving, it cannot pump forward. So, back pressure in the right ventricle will lead to back pressure increase in right atrium. Eventually, right atrium cannot receive the blood from major veins and all the systemic vein become congested and pressure now left if left heart is okay it's pumping into systemic circulation but right heart is failing and cannot pump forward the point from where the fluid will leak out is systemic capillaries so all systemic capillaries will leak the capillaries which are present between the major arterial tree and major venous tree right all the capillaries will leak and person will develop generalized edema, person will develop generalized edema. So, the point which I want to highlight is that left ventricular failure will lead back pressure to pulmonary edema, right ventricular failure lead to back pressure and eventually generalized edema. Is that right? Now, so one way to classify the cardiac failure is that some patient who come to you with failure, if they are having pulmonary edema, they are having which type of failure? Left ventricular, left ventricular failure. The feature of left ventricular failure important is pulmonary edema, right? And if someone has isolated right ventricular failure, this person will develop systemic edema, which is of course all over the body. So, we also call it generalized edema, systemic edema, right? Or generalized edema. Now, some unfortunate people have right ventricular failure as well as left ventricular failure. If both ventricle fails, we call it biventricular failure and biventricular failure right it is leading to congestion of pulmonary system it is leading to congestion of pulmonary system as well as leading to congestion of systemic system so simply call it congestive cardiac failure from today onward when you talk to someone that there is congestive heart failure or congestive cardiac failure act, it means there is biventricular failure Right? If someone is saying, you see, patient on bed number 6 has right ventricular failure, of course, he is developing generalized edema. If someone has pulmonary edema due to heart failure, it is left ventricular failure. And someone who has edema on both areas, this is congestive cardiac failure. Is that clear? There is no problem. Now, the drugs which we are going to talk about, the positive inotropic drug, they are used for low output failure. They are not used for high output failure number one. Number two, here I will explain that these drugs are also preferably used in systolic left ventricular failure or biventricular failure, usually not used in right ventricular failure. Is that right? The drugs which we will discuss now, positive inotropic. Then there is another way to classify the cardiac failure. It is very interesting. This is called forward failure forward failure and yes backward failure let me explain what is really meant by this forward failure you must make this diagram suppose someone has left ventricular failure now when there is left ventricular failure suppose there is myocardial infarction and this person develop failure it is heart cannot pump well and when this heart cannot pump well right there are two things number one problem is that because this heart cannot pump well, cardiac forward cardiac output will be less or more. Less. So, there will be reduced cardiac output. Some clinical problem will be due to reduced cardiac output. This is called forward failure, right? And some clinical features will develop due to backward pressure. And you know that will lead to pulmonary edema. That will lead to pulmonary edema. Okay, I don't understand forward one. I'm going to explain it, don't you worry. Look, ha, this ventricle has two functions. Number one, it should maintain enough cardiac output forwardly. 
to the peripheral tissue. Secondly, you should not allow the back pressure into lungs. That is backward function. Now listen. If this heart is left ventricle is not pumping well, can it supply enough cardiac output? So cardiac output will drop and when there is the forward function is reduced, we say left ventricle is showing features of forward failure. What are the features of forward failure? Maybe severe fatigability. Can this person uh, who has low cardiac output, can he walk well? No. Is that right? He cannot supply enough oxygen to the muscles. So, he, he is feeling all the time exercise tolerance is reduced. The term which is sophisticated term which is used is the patient with forward failure of left ventricular situation, they have decreased exercise tolerance. They have decreased exercise tolerance. And when we talk about backward failure, right, when we talk about backward failure, what really happens that there is pulmonary edema and person develops dyspnea paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and orthopnea and cough. This is the features of backward failure. So what does it mean? Listen now carefully that if a patient come to you and he has pulmonary edema, what is this? Left ventricular failure. Now in left ventricular failure, some people have very severe forward failure and of course there will be very severe backward failure as well. Right? In these patients will say patient of the left ventricular failure has some features, signs and symptoms related with forward failure, some signs and symptoms related with backward, backward failure. For example, pulse is very weak, blood pressure is low. These are the features of forward failure. And if you uh, see that he cannot breathe well and there are basal crepitations, right, you auscultate in the basis of the lungs, then these are the features of backward failure. Is that right? So now next time when you go to a patient, you will talk about it cardiac failure patient on the bed of the cardiac failure patient, you must juggle out your mind, is it low output failure or high output failure? Is it left ventricular failure or right ventricular failure? Is it biventricular failure or not? Is that right? If it is left ventricular failure or right ventricular failure, then you see what are the clinical features of the forward failure and what are the clinical problems due to backward failure? Is it difficult to understand? It's too easy, isn't it? Dangerously easy. Now, there is one more, uh, one more concept and then we'll go to the drugs. That is extremely important concept and you have to understand it very, very clearly. That is the concept of systolic failure, systolic failure and diastolic failure, diastolic failure. There is systolic failure and there is diastolic failure. Now, what is the difference in systolic and diastolic failure? Let me explain. Look here. Suppose this is normal heart. Normal left ventricle has diastolic function as well as systolic function. Now, what is the function of during diastole? Attention please, this is very important concept. What is the function of normal left ventricle during diastole? The dia during the diastole, left ventricle should relax. It should relax too much so that enough ventricular filling should be done. Is that right? So it should not be stiff. It should not be a hard ventricle. During it should be a ventricle which can very easily relax during the diastole so that its chamber size is enough to accumulate proper end diastolic volume. Is that right? Now, and what is the systolic function? For example, this is the diastolic function, the ventricle is relaxed well and it is properly filled during diastole. And the same ventricle, when it will show systolic function, that it has to contract and it has to maintain, when it is contracting, it should maintain a very good pressures, it should generate very good pressure, right, so that cardiac output can be maintained. The left ventricle should develop enough tension in, in its wall. It should develop enough tension so that it can produce enough pressures. That with pressure, it can push the blood to arterial tray. So this is diastolic function and this is systolic function. So diastolic function is with the relaxation of the ventricle and accommodating the blood. 
and, and helping in the filling of the ventricle and systolic function is related with the contractility and related with the stroke volume and related with the ejection fraction that out of end diastolic volume what is the fraction which is ejected is that right now heart can have two types of problem imagine someone has a heart in the diastole now look at this heart it is having some infiltrative disease right this heart is very much thick and it has some infiltrative disease right for example lot of amyloid material amyloidosis abnormal proteins are deposited in the ventricle for example lot of abnormal proteins like amyloid proteins are deposited within the ventricle and ventricle becomes stiff it become hardened ventricle stiff ventricle do you, do you think during diastole can it relax enough to accommodate if it is very thick walled hypertrophied ventricle or it is ventricle with a lot of infiltrations can it relax well so during the diastole during the diastole even though the mitral valve is fully open it cannot accommodate much blood right for example okay i will give you another example rather than filtration more common example is very severe left ventricular hypertrophy if someone has extremely severe left ventricular hypertrophy then left ventricular wall become thick and it become heavy and it become stiff and during diastole it cannot relax and if during the diastole it cannot relax right if during the diastole this cannot relax that what can it accommodate more blood or less blood less. less blood and it will lead to the features of backward failure because from the lungs blood cannot properly empty itself into vascular system pulmonary vascular system cannot empty itself into diastolically failing heart so such heart which is extremely hypertrophied it is very thick it does not relax as well such heart is said to be it is said to be in diastolic failure because it failed to do its diastolic function because such heart failed to do its diastolic function that during the diastole it does not relax as enough to accommodate enough venous blood is that right opposed to that we think of another heart so this was an example of a heart where there is what is there diastolic failure for example it was extremely very very severe left ventricular hypertrophy a common example so next time you go in the wards you find someone has extremely hypertrophied heart but not dilated heart then we say this is diastolic failure is that right now we imagine another patient in him what really happens that ventricle has become very much dilated or due to any reason it cannot contract well now in this case it can accommodate enough blood but can it push the blood forward no, no. Fraction ejection fraction is reduced stroke volume is dangerously reduced Absolutely. and this is said to be systolic dysfunction this is said to be which dysfunction systolic, systolic dysfunction so we can say that if there is problem with the contractility of the left ventricle we say left ventricle is displaying systolic dysfunction if there is problem with the relaxation of the left ventricle properly then we say there is diastolic dysfunction of course you can see in systolic dysfunction cardiac output will drop dangerously so features of forward failure will be pronounced in pure diastolic failure people patient has less blood coming in and but whatever is coming it is ejecting well so forward failure is not a big problem problem is backward failure right pulmonary edema is the real problem but if someone has this thing he will have forward failure a big problem cardiac output is dropped but with that eventually he will develop backward failure as well now again listen if someone asks you that my patient has pure diastolic failure of left ventricle you must think left ventricle is failing and which component of the function is failing diastolic function is failing probably heart is stiffened or heart is hypertrophied right and if i say or infiltrated or if i say that this person my patient has systolic systolic left ventricular failure it means the real problem is ejection 
fraction. But I simply say there is left ventricular failure, usually there may be, if it is not specified, it means there are both type of failures present, systolic and diastolic, both of them. Am I clear? So, these are few very basic terms. We have, I am not, I am not teaching you the full topic of heart failure. We have already recorded. This is just simple. What is heart failure? Let me repeat it. Heart failure means the heart due to some structural or functional defects, heart is unable to maintain enough cardiac output to meet the minimum requirements of the peripheral tissue. It may be high output failure or low output failure. High output failure means when heart is, uh, when peripheral tissue has a very exaggerated uh, demands on the cardiac output, right, and heart in spite of increasing its output more than normal, it is unable to meet the exaggerated demand of peripheral tissue. So, this is a, the heart is producing high output but still failing to meet the demands. This is high output heart failure. Low output heart failure is defined that a person in which due to some defect in the cardiac function or structure, heart is unable to maintain even the normal cardiac output. So, cardiac output here is less than normal. Then we said cardiac uh, failure or heart failure may be left ventricular failure or right ventricular failure. Whenever left ventricle fail, the back pressure goes to lungs. So, patient develop pulmonary edema. Whenever right ventricle fails, then back pressure goes to the systemic veins. So, generalized systemic edema. Is that right? And if both ventricles fail, we call it biventricular failure because pulmonary circulation as well as peripheral circulation both become congested. So, we call it congestive cardiac failure. This is the right, biventricular failure is congestive cardiac failure. Then, for example, if left ventricular failure is there and clinical features which develop due to reduced cardiac output, they are called forward failure features. And clinical features which develop due to back pressure and uh, pulmonary circulation, pulmonary they are called forward failure feature. Then I am talking about that some people will start the disease of the failure, some people start the disease of the diastolic failure, some people start the disease of the systolic failure. And diastolic failure, heart is unable to relax during the actually enough to accommodate blood volume. So, we say it fails to accommodate enough blood. So, end diastolic volume cannot be uh, even uh, achieved up to normal limit. So, this is called diastolic failure. It produces more backward failure. Then, if some, uh, some heart has problem with its contractility machinery and it contracts very poorly, this is called systolic failure. Here again I will mention that the drugs which we are going to talk about, they are used in systolic failures, left ventricular systolic failure, not for the diastolic failure because these drugs increase the contractility. Of course, there is no fun in using these drugs in diastolic failure. If someone has hypertrophied heart, heart is not relaxing, do you think a drug which stimulates the contraction is useful here? No. because yeah, so, no, but in MCQs it appears and people do not know what, what to answer. They say they are very similar choices, right. So, it is very easy to understand any drug which is positive inotropic, any drug which increases contractility is not useful of course in diastolic failure, but it is going to be useful in systolic. systolic failure. So, what we can say, the drugs which I am going to talk about, they are most commonly used in very severe fa heart failures. Positive inotropic drugs are used in very, very severe heart failure. It, it, these are usually not used in early stages of failure, right? And these drugs are more commonly used in systolic dysfunctions of left ventricle, right? We will discuss about the positive inotropic drugs, right? But before we go into detail of positive inotropic drug, we should know what is positive inotropy. What is meant by the positive inotropy. Okay, there are few terms which are very important to understand. There is inotropy, then there is chronotropic effect, chronotropic effect on the heart. Some drugs produce inotropic effect, right? Okay, inotropic effect. Some drugs produce chronotropic effect. Then there is another drug which, uh, effect action which is called dromotropic action. Dromotropic effect. I will explain what are these things. These five things you must be very clear. What is inotropy? What is chronotropy? What is dromotropy? And then what is clinotropy? Or oh, bathmotropic. Bathmo, B A T H M O. Bathmotropy. And then Clino, C L E I N O, clinotropy, right? Let me explain. 
first you draw this diagram and then I will explain it to you. Let's suppose here is your heart. These are the atria and here are the ventricles. This is a fibrous septum in between. Now, what we really need to understand that here is your conduction system of the heart. This is SA node which is responsible for automaticity, right? Here is AV node which is responsible for conduction of impulses from the atria to the ventricle. Bundle of his dividing into bundle branches. Now listen. Chronotropy means anything which changes the heart rate, we say it, there is chronotropic effect. What is chronotropic effect? Anything which changes the heart rate, that is chronotropic effect. Let us start with this. This is effect on the heart rate. For example, epinephrine increases the heart rate. It is positive chronotropic. Calcium channel blockers decrease heart rate. That is negative chronotropic. So, chronotropy means effect on the heart rate. The chronotropic drugs are mainly working on the SA node. The chronotropic action is mainly on the SA node. Chronotropic effect. Right? So, again, positive chronotropy means increase heart rate. Negative chronotropy means decrease heart rate. Right? Then, next is dromotropy. Dromotropy means the conduction velocity, especially at the junction of atria and the ventricle. You know, this AV node. If conduction from atria to ventricle become fast through AV node, we say there is positive dromotropic. Dromotropic effect means effect on the conduction, conductivity. Conducti conductivity of AV node. Right? And again, if conductivity is increased, this is positive dromotropy. If conductivity is decreased, it is negative dromotropy. For example, sympathomimetic drugs, epinephrine, they increase the conduction from atria to ventricle. So, we say that epinephrine has positive dromotropic action. Epinephrine has positive dromotropic action. Opposite to that, calcium channel blockers block the AV node, they slow down the action of AV node, they slow down the conduction through the AV node. So, we say calcium channel blockers have negative dromotropic action. Now, listen, correlate this thing. Sympathomimetic drugs are positive chronotropic as well as positive dromotropic. Epinephrine is positive chronotropic as well as positive dromotropic. And if you talk about calcium channel blocker, they are negative chronotropic and negative dromotropic or if we talk about beta blockers which block the action of epinephrine because beta blocker reduce the heart rate as well as beta blocker reduce the conduction through AV node. So, beta blocker drug like propranolol they are negative chronotropic and negative dromotropic. So, I hope these two terms are clear chronotropy, dromotropy. Now, we come to the bathmotropic. To understand the bathmotropic you must know a very important concept that normally there is normal automaticity in the SA. SA node. What is automaticity? Automaticity is defined as tendency of SA nodal tissue to undergo depolarization spontaneously because SA node every 0.8 second, if your heart rate is 72 per minute, it means SA node undergoes depolarization every 0.8 second and then that depolarization which is spontaneously produced in SA node spreads over the heart. Is that right? This is normal automaticity. But let us suppose that if there is a Purkinje cell here and let us suppose the cell is injured and it gets loaded with calcium and because this injured cell is loaded with cations, its resting membrane potential become near to threshold and it has increased tendency to fire pathologically. It has pathological automaticity. 
as a node as physiological automaticity, but due to injury may be some ventricular cells have a tendency to they these ventricular cells are irritated due to injury if some ventricular cells are irritated by loading of the cations this ventricle cell develop a tendency to auto fire is that right and this is called bathmotropic action what is bathmotropic action that bathmotropic action mean that some tissue in the myocardium is abnormally excitive automatic it has some tissue has developed abnormally increased automaticity right some tissue has developed now bathmotropy is related with then what it is related with abnormal increase abnormal automaticity right now any drug which increases the abnormal automaticity we say this is positive bathmotropic drug and any drug which reduces the abnormal automaticity is negative bathmotropic drug better? right actually most of the drugs like epinephrine epinephrine can stimulate the AV, SA node so it is positive chronotropic it can stimulate the AV node function so it is positive dromotropic epinephrine I will explain today in later lecture that epinephrine load these cells with the calcium and increases also bathmosity so that is positive bath, uh, bath, uh, bathmotropic drug as well is that right now we come to another the, thing. yeah the firing. no actually what it is doing that epinephrine I will explain later that it increases the calcium load on the myocardial cell you, you should know three calcium loaders write it down every good doctor should know and myocardial cell there can be three things which can load it with calcium right one thing you already know that is ischemic heart disease you know it that when there is ischemia to myocardium right cell membranes will not work well and calcium will be loaded in number two is digitalis that we'll discuss later the how digitalis loads the cell with calcium and third calcium loader is third calcium loader is sympathomimetic drugs right Symp sympathetic activity sympatho sympathetic increased sympathetic activity sympathetic activity now all of these are calcium loaders is that right now because all of them are calcium loader so they these cells become irritated with overload of cations and they automatically fire so all of these things lead to increased bathmosity they need to increase bathmotropic action. Am I clear? Okay, all no. Three of them. All three of them. Right? Now we come to inotropy and clinotropy. I will explain them. That is the function related with this myocardial cell, contractile cell. Look, when this cell is electrically stimulated, I will explain that calcium will go in and calcium will, will increase actin myosin interaction and this will contract and tension will develop right now let's look at a graph that on stimulation how this cell develops tension this is the normal cell that during the systole is developing tension like this then it is relaxation then there is diastole then again there is tension and then there is relaxation and diastole right this is one systolic tension this is other systolic tension right and this is diastolic interval in between is that right now if you give epinephrine epinephrine will modify the contraction how it will modify number one this is the peak of contraction already it will take the peak of the contraction at higher level and then it will relax like this now you see that this green graph is showing the action of epinephrine it means under the influence of epinephrine that the rate of development of tension is faster total tension which is achieved is more and rate of relaxation is also faster so there is more higher velocity of contraction and relaxation and higher degree of contraction as well right because if this graph was something like this then it was only strength increased 
but because graph also shift to the side, it means not only strength of contraction increase, but velocity of contraction and relaxation also increases. Any, anything, anything which increases the strength of contraction is said to be positively inotropic. And anything which changes the velocity of contraction, that is called clinotropy, right. So, what I can say that when there is sympathetic stimulation, ventricle contract more strongly and this is called contractility. Anything which increases the contractility, that is positive inotropy. Anything which decreases the contractility is negative inotropy. And anything which increases the velocity of contraction, velocity of contraction and relaxation. Anything which increases the velocity of contraction, that is said to be positive clinotropic. And anything which decreases the velocity of contraction is said to be negative clinotropic. I think we have gone to too much basics, right. So, now I can say, listen carefully. If I say that if I give you injection of epinephrine, it is positive chronotropic, it means it is increasing the heart rate. If I say it is positive dromotropic, it means it is increasing the conduction between atria and ventricle. If I say it is positive bathmotropic, it means it is increasing abnormal automaticity and more chances of tachyarrhythmia. And if I say it is positive inotropic and clinotropic, it means sympathetic nervous system or epinephrine is increasing the strength of contraction, positive inotropy and increasing the velocity of contraction and relaxation, that is positive clinotropy. Is that right? But when we talk about beta blockers, beta blocker are negative chronotropic, negative dromotropic, negative bathmotropic, negative inotropic, negative clinotropic. If you talk about calcium channel blockers, all calcium dependent activity in heart are reduced. Calcium dependent activity in SA node activity is calcium dependent. Uh, electrical activity in SA node and AV node both is calcium dependent and contraction in atria and ventricle is calcium dependent. So, what we can say if you give calcium channel blockers, what will happen? The patient will develop negative Yes, coronotropy, negative, dromotropy, negative, bathmotropic, negative, inotropy and negative, clinotropy. Am I clear? Yeah. When we are going to talk about positive inotropic drugs, it means we are talking about the drugs which are going to increase the contractility in the heart. To really understand clearly that how these drugs increase the contractility mechanism of the heart, first we should know that what is the normal mechanism of contraction, right. So, very briefly I will discuss that how electrical events lead to mechanical events in the heart, how a myocardial cell after electrical stimulation undergo mechanical contraction, right. So, let us suppose this is a myocardial cell. I will draw a myocardial cell here. right and we shall see that how this cell on stimulation will undergo what type of electrical changes, what type of ionic fluxes and what and eventually how these events lead to contraction. Let us suppose that this cell is undergoing depolarization. When this cell is undergoing depolarization, the step number one is that voltage gated sodium channels are stimulated. Any cell to contract, first we should be electrically stimulated. So, when myocardial cells undergo contraction, first they undergo depolarization process, they pass, action potential pass through them, right. When action potential will come to the cell, first of all voltage gated channels will open and there will be lot of sodium coming in. Now, the resting membrane of the cell was, let us suppose minus 90 millivolt with the sodium coming in, it will become minus 70 and eventually it will become okay if you really want to know well that it will be taken to full depolarization or voltage gated sodium channel, it will go to depolarization. Once the sodium has come in, right, the depolarization of this membrane, why we call it depolarization, again listen, myocardial cells are normally polarized negatively. 
the normal electrical resting membrane potential is minus 90 millivolt. So, normally these cells are negatively polarized electrically. When lot of sodium comes in, their negative polarity is lost. Cations come in and negative electronegativity is lost. So, we say that polar negative polarization is lost or simply we say depolarization. When the cell undergo depolarization phenomenon, then depolarization sensitive calcium channels will open and potassium channels will open. This is depolarization sensitive calcium channel, right? Now, so what really happens? There is a heavy influx of calcium. So, this is the calcium which is coming in, right? But during this is a plateau phase. You know that if you draw it like this, this is now plateau phase and then repolarization phase. What really happens that during the plateau phase, some cations are coming in and some cations are going out and cations which are going out are potassium. So, there is loss of potassium. So, we can say that during the plateau phase, calcium is coming in, potassium is going out cell is gaining the calcium, gaining the cations as well as losing the cations. So, due to that reason electrical potential does not change. But near the end, right, what really happens, calcium channels stop but potassium channels become overactive. Due to this reason, there is very rapid loss of potassium and this massive potassium loss of potassium make the electrical potential again negative, right. This was minus 90 millivolt. With sodium in flux, electronegativity lost and it become depolarized, then calcium was coming in, potassium was going out, phase no change, then calcium stopped coming in but potassium kept on going out and this was repolarization. Is that clear? Now, this calcium which has come in, this calcium, this was extracellular calcium which came intracellularly. This is called trigger calcium. What is it called? Trigger, trigger calcium. What is the function of the trigger calcium? This will stimulate intracellular stores of calcium. This intracellular store of calcium is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. It is very, very rich in calcium. This is very, very rich in calcium. Now, this extracellular calcium which has come in through voltage gated channel, this is also called trigger calcium. This trigger calcium as soon as it hits the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are calcium releasing channels here. What are these? Calcium releasing channels here. There is massive release of calcium, there is massive release of calcium from intracellular store. So, what was the purpose of extracellular calcium to come in just to trigger the release of calcium from intracellular stores? The purpose of this plateau was to bring enough calcium in and this calcium is trigger calcium. It will trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release massive stores of intracellular calcium and this will come into cytosol. Once this calcium appears into cytosol, then what really happens? Here is suppose your sarcomere, right? And these are your actin filaments and here are your, let's suppose, myosin filaments, filament, right? This is myosin filament. Now, what really happens that these heads of myosin love to interact with special slits on, what are these? On actin, right? These heads, they are properly shaped to interact there, right? So, these are the points where which are made there by nature so that what can work there? Head of the myosin should interact with actin, right? But the problem is this, that there is a protein here which is covering this point. And this protein is called tropomyosin and here is troponin. What is this? Troponin and this is tropomyosin. So, normally this is a tropomyosin which is uh, preventing the binding of head of the Act, head of the myosin with the actin. Now, what really happens, what is the function of calcium now? Now, correlated that calcium actually, 
binds with troponin. Calcium binds with troponin. So this calcium, which is coming in, this we call it calcium spark. So sarcoplasmic reticulum produces calcium spark, and this sparking calcium will come and bind here. When calcium binds at these points, the troponin, special point on troponin is called troponin C. Then troponin will rotate like this and it will pull away this tropomyosin. And actin and myosin will start interacting and start moving the filaments and there will be sliding and there will be contraction and development of tension. This is what happens during systole. That we say that when your heart rate is 72 per minute, then cardiac cycle is 0.8 second. Out of that, during the 0.3 second, there is contraction. What really happens during those 0.3 second? That first of all, lot of sodium comes in, membrane depolarizes, then depolarization sensitive. Calcium and potassium channels are activated. Calcium is abundant outside, so it will come in. Potassium is more inside, so potassium will go out. Right? So cations are gained and lost, so plateau phase is there for about some time. And eventually, calcium stop coming in, a lot of potassium goes out, and membrane repolarizes. But this calcium, which extra extracellularly came in, is called trigger calcium. It will fire on the, what is this? Intracellular calcium stores, which is sarcoplasmic reticulum. And sarcoplasmic reticulum will produce the sparking of the calcium. And this calcium, which is released from uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, will bind with troponin. Troponin C and troponin C will pull away the tropomyosin from the myosin head binding site on the actin and actin myosin filaments will start interacting and when they start interacting these heads will move inward and sarcomere will be shortened and every myocardial cell will become short and ventricle will contract and in this way tension will be produced in the wall which will translate into pressure. Right, and with that pressure, aortic valve will be opened and stroke volume will be ejected out. Am I clear? Is that right? Now, we have already discussed that how depolarization can lead to contractility. Now, we will talk about how repolarization triggers the diastolic relaxation. Now, during repolarization, when a lot of potassium goes out, Membrane again becomes electronegative, that is minus 90 millivolt. When membrane is minus 90 millivolt, it means membrane is again polarized back to its negative state. It started with minus 90 and it ended up again on minus 90. We say membrane is again repolarized negatively. Now, as soon as repolarizes, many repolarization sensitive, you can say mechanisms are activated. Number one, that special type of what is this a pump and this is not sodium potassium pump this uses the ATP but by breaking the ATP it get energized and take the calcium out so this calcium which was coming extracellularly in which came during the plateau phase it must go out and this calcium which is present here it should also go into back situation. Now, this calcium will go by two mechanisms out. One mechanism is calcium ATPases. What is this called? This is called, yes please, calcium ATPase pump, ATPases in the membrane, right? Secondly, there is another way to get the calcium out because calcium has to get out from the cell to X. And this is very important to understand. Now, this is a very unique type of exchanger, right? This is a very, very unique type of exchanger and this exchanger is calcium sodium exchanger. What is this exchanger? This is called calcium sodium exchanger. Normally what is happening that sodium from outside will come in through this exchanger and calcium from inside will go out. So this is called calcium sodium or sodium calcium exchanger or antiport. In this way, the calcium antiport, antiport, A N T I P 
P-O-R-T, antipore, right? Yeah, so what is happening that this antipore, now listen, if someone asks you that during depolarization, during the diastole, what really happens, ventricle relaxes. Why ventricle relaxes? Because calcium which came in and started uh, the whole contractile machinery, this should be back to its position. So calcium which came, excess cellular calcium which came in, it will be pumped, it will be going back to the extra cellular fluid through the sodium, uh, through the uh, calcium ATPases and through the calcium exchanger. Am I clear? Meanwhile, as soon as this is no more depolarized, right, then it means no more trigger calcium is coming, it means there is no more stimulation of it. As soon as the stimulation closes, these channels, what were these channels? These channels will be closed. These channels are closed. These are calcium releasing channels. So it means further release of calcium is impaired or stopped. Not only this. Here are also, there are special type of, now you can recognize, what is it? This is your friend, you have seen it previously. Yeah, these are calcium ATPases. So it means that there are calcium ATPases present in the sarcoplasmic reticulum also. So these calcium ATPases are very, very sensitive to voltage. As well as cell become repolarized, they become very active and whatever calcium has gone out, they will reaccumulate. They will take it back, right? So this calcium, through these calcium, what is this? ATPases, which are activated during diastolic phase, at the onset of diastole, rather I should say, at the end of the systole, these calcium ATPases are activated and very rapidly they take the calcium back, they pump the calcium back, they accumulate the calcium back into and sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, listen, when calcium become less here, when calcium level become less here, then calcium detaches from tropo? troponin and it goes back. And when calcium uh, troponin does not have calcium, it will again insert the tropomyosin between the myosin head and actin. And now actin myosin cannot interact. So there will be no interaction between actin and myosin and sarcomere will relax. And when a lot of sarcomeres will relax, cell will relax tension in the cell will be reduced, eventually whole myocardium will lose the tension and it will become relaxed tissue. And now ventricle will fill. Again, let me repeat. How really repolarize, uh, how the, uh, there was onset of diastole? We have to remember that onset of diastole means that now ventricle is going to relax. It's going to lose, myocardium is going to lose the tension. Uh, how it will lose the tension? For losing the tension, actin myosin interaction should stop. How actin myosin interaction can be stopped by reducing the calcium level, which was right, and how the calcium level can be re reduced by two ways. The calcium can be pumped to extracellular environment and calcium can be pumped okay. to the in intracellular stores in sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once calcium goes back, naturally uh, actin myosin interaction is lost and that leads to what type of diastolic relaxation. But there is one thing, please concentrate on this concept that during whole this process, you see sodium came at two places in. Number one, sodium came during depolarization. Number two, sodium is coming through calcium sodium exchanger. And this sodium should not accumulate in because during whole this process, we said calcium came in, calcium went out. We said calcium was released from here, it is taken back. Is that right? But during depolarization, sodium came. Sodium is coming into this myocardial cell during every depolarization and sodium is also coming when uh, intracellular calcium is going out and during the exchanger process. Do you think this sodium should be allowed to accumulate? Answer is no. At the same time, during every action potential, potassium is lost. So do you think potassium should be lost forever? Answer is no. So we have to restore calcium, sorry, we have to restore sodium potassium balance for this purpose. Now this is your beautiful friend. This is sodium potassium ATPase. So what it will keep on doing? 
right? This will sodium potassium HP is whatever sodium is coming in, it will take out, right? Even this sodium, right? Yeah, and whatever potassium was going out, it will take that potassium in. The potassium which was lost, that will be brought back. So this is right what is happening that it is bringing the sodium is taken out and potassium is brought in and this is called sodium potassium ATPases. In this way during depolarization now listen carefully let's sum up the whole process. During depolarization sodium come in it will go out through sodium potassium ATPase. During plateau phase potassium was going out that will be brought back to the cell by sodium potassium ATPase. During plateau, calcium was coming, which was triggering the release of calcium from intracellular store, right, and leading to contractility. This calcium, which was excess cell coming in, it is taken back through calcium ATPases and calcium sodium exchanges. Is that right? Then whatever calcium was released by sarcoplasmic reticulum, right, that will be recaptured by calcium ATPases present in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Is there any question? So in this way, contraction will be followed by relaxation. Is that clear? Yes. Right? Okay. Now we are going to discuss that how sympathomimetic drugs produce positive inotropy or how epinephrine and related compounds increase cardiac contractility. Right? So, for that purpose, let me draw, you know what type of adrenergic receptors are present on the myocardium? They are beta 1 receptor. For example, this is epinephrine. Here it is. Epinephrine or norepinephrine. Now, this epinephrine work on special type of receptors and these receptors are able to bind the epinephrine. But these receptors have something very unique. They pass through the membrane seven times. That is why these receptors are called, yes, what type of receptors? Seven pass receptors. These receptors are called seven pass receptors, right? These are, this is a special type of receptor present in myocardial cells for epinephrine and these have, this is an extracellular domain and they are having intracellular domain, right? Extracellular domain binds the epinephrine, intracellular domain gives signal to the cell that epinephrine is there. Once the epinephrine binds here, once the epinephrine binds here, this 7 pass receptor is stimulated. Another name for this 7 pass receptor is serpentine receptor because it is like snake. So, we call it serpentine receptor, right? Because this serpentine receptor is for adren adrenaline, so we call it also adrenergic receptor and this is called beta 1 adrenergic receptor. You know the alpha 1 adrenergic receptor, the beta 1 adrenergic receptor, the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, the type of adrenergic receptors which are present on the myocardium are beta 1 adrenergic receptor. Now these beta 1 receptor when epinephrine bind with this, the internal domain of beta 1 adrenergic receptor is stimulated. This will stimulate an intracellular protein which is called G stimulatory protein, right? G stimulatory protein has three components. There is alpha stimulatory, there is beta and gamma component. Now, what really happens that as soon as epinephrine bind with adrenergic receptor, adrenergic receptor internal domain stimulate the alpha component of G stimulatory protein. Why we call it G protein? Because normally when it is inactive, it is binding GDP. But as soon as this is activated, it binds GTP. So when it is activated, it loses the GDP and it acquires here GTP. You know GTP mean triphosphate. So as soon as this molecule acquires, loses the diphosphate, guanosine diphosphate and acquires the GTP, it becomes highly energized. This highly energized 
molecule will kick its friend the way. It's very arrogant now. He wants to develop some special new relationship, right? So this alpha component, alpha stimulatory, after stimulation, it loses the GDP, acquires the GTP, and GTP bound alpha stimulatory component is extremely active, and it binds, stimulates, you can say, a special type of molecule, and this molecule, when it is stimulated, right, this molecule has a special enzymatic domain, right? So, epinephrine stimulated the adrenergic receptor, adrenergic receptor stimulated the alpha component of G protein, alpha component of G protein activated this enzyme and this enzyme is called adenyl cyclase. This enzyme is called adenyl cyclase and this enzyme is capable of now converting the Yes, this is able to convert, what is this, ATP into, yes, excellent, that this will convert ATP into cyclic AMP. So, what is really happening? That when epinephrine is acting on the myocardial cells, intracellular cyclic AMP levels are going up, right, intracellular cyclic AMP levels are going up. This cyclic AMP level, right, the, the cyclic AMP will drive another, you can say, enzyme and this cyclic AMP sensitive enzyme is called protein kinase C. What is the name of this enzyme? Protein kinase C. So, what really happens? You put the first messenger here, epinephrine. Oh, uh, previously, doctors never, never knew whole this molecular chain. They only knew that we put the first messenger epinephrine here and in the cell, cyclic AMP goes up. So, doctor said this is the first messenger and this is the second messenger. Now, they know the first messenger bind with the receptor. Receptor activate the intracellular regulatory G proteins. G protein activate the effector adenyl cyclases. Adenyl cyclases convert the ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP drive the protein kinases. Which enzymes? This drives protein kinases, right? And these protein kinases are very happy because they are stimulated. Once these protein kinases are stimulated, what will they do? You remember there were calcium channels here, right? These were called L-type calcium channel. And what was the function of these channels? That they were providing the trigger calcium during the plateau phase, right? So what this protein kinase? C is going to do. This protein kinase C, if this is a L type channel, right, this is a calcium channel, what protein kinase C is going to do, it will lead to, yes, it will lead to phosphorylation of, what is this, L type channels. And when these channels become phosphorylated, they become more open. And when they become more open, then calcium coming into cell will be less or more? more. There will be more intracellular calcium. There will be more intracellular calcium. Right? So, what does it mean? We have studied a molecular command system which is controlled by the epinephrine. That epinephrine stimulate a whole molecular event which eventually lead to increase in intracellular calcium. Is that right? And of course, then this additional calcium, this additional calcium which has come in, right, it will be stored into uh, sarcoplasmic. sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when this additional calcium is stored into sarcoplasmic reticulum, what really happens? That next time, next contraction, additional calcium will be released and additional contraction will be there. And in this way, epinephrine through whole this molecular system loads the cell with extra calcium. This extra calcium gets stored into sarcoplasmic reticulum. So during, now sarcoplasmic reticulum is overloaded with the calcium. So during every action potential, with every depolarization, it releases excessive amount of calcium. And during every systole, there is excessive no, st strength in the contraction of myocardial muscle. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it, it can, but actually what really happens, that whenever calcium is present here, 
during systole it will bind here but during diastole whatever calcium is here right it will be immediately powerfully pump here because there are, so, uh, there are calcium pumps here calcium ATPases we are using heavy amount of ATP to keep the this area free of calcium during diastole so that there should be good diastole there should be good relaxation but this calcium is coming in especially during depolarization it can bind here but after that eventually if epinephrine work for 10 minutes or 30 minutes lot of calcium which has come in the result will be after 30 minutes that there will be overloaded calcium stores in the cell because whatever calcium additional calcium is coming eventually it will add to the store and every time calcium is released from store and it is again restored is that right this mechanism you showed to us what is the benefit of this mechanism uh, i'm going to tell you in a nutshell uh, there, if there's a very big dog after you right chasing you, chasing you <laughs> all right now you need you want to run away so you need more cardiac output or less cardiac output uh, need more cardiac you need output. more cardiac output so epinephrine is released right oh, yeah, yeah. and slide, yeah. yeah and this epinephrine will come to the heart this epinephrine will work through this mechanism on SA node and load the calcium in SA node. So SA node will fire more. AV node will have more calcium. It will conduct more. Myocardial cell will have more calcium. It will contract more. So heart rate will increase, contractility will increase, cardiac output will increase, and you are able to run away from the dangerous dog. I hope you have one, one advantage, right? Then secondly, in many other conditions, when sympathetic overflow occur, your heart rate and contractility so increase. Uh, this is sympathetic stimulation. Is that right? Now question is this, that once sympathetic nervous system stimulates your heart, your heart remains stimulated forever or it is transient stimulation? Transient. transient. So it means that naturally this epinephrine which is binding here, it will be destroyed by the enzymes in the liver, right? And GIT and it, its metabolites will go out of the body. But what happened to the cyclic AMP? We have to understand what happened to this, yeah, what happened to this cyclic? AMP, if it remains for long time inside, it will keep on accumulating too much calcium. calcium. So it has to be destroyed as well. For this destruction, there is a very special type of enzyme. There is a very special type of enzyme which will break down its cyclic nature and it will convert into simple AMP. And simple AMP cannot drive this, right? And there is a special enzyme here, okay. You will tell me the name of this enzyme right it is destructive enzyme it destroys the cyclic destroys the cyclic amp and let me tell you just to remind this that you have to tell me some people who yeah what this is cup of what tea, tea. this is what caffeine does caffeine does it blocks this enzyme so it does not allow cyclic amp to break down is that right? So you have to tell me what is the name of this enzyme. Phosphodiesterase. This enzyme is called phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterases. Is that right? So now what really happens that sympath sympathomimetic activity will increase cyclic AMP and phosphodiesterases de de destroy cyclic AMP. Is that right? To AMP. Right? Now. Uh, break, uh, break down the cyclic AMP into simple AMP, right, which is not active. Is that clear to you? Now we can talk about the drugs which work on whole this system. This is a normal and natural system. This was normal electrical excitation and contraction. This is normally how adrenergic system and machinery is already available for. This is the normal adrenergic machinery which is normally available, molecular machinery to enhance the calcium input. Do you have any question up to this? No. Now we come to the drugs. First of all, we come to the digitalis. You know, digitalis group of drug, we also call them cardiac glycosides. There are three, okay, let me write here. There are three drugs which are positive inotropic, right? There is no place, but still I will do an effort to write here somewhere, right? So, now, I will write down the three positive inotropic drugs, group of drugs. One is digitalis group, digitalis. The two drugs which are available in is digoxin, 
in this group digoxin and other is DG toxin, right? Digoxin is more commonly used. So, one group is digitalis or digoxin which can stimulate the contractility in the heart. Other group of drugs are called sympatho mimetic drugs like dopamine and dobutamine. I will explain how they work. Dopamine and dobutamine. And third group of drug is here it is DG Tellus, right? And third group of drug is phosphodiesterase inhibitors, right? Like emrenon, emrenon, and milrenon. Now I will tell you how these drugs work. If this diagram is very clear to you, then we can start on this. Milrinon, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now, first of all, we will talk about how digitalis work. One thing should be clear to you. If I am saying all these drugs are positive inotropic, it means all of them are increasing contractility. If all of them are increasing the contractility, it means all of them increase intracellular awesome. calcium level. The basic, the crux of understanding is all these drugs which are positive inotropic somehow should be able to increase intracellular level of calcium, so their contraction should be more. Now, we have to see that how calcium level is increased. First of all, we will deal with digitalis. You know where the digitalis work? Look here. Excellent. This is the point that digitalis work. Digitalis. Digitalis binds with what is this? Sodium potassium, sodium potassium pump. pumps because digitalis bind with sodium potassium pump. So, what really happens that it binds with the pump and slows it down. Digitalis bind with the pump and slow it down. Look at it. Now, pump is very sad. Right? And it is weeping because what has stuck with it? Digitalis. Digitalis is bound with it and it binds reversibly and slightly inhibit the pump. If pump is inhibited, can the sodium go out? Please tell me. No. The sodium which was going through this pump, the sodium will start accumulating in. Then it, so it means primarily digitalis bind with sodium potassium ATPases, inhibit the sodium potassium ATPases and increases intracellular sodium and it increases intracellular sodium. Now look, if intracellular sodium is too much, look attention, if intracellular sodium is more than normal, will the extracellular sodium love to come in? If there is more sodium in, then concentration gradient which was moving the sodium extracellular to in is reduced. If extracellular sodium is not coming in, then will this pump work, exchanger work? No. So, primary, primary when exchanger will not work, can calcium go out? No. So, calcium will keep on accumulating in because this pump stop, so calcium accumulates in. This is a very important point and concept to understand. That is someone asks how the digitalis work? You say that digitalis primarily work on sodium potassium ATPases on the sarcolemal membrane or myocardial cell membrane. They inhibit the sodium potassium ATPases. Then if sodium efflux from the cell is reduced, when sodium is increased in the cell, then extracellular sodium gradient moving the sodium in is reduced. When the tendency of sodium influx is reduced, right, then exchanger cannot work. So, actually, we can say digitalis primarily in slows down sodium, sodium potassium ATPs. But secondarily, by increasing intracellular sodium, digitalis secondarily slows down the sodium calcium sodium calcium exchanger and when sodium calcium exchanger is slow then cell will start accumulating calcium. Now listen, now during if you have digitalized the patient, if your patient is digitalized, now during every 
action potential, calcium will come in. But can it go out properly? No. no. So this calcium, which could not go out, will be captured by uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And gradually, stores of calcium in sarcoplasmic reticulum will increase. Are you understanding? And when sarcoplasmic reticular calcium stores will increase, then with every B, every uh, action potential, extra calcium is released and extra contractility is there. And we say digital has produced positive inotropy. Digital has produced positive inotropy, right? This is one how the digital has work as a positive inotropic agent. Now let's see how dopamine and dobutamine work. Are you interested to know that? Yes, sir. Okay. It's so simple. Yes, please. What's your question, Mr. Abdul Salam? Sure. What about the calcium uh, ATPase? Yeah, they keep on working because some of the calcium, that's good. We should not close all the doors. Otherwise, there will be too much calcium in the cell and cell may undergo apoptosis. We have to slightly increase the calcium in the cell to get beneficial effect of contraction. So, calcium ATPases keep on working, but calcium sodium exchanger slows down. So calcium which was supposed to go through this pathway, that some calcium is retained. Remember, too much calcium in the cell is toxic for the cell. We slightly want to increase the calcium, right? Is that clear? The mechanism of action. Yeah, this is the mechanism of action of digitalis. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Right. Now we come to, if someone asks you how the dopamine and dobutamine stimulate the heart, it's so simple. It's wonderfully simple. Look at here. Dopamine and dobutamine are capable of binding to this receptor. Here is dopamine, right? And here is dobutamine. This is dopamine. And here is dobutamine. It's so easy to understand that both of them they actually stimulate this point. So it means what they are doing? They bind with beta 1 adrenergic receptor. Dopamine and dobutamine are beta 1 adrenergic receptor stimulator. That is so simple. I think th there is any fun in explaining how the contractility will increase now? No. You know it. Let us just recap. The dopamine and dobutamine bind with beta 1 adrenergic receptor stimulate that, that stimulate intracellular G proteins, G stimulatory, that stimulates adenylyl cyclase, that increases the cyclic AMP level. Increase cyclic AMP levels overdrive the protein kinase C which phosphorylate the calcium channels and when these calcium channels are phosphorylated, when these calcium channels are phosphorylated, they remain open for longer time and during every trigger extra calcium is coming and eventually that is also stored and released for more effective and stronger contraction. Is that clear? Very good. Excellent. Now, the third group, amrinon and milrinon. It's too easy. First I tell you, in the coffee and caffeine, what really happened, that caffeine that we take, you know, after taking too much coffee, you feel your palpitations and heart rate increases. What's the reason? Actually, caffeine inhibits the phosphodiesterases, right, and increases cyclic AMP level. Here, it is not the, in this case, we are giving to the patient a uh, drug, emrinon or milrinon, right? Abdul Salam is now really excited. Achha. Now, what really happens, this was the, uh, you can say, uh, drug which was breaking down the cyclic AMP. What was this? Look, this was going to, it will break down the cycle, the cycle breaker, right, cyclic AMP, like crutch crutch, it breaks down the cycle, right. What really happens, this is which enzyme, what was the name of this enzyme? Phosphodiesterases. Phosphodiesterases. So these are the phosphodiesterases, right, which actually, break down the cyclic AMP, right? And this phosphodiesterases are inhibited by the drugs. Look here, this is the drug. Right? 
And what this drug is doing? It prevents AMP from happening. Hammering on it. It destroys the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. What is the name of this drug? Right? Amarinon. It's hammering on this. This is? Amarinon. Amarinon and? Milrinon. So the function of amarinon and milrinon is to inhibit the phosphodiesterases and when phosphodiesterases are inhibited, cyclic AMP levels will go Increase. high. And if cyclic AMP levels are increasing, of course, there's additional activity of the protein kinase C and that will lead to a phosphor extra phosphorylation of calcium channels and more calcium is loaded and that more calcium richer stores and during every systole extra calcium comes and heart beat more powerfully. So all these drugs help the heart to load with slightly extra calcium so that it contracts more strongly and its systolic dysfunction should be corrected. Right? Its systole become better. Why we were giving these drugs? Because there was systolic failure. Because heart could not contract well. Right? Yes. Yeah, protein kinase A is an enzyme which phosphorylates the calcium channels and C, C. protein kinase C, sorry, protein kinase, when cyclic, look, amarinone and milrinone inhibit phosphodiesterases. There's one very interesting drug which works on different type of phosphodiesterases. Dr. Jamie must be knowing it. There's a wonderful drug which inhibit a very unique type of special type of phosphodiesterase. That is, that group of phosphodiesterases are called phosphodiesterase 5 type. The name of the drug, you must be knowing it because when th that drug is given, then cyclic GMP in the male organ is not broken and you get powerful world class erection. Viagra, I know you knew, knew this thing. Right. So, but here, thank God Viagra does not work here. Is that right? That Viagra or Sildenafil inhibits the phosphodiesterases which break down cyclic GMP in the male organ. Just a link between. But caffeine is a little bit different. Caffeine can go to the cells, myocardial cell or smooth muscles or the neurons and inhibit those phosphodiesterases which break down the cyclic AMP. That is why in the presence of caffeine, sympathetic nervous system activity is increased because sympathetic nervous system produces its action by increasing Cyclic AMP and caffeine does not allow cyclic AMP to be broken. So, action of sympathetic nervous system is exaggerated. Am I clear? So, the both the questions. Yeah. So drugs, amarinone and milrinone yeah. have the same ingredients as caffeine? Uh, they, they are structurally different than caffeine, right? And uh, But they work at the same enzyme uh, where the caffeine work. Is that right? But they are not just caffeine. Okay. You can say they, they are not caffeinated drugs. There are very different molecules and I will tell you later when we'll, uh, tomorrow we'll study these drugs in detail that they are very dangerous drugs because sometimes they inhibit it so much and it become protein kinase C becomes so active, too much calcium in and too much calcium in, too much calcium in will bring the, take the rest of the potential near the threshold and automatically is a dangerous tachyarrhythmia will start. We'll talk about that in next session. Today we are going to talk about digitalis in detail, right? Digitalis is a group of compounds which increase contractility of the heart, right? And this group of compounds because they increase the strength of contractility of myocardium, these drugs are called positive inotropic drugs, right? Out of this uh, group, uh, two are commonly used. Out of this group, one is digoxin digoxin and other is yes dg toxin digitoxin digoxin what do you think which should be used more digoxin is used much more right it has some advantages over digitoxin and it is very commonly used right is uh, if you have to use a digitalis group of drugs the preferred choice is digoxin, right? You must be knowing why it is preferred over digitoxin. Okay. Do you know which one has 
short half life and which has long half life because if you are which one is the, the the one which has short half life that has less chances of toxicity so can you tell me out of them which has short half life which has long half life so how you know it yeah the simplest thing it's even spellings are less the drug with less spellings has short half life and drug which has longer spellings it takes it has longer half life so the advantages the digoxin has shorter half life shorter half life for example it is only 36 hours right or you can say one and a half day and di digoxin digitoxin has a half life of half life of five days then which will start action earlier the smart one this is the smart one it has less spellings right that has more spellings so it's it's action start mechanism of action start if you give this drug it start its action around 20 minutes within 20 minutes and this start its action uh, about after 60 minutes right then protein binding of course which has short half life should bind to protein less which has long half life it means it is sticking to plasma proteins more right so it binds with the plasma protein about 30 percent of it plasma protein binding plasma protein binding and here the plasma protein binding is about 90 percent and then there's a very important difference digoxin goes out through rapid pathway through renal right its clearance is it goes yeah renal excretion it is freely filtered in glomeruli but digitoxin you know digitoxin has longer spelling so you have to remember look here Digitoxin has long, longer spellings, so it has longer half life. It by it takes longer time to start its action. Digitoxin more strongly binds with plasma protein, and because digitoxin has more spelling, just a funny way to remember, it should be a, need a bigger organ to go out. What do you think? Kidney is bigger or liver is bigger? Uh, I mean, liver, is liver is a larger organ. So actually, the digitoxin has to go out through hepatobiliary system. So it first gets metabolized, first get metabolized there and after that it goes out of the, through hepatobiliary system and of course through GIT. This point is important clinically because that preferred if you have to use the digitalis group of drugs, the preferred drug is digoxin, it's a smarter drug, right, shorter duration of a shorter you can say half life early faster onset of action less protein binding and cleared through kidney other drug digitoxin you know look at it it's in its name it is written that it can be acting as a toxin is that right digitoxin you don't find toxin in the digoxin do you so whenever you see digoxin and digitoxin Toxin within the digitoxin should remind you it can produce more toxic and complications. So usually it is avoided. So when we really use this uh, drug, second line drug, only when patient has significant renal problems. If someone has chronic renal failure and you really need to digitalize the patient, then you should prefer digitoxin. If only when patient has chronic renal failure. If patient has uh, relatively good functioning kidney, digoxin should be the drug of choice right then how the digoxin produces how the digoxin produces positive inotropy we have already discussed very very briefly we will review it so what really happens basically there are in the myocardial cell membrane there are special type of pumps and these pumps are sodium potassium ATP this. So what is it? Look here. This is sodium potassium 
ATT pays. It is doing primary active transport or secondary active transport just for a basic concept. This is doing primary active transport or secondary active transport. It is primary because whenever there is active transport using the ATP directly that is primary active transport. Normally so what it is doing? It is taking the yes sodium out and bringing the potassium in. Is that right? What we discussed that digitalis, digitalis, yeah this is digitalis, it binds over this pump, I think it is sitting in a very awkward position, it sits on this pump, when digitalis sits on this pump, pump will work fast or slow, slow. So what really happens that when digitalis is binding the sodium potassium ATP, this there is intracellular sodium accumulation, right? Intracellular sodium increased, right? That will lead to intra after digitalization, intracellular sodium will increase. And when intracellular sodium is increased, now we have to remember there is a special exchanger. And what is this exchanger doing? Yes, this is uh, you can say sodium calcium exchanger. Normally it allows sodium to come in and it allows the calcium to go out. Is that right when it is formed? This exchanger, when this exchanger is working, it is bringing the sodium in and taking the calcium out. Now, the performance of this exchanger, listen very carefully, the performance of this exchanger depends on that how fast sodium is coming in. Is that right? It means it depends on the gradient of sodium, uh, concentration gradient in extracellular and intracellular sodium. When you have digitalized the patient, when you have digitalized the patient, intracellular sodium is more. There is increased intracellular sodium. When intracellular sodium is there, there is already extra sodium. Do you think sodium will love to come in? No. So there is reduced gradient for the sodium to move from extracellular environment to intracellular area. When there is reduced movement of the sodium, right, that will reduce the total activity of this exchanger. So naturally when less sodium is coming in through this exchanger there will be less calcium going out through this exchanger right. Now so in this way blocking the sodium potassium ATPase primarily increases intracellular sodium but when intracellular sodium is more that fills the exchanger and that secondarily increases intracellular calcium. And this calcium which is unable to go out is captured by special intracellular apparatus. What is this? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what this apparatus will love to do? That it has special type of calcium ATPases. It has special type of, what are these pumps? Calcium ATPases. What is the function of this calcium ATPases? That during the repolarization process, during the diastole, right? These calcium ATPases actively transport the extracellular, extra, in, uh, excuse me, we have to correct it. What is the basic function of this calcium ATPases is that when myocardium is relaxing, right, during that time, they are pumping the intracytosolic calcium. What is this calcium? This is in the cytosol right, intracytosolic calcium to the sarcoplasmic place, right. So we can say that these are calcium capturing, calcium capturing mechanisms. What are these? Calcium ATPases. They will, they will actively transport calcium from the cytosolic area to sarcoplasmic reticulum. So in this way, when this uh, due to impaired performance by the exchanger, when calcium is retained into cytosol, it is immediately stored into sarcoplasmic 
reticulum. So the result is that in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium concentration become very, very high. Did you know in sarcoplasmic reticulum how, how the calcium is stored? There are calcium binders. You know, you want to know the name of that calcium binders? Sure. They are, okay, they sequester the calcium. There are special proteins here. I will show you, for example, this is the protein here. This protein has points here. And who will fit in these points? Calcium. Calcium will stick to these points. So this protein is calcium binding proteins. Or more truly we say, these are calcium sequestering proteins. These are calcium sequestering protein. So their name is very simple. Calcium sequestering pr proteins are called simply cal sequestrins. Sequestrins. So we can say that sarcoplasmic reticulum is very rich in cal sequestrins so that whenever pump bring the calcium in, calcium will get bound to cal sequestrin. Is that right? So when if patient remains digitalized for longer time, it means in the digitalized cell, sodium level is more. So naturally, calcium level will become more due to impairment of this exchanger. That will lead to extra calcium loading into sarcoplasmic reticulum. And now, whenever depolarization will come after under digitalization action, there is more calcium loaded here. Now, whenever depolarization will come, during depolarization, sodium comes in. Is that right? Now, let me tell you the mechanism of depolarization. Right, sodium comes in, then it is followed by during the plateau phase, there is incoming. What is it? Incoming potassium is this, my friend. Potassium is going out and calcium is coming in. What is this calcium? Extracellular calcium. So during plateau phase of the action potential, extracellular calcium comes. N. And this extracellular calcium act as the trigger calcium. This calcium is acting as trigger calcium and this will act on what? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when they will act on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then calcium releasing channels will be opened in sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is called triggered calcium. And now, because it is overloaded with calcium, so it will release normal amount of calcium or extra amount of calcium. So, as compared to normal situation, there is too much calcium released, right? So, patient myocardial cells which are digitalized, right? These cells under the influence of digitalis retain more calcium stores in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and on arrival of action potential, especially by the, during the influx of trigger calcium, they release massive amount of calcium and this calcium remaining story you must be knowing, yes, this calcium will bind with the, yeah, this calcium will bind, what is this thing, right, this calcium will bind with troponin, this is troponin, this calcium will bind with the troponin and troponin, this is, what is this? Tropomyosin. So when calcium will bind, the extra calcium will bind with extra troponins. Troponins will work more effectively and pull away the tropomyosin between the binding sites of myosin head and actin. So what, what really happens that this is pulled away. And when this is pulled away, right, actin myosin interaction is more effective and there is stronger contact away. Is that right? So whenever Digitalis eventually lead to more sodium, calcium loading and more calcium release during every systole. More calcium act more on the troponin and extra work on troponin. Extra, uh, you can say changes in the extra, uh, tropomyosin and there will be better interaction between the actin myosin filaments and that will lead to better contraction. And when there is better contraction, we say there is positive ionotropy. So this is how digitalis work. Is that right? Now this section of digitalis is something which most of the doctor know. But there is one more action of digitalis only very good doctors know. Right? But that action is extremely important clinically. So what is the second action of digitalis? Now I am about to be impressed by you. 
Up to now, we have discussed that one action of the digoxin or digitalis is that it increases the intracellular calcium. What is the second action of digitalis, please? Digoxin. It has two actions, right? <coughs> one action which every doctor knows, every good doctor knows that it increases intracellular calcium. <coughs> it's a calcium loader, right? And due to this calcium loading, we can say that digitalis is a positive inotropic drug. Due to this calcium loading. What is the second very important action? of digoxin. Yes. <coughs> what is the second most impo very important injection in, in action of digoxin? Yes, if you don't know, should I mention? That is, this drug is, only very good doctor know this, this drug is also stimulant to vagus system. Right? So, it is a vagotonic drug. Vago tonic drug. This increases the vagus tone. Now we will see that if you know the both actions, you can really talk in very good way that what are the net action of digitalis on the heart. Let me draw heart here. So that's a node. This is AV node, and these are your conduction pathway. This is bundle of his and right bundle branch and left bundle branch. Now this is your heart. We have to see what are the actions of digitalis on your heart. Now we are going to see the actions of digitalis on the heart. You know that right vagus supplies the what is this? Right vagus supplies as a node and left vagus mainly supplies excellent. A little bit of anatomy here. That left vagus supplies AV node. This is right vagus and here is left vagus. Now, first the direct action on the heart, calcium loading. So, number one, it loads the calcium in, directly this drug loads the calcium in SA node. It loads the calcium in atria. It loads the calcium directly in, what is it? AV node. And it loads the calcium in Purkinje fiber. And it loads the calcium on contractile myocardium. Is that right? This is a direct action of digitalis. When digitalis work on SA node, it directly load, it become loaded with calcium. Atrial muscle become loaded with calcium. AV node become loaded with calcium. Conduction pathway become loaded with extra calcium. And what is this? Contracting myocardium, ventricular myocardium also become loaded with calcium. These are direct action, right? Then there are indirect action. Indirect action are through neuronal system that vag uh, digitalis also stimulate vagus. So, vagal activity is increased or decreased? And if vagal activity is increased, vagal activity mainly work on, yes, on SA node and AV node. Very little vagal activity on atrium and almost no vagal activity on ventricle. This point is very important, right? That Sympathetic and parasympathetic action on heart, right? I will draw this black as sympathetic receptors. Sympathetic receptors are present on SA node. Sympathetic receptors. Sympathetic receptors are present on atrium. Please draw this diagram. Sympathetic receptors are present on AV node. Sympathetic receptors are present on what is this? Conduction pathway. And sympathetic receptors are present on ventricular myocardium. Actually, adrenergic receptors are present all over the heart. The concept which I am trying to make, the adrenergic receptors are present all over the heart. So, catecholamine they have action on all the heart. 
catecholamine has AC node action, atrial action, AV node action, Purkinje system action and ventricular action. But this is the action of sympathetic nervous system. But parasympathetic nervous system has action on AC node, it has receptors on AC node, it has receptors on AV node, very few receptors on atria are almost no receptor on ventricular. Now what I am trying to put in your mind? I am trying to emphasize that when there is adrenergic activity, right, it will change the activity of enhance the activity of AC node, atria, AV node and ventricles. But when there is parasympathetic activity, parasympathetic activity will influence the heart mainly by action on AC node and AV node. Is that clear? So, we can say that parasympathetic nervous system we can say epinephrine or sympathetic nervous system has global action on heart. Write it down the word that sympathetic nervous system has global action on heart. Epinephrine or norepinephrine or other sympathomimetic drugs like dopamine. But parasympathetic nervous system has only selected or limited action on heart, only on SA node and AV node. Now look at this thing that once you have understood this concept, now we say that calcium loading is a direct action. This is a direct action of digoxin on the myocardium, but vagal tonic action is indirect. By changing the vagal tone, it changes the cardiac function. Now vagus is SA node stimulator or inhibitor? inhibitor, yes, it is parasympathetic nervous system and it means vagus is negative chronotropic, vagus is negative chronotropic influence, chronotropic influence, is that right? And here left vagus is negative dromotropic influence, dromotropic influence, right? Right vagus is positive, chrono, uh, negative chronotropic. So, it means that when right vagus is stimulated, sinus, SA node activity is reduced. And when left vagus is stimulated, and of course it is stimulated, it means AV nodal activity is reduced. Now, you see one thing. The direct action, whenever any myocardial area is loaded with the calcium, it is stimulated. Now, listen. The calcium which is put in SA node, it, it is trying to make it positive chronotropic. By direct loading of the calcium is positive chronotropic influence, but indirect vagal activity lead to negative chronotropic and vagal activity dominates over SA node. So, if SA node will be under negative chronotropic or SA node will be in, in a nutshell, SA node will be inhibited. In the same way when calcium is loaded on AV node, calcium stimulates the AV node, but there is more action by the vagus and vagal action dominates due to this reason AV node is also inhibited. So, we can say digitalis right inhibits the SA node, inhibits the AV node, but when digitalis load the calcium in atrial myocardium and when digitalis load the calcium in ventricular myocardium right, there is no opposing action by vagus on atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium. So, atrial myocardium is stimulated and ventricular myocardium is also stimulated. So, now you should say that due to its direct action, it stimulate atrial and ventricular myocardium, but due to indirect vagotonic influence, it inhibits the sinus activity and nodal activity. You get it? So, this is the, you can say the gist of understanding that when you give digitalize the patient, right, due to its direct action, it is loading, uh, it is stimulating atrial and ventricular myocardium and due to its indirect vagotonic influence, it is, yes, it is inhibiting SA node and AV node. Now, you look at it. The beauty of this concept is that if you develop, look, if you develop toxicity of this drug due to any mechanism, if you develop toxicity of digoxin, then toxic doses of digoxin will produce sinus bradycardias and nodal bradycardias, but it will produce atrial tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia. So, what a funny situation 
that same drug can produce bradycardia as well as tachycardia. So, a patient when it is heavily digitalized and if he, if he develop toxicity, then what really happens that sinus and nodal bradyarrhythmias will occur, atrial and ventricular tachyarrhythmias will occur. Let me tell you combination of this, let, let me give you an example of this combination. If there is digitalis toxicity, there is strong AV nodal inhibition and SA nodal inhibition, right? And if AV node is too much inhibited, right, can you take all the impulses down? No. So, we can say when AV node is inhibited too much in toxicity, it will produce AV nodal blocks because this is negatively dromotropic action, right? and AV node can not take all the impulses down through the, from the atrium to the ventricle. Is that right? But it may produce, digitalis will overstimulate what is this? Cal overloaded with the calcium. So, these are ectopic foci. You know when calcium is too much loaded in atrial myocardium or ventricular myocardial cells, when calcium is too much loaded, then resting membrane potential become near to threshold. And then what happens that these cells develop abnormal increased automaticity. An abnormal increased automaticity is called bathmotropic action. So, what we can say this is a very funny drug that by action here it produces negative chronotropic. By action here it produces negative dromotropy. But loading the myocardial cell, it makes them positive inotropic and positive bathmotropic. Because the mechanical action, mechanical advantages of loading the calcium and there are electrical disadvantages of loading the calcium. So, let us suppose that extra calcium in digitalis toxicity produce atrial tachyarrhythmia. That will produce atrial because atrial cells are overloaded with calcium, the, uh, their resting membrane potential become less negative or more near to threshold. So, ectopic <coughs> foci. Uh, may fire too much in the atrium and there may be atrial, what is this, tachycardia. Now, on ECG, on ECG, if you find a patient who has atrial tachycardia with AV nodal blocks, right, they say it is digoxin toxicity until proved otherwise. This is the most classic presentation of digoxin toxicity. The most classical presentation of digoxin toxicity on, <coughs> on ECG is that patient has supraventricular tachycardias with AV nodal blocks. You can understand that due to calcium loading, there are supraventricular tachycardia and due to vagal act activity, AV nodal inhibition, there is AV nodal block. So, you can see this is a, on ECG you will find combination of tachyarrhythmia as well as bradyarrhythmia. Is that right? So, when this combination is there, right, right, when this combination is there, then you should suspect digitalis toxicity. Is that right? Uh, again, let me repeat it that on EKG, what will happen? Let me tell you. Normally, first I will draw the normal EKG and then I will show you the, this EKG with this pathological change. Yeah. We will go into detail later, but I will just tell you only this one. That what really happens on ECG, that normal ECG is P wave, what is this? PR segment, then QRS, T. First I tell you what will be the changes. Listen, this is ST segment. ST segment is coming on ECG and this P wave is making what? Atrial? Depolarization, ST segment is current passing through AV node, write it down, P wave is due to atrial depolarization, ST segment is current passing through AV node, QRS complex shows depolarization spread in the ventricle, depolarization spread in ventricle and ST segment shows when plateau phase, when you can say uh, deep 
all the ventricle is depolarized and no current is flowing and T wave shows repolarization of ventricle, it shows repolarization of ventricle, am I clear? Now, what is happening to the heart? Let us see on ECG. On a digitalized heart, SA node and AV node are stimulated or inhibited? Yeah. Inhibited due to indirect vagotonic action. So first thing will be when current is taking longer time from atria to go to ventricle, when you are digitalized the patient, vagus is inhibiting the AV node. If an AV node is inhibited, it will take shorter time to conduct the impulse down or it will take longer time. Longer time. If it will take longer time, look at the ECG change. That P wave is coming at its time, but current is taking very long time. So, then QRS will come. So, what is happening? That ST segment is prolonged in the time scale. Or if you put P wave with it, this is ST segment. And if you put the P wave also with it, it become PR interval. So, what will happen? PR interval will be shortened or prolonged? Prolonged. So, patient who are digitalized, they may have PR interval prolonged. So, what is the cause of prolonged PR interval? Remember, ST segment has at the end of the P wave at the beginning of QRS. But PR interval is at beginning of the P wave up to the beginning of QRS. So, all those, this is a rule all those phenomena and drugs which inhibit the AV node lead to PR interval prolongation. All the drugs which inhibit the AV node lead to PR interval prolongation. I hope you will remember that. Did you know what are those drugs? At least tell me one drug which can prolong the PR interval. Digitalis, right? Good. So one drug which can prolong the PR interval is digitalis. What are the others? Look. Draw it here. What are the drugs which are making it prolonged? One is digitalis, digoxin. What is the other? AV node conduction depend on calcium. So, calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers. Then AV node is stimulated by sympathetic system. If you inhibit, AV node will be slow. So, beta blockers. Then there is a drug called adenosine. Right? Adenosine act on AV node and bring lot of potassium out of AV nodal cells. Adenosine act on the AV node and forces the AV nodal cell to lose potassium. Of course, if potassium come out, AV node will become too much inhibited and negative. So, it will be lesser. Which the last one? Adenosine. Again, let me tell you. Digoxin by, write down the mechanism. Digoxin by increase vagotonic activity, right? Inhibit the AV node. Calcium channel blocker, block the calcium channel so AV nodal action potential is inhibited. Beta blocker, reduce the sympathetic activity on AV node and AV nodal activity is inhibited. Is that right? You know sympathetic activity also normally load the AV node with calcium. Yesterday we discussed. Then adenosine is a very short acting AV nodal inhibitor. Sometimes it is given when you want to inhibit the AV node for very short time. Adenosine when it binds with AV nodal cells, it opens their potassium channels. So, AV nodal cell will lose potassium and if a lot of potassium come out of the AV nodal cells, AV nodal cells will become more electronegative. If normally they are minus 60 millivolt, now they will become more electronegative due to loss of cations, due to loss of cations and if AV node become too much electronegative, can you stimulate it? No. So, this is what adenosine does. It is also AV nodal blocker. So, all these drugs are AV nodal inhibitor and another mechanism is also AV nodal inhibitor. Look here. If you stimulate here, carotid massage, this will stimulate the vagal outflow. When you do carotid massage, it increases the vagal outflow that also inhibits the AV node. So, the one physical method I have mentioned, four group of drugs I have mentioned which are AV nodal inhibitor. All of them will in, uh, prolong PR interval. But right now we are talking about action of 
digitalis on the ECG. So, effect of the digitalis on ECG we have talked about right now is that if this is our classical ECG, right. Now, what really happens that this become very much prolonged. So, we can say that due to vagal stimulation, digoxin inhibits the AV node and due to ne negative chronotropic action, due to inhibition of AV node, current takes longer time, cardiac impulse take longer time to move from atrium up to ventricle and PR interval is prolonged. Then another thing, this is PR interval. Another concept is QT interval. QT interval start from the onset of the Q wave, QRS complex and it goes up to the end of T wave, right? This is called QT interval. Is that right? Now, QT interval means what? It is beginning of the QRS, it includes the ST segment and it includes the T wave up to the end, QT interval. Now, what is the clinical importance of this? Look here. QT interval signifies, <coughs> the significance of QT interval is, it is telling you the spread of vent onset and spread of ventricular depolarization, the duration for which ventricle remains depolarized and spread and termination of ventricular repolarization. So, it means that QT interval is a duration from the onset of ventricular depolarization up to the termination of ventricular repolarization. Is that right? Clear? Now, listen. I told you that when you are loading the cells with calcium, they become positive inotropic as well as they become positive clinotropic. In clinotropy, I told you that there is increased velocity of contraction. Is that right? There is increased velocity of contraction. Now, QT interval, look here, can be modified by calcium load. When there is more calcium in the cells, QT interval shrink. Look here. Calcium make the cell, myocardial cell more effective or less effective? Uh, less effective. No. Calcium make the myocardial cell more efficient or less efficient? More efficient. More efficient. That is why we are giving the calcium loading drug like digoxin. Right? So, if you keep in your mind that calcium may, calcium loading to the cell makes the myocardium more efficient, it means not only it will contract more efficiently, but it will undergo depolarization and repolarization more efficiently. And if this whole process is occurring more efficiently, it will take longer time or shorter time? If you are efficient, you take for some work longer time, shorter time? Shorter time. Now again, let me repeat. Calcium loading make the myocardial uh, activity more efficient. Is that right? Uh, within physiological limits, after that toxicity will start. Now, when you load the calcium more in myocardial cells, right, not only mechanical activity is more efficient, uh, ventricular electrical activity is also more efficient. Due to that reason, the patient uh, who are digitalized, there is more efficient depolarization and repolarization. So, total the onset of depolarization time up to the offset of completion of repolarization time. This time should be increased or decreased? Decrease. This should be decreased. So, what really happens that QRS T is reduced. Now, look at it. Now, look at the upper, pat upper ECG pattern and lower ECG pattern. Upper has shorter PR. It has a normal PR and normal QT interval. Here, as compared to normal, after this is digitalized heart, as compared to the normal, what is happening? PR interval is prolonged and as compared to the normal, QT interval is shortened. QT interval is shortened. Is that right? So, PR interval is Longer. prolonged and QT interval is Short. shortened. Now, I want to tell you some more thing. I will not go into detail of electrical changes, but almost every doctor knows that in ischemic heart disease, there is changes in ST segment and T wave. In ischemic heart disease, there are changes in ST segment and 
T wave. Is it easy to understand? Now, what what happens in ischemic heart disease which make the ST segment T wave to change? That is a current of injury. That is a current of injury. Current of injury during ischemic heart disease load the myocardial cell with calcium. Here digitalis is also loading the cells with calcium. Now you draw a parallel in your mind as a concept. Ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease. Right? It also loads the calcium. And digitalis. Digitalis. It also loads calcium. Due to calcium loading in ischemic heart disease, you know, ischemic heart disease cells are ischemic and the cell membranes are not working well and extracellular cations like sodium and calcium may be loaded in the ischemic or injured or infarcted cells. Digital also, digitalis also lead to intracellular loading of sodium as well as calcium. So this thing is common in ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease and digitalis both load the cations. And this here the cation loading is too much and we call it current of injury. And that current of injury produces changes in ST segment and T wave. That here T wave may be elevation or T wave may be inversion, you remember, or ST segment may go up or ST segment may go down. So we can say very simply, ischemic heart disease by loading the myocardial cell and producing the current of injury brings ST segment and T wave changes. Now look at the parallel here. Digitalis, even though there is no ischemia, but digitalis, but it's also loading the cells with sodium and calcium, so it will also change the ST segment and T wave. So do you think you need to remember it? It's very simple. So PR interval is prolonged, QT interval is shortened, and there are, yes, there are ST segment, and for example, ST segment may be elevated or depressed and T wave may be inverted. Is that right? So there are three changes on the ACG classically. What are those changes? Due to AV nodal inhibition, there is PR interval prolongation. Due to more efficient depolarization, repolarization, QT interval is shortened. And due to calcium loading, cationic loading, ST segment and T wave changes are also seen there. Yes, Jamie, is it clear? Right? Okay. After this, we will come to another concept. But before that, we will take a break. Now, we, we will talk about how the hemodynamic parameters are disturbed in heart failure and what is the impact of digitalis on those hemodynamic parameters. Let us start with the very basic that is the principles of Starling's law. You know that if you increase, here is end diastolic volume and here is cardiac output, right? And you know it that normally in a healthy heart, end diastolic volume is about 140 ml. In a healthy heart, first I will talk about healthy heart, end diastolic volume is about 140 ml. And we know in a healthy heart, if you keep on increasing end diastolic volume, it means you are filling the heart more. Heart has intrinsic regulation that more you fill in, more it produces output, right? So more you put the venous return, more you fill the ventricle, more you increase the end diastolic volume, there's more stretch on the myocardial fiber and there's stronger contraction. So we can say that in a healthy heart, within physiological limits, if you keep on increasing <coughs> end diastolic volume, actually you are increasing the cardiac, cardiac output. output. So this can go like this. This is the normal function curve, right? Now we have to see that in this normal function curve, what happens in heart failure, number one. And then we have to see what, how digitalis correct the problem. First look at the normal point where heart is operating. Heart is operating normally at this point that in a healthy heart, end diastolic volume is about 140 ml and cardiac output is about 5 liters. Is that right? This is a normal operative point, suppose point A. Right? Now, if this healthy heart suffers with extensive myocardial infarction or this heart is suffering with, suppose, 
chronic ischemic heart disease, repeated ischemia. Do you think that then its power of contraction is increased or decreased? Decreased. It is decreased. It means for a given end diastolic volume, it will produce less cardiac output. Is that right? So curve should go up or curve should come down. Okay. It should come down. So what really happens in cardiac failure, we can say this curve should be depressed like this. And in a feeling heart, heart with poor contractility at end diastolic volume of 140 ml rather than producing 5 liter it will produce maybe only 2 liters suppose 2.5 liters cardiac output has dropped so we can say that this is the cardiac failure point A was the healthy point and point B is the failing heart Right? So we can say that what has happened, the dynamics, hemodynamic performance of the heart has shifted from point A to B when there has been structural or functional defect in the myocardium and myocardial contractility has dropped. Yes, what's your question? Yeah, of course. This is, of course, a very good question by Jamie. He say, is it low output cardiac failure? Of course it is low output cardiac failure because we have divided the cardiac failure into two categories yes high output cardiac failure and low output cardiac failure right digital is given only in low output cardiac failure and we are talking about low output cardiac failure now most common. right yeah most common cardiac failure is low output cardiac failure now point a will shift to the point b now cardiac output drop now what will happen in a failing heart up to now we have not given the drug now we have a failing heart. Here cardiac output is less. If cardiac output is less, now you imagine my heart is pumping less blood. Carotid sinus is overfilled or underfilled? Uh, underfilled. So baroreceptor will fire. They will report to the central nervous system that blood pressure is falling, cardiac output is falling. From central nervous system, sympathetic activity will increase. So at the point B, as soon as cardiac output drops, there is activation of, yes, number one, sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic activity is increased. This is one thing which will happen automatically. Second thing which will happen, that as soon as your cardiac output will drop, not only baroreceptors will increase the sympathetic activity, but do you think renal blood flow will be more or less? When cardiac output drops, renal blood flow will be more or less? It will be low. Blood flow, when cardiac output is less, blood flow going to the kidney is less. When kidney are underperfused, there is activation of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So it means that star number two is that by, by acute drop in cardiac output, there is activation of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone excess. Is that right? Now we see what really happens. Let me draw here is the left heart and here is the right heart. Now, what really happens there what will be the impact of sympathetic nervous system and what will be the impact of renin angiotensin aldosterone excess in the failing heart. Sympathetic nervous system will do one thing good and one thing bad. In the same way renin angiotensin system will also do few things good and few things bad. Now what are the good points? Good point is, for example, when renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system is activated, aldosterone will retain the water. Aldosterone will retain the water and sodium. So it means body will retain salt and water after the onset of failure under the direction of aldosterone. This retained water will increase the blood volume. Right? Kidneys are under the effect of aldosterone, kidneys are retaining salt and water. The salt and water will add to the blood volume. Blood volume will be increased. When blood volume is increased, of course, venous return is increased. Right? When venous return is increased, it means cardiac filling is increased. When cardiac filling is increased, it means end diastolic volume, which was 140, it may become more. Maybe it become 200 and more. 
So what really happens that by activation of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone excess, especially aldosterone retains salt and water through renal mechanism. This retained salt and water increases your blood volume. This increased blood volume lead to increased venous return and increased cardiac filling. And this increased cardiac filling will increase, what is this? And diastolic volume. So it means now point B, right? After this compensatory mechanism will start shifting in this direction. Is that right? This is one thing. Secondly, sympathetic nervous system will increase the heart rate and also increase contractility, right? So that will increase, look, sympathetic activity will increase this axis a little bit. Look here. This was by the salt and water retention. And this was by the, what is this? There is some contraction increased by sympathetic nervous system. Plus one thing more. Sympathetic nervous system is venoconstrictor as well as arteriolo-constrictor. But first I will talk about sympathetic nervous system will constrict the veins as well as angiotensin 2 also constrict the arteries and veins. So it means when these mechanisms become operative, they constrict the veins. When there is venous constriction, can blood stay into veins? No, blood is pushed back to the central system. So due to venoconstriction also, due to sympathetic mediated venoconstriction and angiotensin 2 mediated venoconstriction, there is increased venous return. When there is more venous return to the heart, end diastolic volume will further increase. So why end diastolic volume is increasing? Number one, due to aldosterone mediated salt and water. Number two, that we know a sympathetic nervous system and angiotensin 2 mediated, yes, with a venoconstriction. Is that right? This was good because end diastolic volume is increasing and increase in end diastolic volume is associated with some increase in contractility. Now, but there is a few things which are happening bad. What is the bad thing which is happening? Yes, Abdul Salam. Sodium. No. no. The very bad thing, uh, sodium and salt retention in the beginning is good because it will increase the cardiac output. The bad thing is arterioles are constricting. Sympathetic nervous system constrict the arterioles. Angiotensin 2 constrict the arterioles. So, left heart, can it pump well into very much constricted arteriolar system? It is already filling hard. And now you increase the afterload, afterload the load against which it has to pump, arterial constriction. So the increase in cardiac out output which we were expecting, that will be partly nullified by increasing arteriolar constriction. So by increasing end diastolic volume, we were expecting a big increase in cardiac output. But unfortunately, the same mechanism constrict the arterioles and partly nullify the beneficial action. So cardiac output is increased only slightly. And now heart will shift from point B to, yes, where it is shifting? To point C. Now look at the point C. At point C, rather than two and a half liter, now it is pumping three liter. There is some advantage. There is some <coughs> advantage due to these compensatory mechanisms. But now heart is operating at? higher end diastolic volume. Heart is operating at higher end diastolic volume, <coughs> right? And compensatory mechanisms are operating. For a while, this is good. There is a slight increase in cardiac output. But in the long run, it is very, very bad. Why it is bad? Yes, Ahmad, can you tell me? It is bad. <coughs> Okay, this is one reason. What other? In the long run, the most important thing which happened, look, pulmonary congestion is here as well as there. Yeah, it's more severe because fluid is retained. This is one thing. I'm asking why this all thing, if it remains like this and heart keep on operating under strong neurohumoral compensatory mechanism, why it is bad for myocardium? Because heart will undergo progressive failure. Now I will tell you why. The reason being, that walls of the myocardium are under normal stresses or abnormal stresses? Walls of the myocardium are under normal stresses when they are operating here or abnormal stresses? Abnormal. The abnormal stresses. They are receiving too much fluid, they are unable to, and yeah, they are receiving too much fluid and they are pumping very less. 
this is, this is a very bad thing, right? And this uh, chronic abnormal stress alters the expression of the genes of the myocardial cells. Myocardial cells, genomic expression alters under chronic stress. This is a very important point to understand. And these cells start uh, decreasing their myosin production. They start producing extracellular matrix more and heart eventually become more, uh, the myocardium will convert into poor quality myocardium. This is extremely important because these days they say we must do something not only for a uh, for short term increase, uh, you know, uh, not to be happy with short term benefits of these things, the very long term bad things due to these neurohumoral compensatory mechanism. What are the bad things? What are the real disadvantages? That if these neurohumoral compensatory mechanism operate for longer time, they increase too much stress on the wall of the myocardium and under chronic stress genomic expression changes and myocardium uh, expresses less you can say effective contractile proteins it expresses uh, excessive amount of myocardial cell make extracellular matrix which is not good for the heart and we say due to neurohumoral chronic activation myocardium will become a very very poor type of myocardium is that right this is the bad thing. This is the price you pay for. Neurohumoral compensatory mechanism. Write it down one classical sentence. That sympathetic nervous system and renin angiotensin aldosterone system. They are neurohumoral compensatory mechanism which are good in the initial stages of cardiac failure. Cardiac failure. But in the long run, they have a deleterious effect on the myocardium. That is why, you know, these days, the doctors are very much uh, concerned that they should give angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors in cardiac failure. They are giving the patients uh, with the, you can say, beta blockers. So that stress on the walls should be reduced. Another problem which occurs that at this point, Laplace's law is not in the favor of the patient. You know what is Laplace's law? Laplace's law states that pressure, pressure generated by a cylindrical container is directly proportional to the tensions in the wall when myocardium contract when sarcomeres contract they produce tension in the wall and it is pressure generated is inversely proportional to the radius now look at it this law is very important when you understand the cardiac failure and the action of the drugs in a failing heart you know pressure is required for the cardiac output if there is no pressure generated in the lumen, there cannot be any cardiac output. So we need pressure building in the lumen to get the cardiac output. But to build the pressure in the lumen, we need good tension in the wall. So tension in the wall, acting on the radius, right, eventually produces pressure. Now look, what is happening? Very bad thing. That as heart, from here it was a smart heart, right, as heart is failing, Neurohumoral mechanisms are retaining salt and water and increasing the venous return and end diastolic volume is increasing. So what is happening to radius? Increase. So what is happening when heart is moving from this point to this, from B point, heart shift to the C point, during this process, it is progressively increasing its radius. It is progressively increasing its radius. Low right. So with the given tension, no, the word we should use, with the given tension, the myocardial power to produce tension at point B and C, if tension power is the same, increasing radius decreases the pressure. So do you think it's good for heart or bad? Very, Very bad. So actually, what really happens, neurohumoral mechanisms are good initially, but progressively they lead to dilated heart. And dilated heart has a bigger radius. And when it has a bigger radius, larger radius, with the given tension which myocardium can produce, failing myocardium can produce, it is producing lesser pressures. Right at the top, you are producing arteriolo-constriction. So it's a big trouble. Now heart is here. Now we see what happened with digitalis. You give the digitalis, you digitalize your patient, right? When digit you know that digitalis will eventually, we have discussed into detail how it will load the myocardial cell with calcium and how troponin tropomyosin will be 
acting and how actin myosin interaction will start and heart contractility will increase now here we give digitalis at point c what we have introduced digoxin once the person is properly digitalized for a given now listen for a given end diastolic volume for example now it is 240 ml patient has end diastolic volume of 240 ml and then you digitalize it was a dilated heart as cardiac output will now under the influence of digitalis will decrease or increase increase so it means after the digitalization for a given end diastolic volume cardiac output should go up now look at this is what is happening so patient will shift from point c to point d right for every given end diastolic volume cardiac output will increase so it means this will be the curve okay we can make the d up to here this is what average doctor will tell you but you have to learn more than this that how digitalis will bring further changes this is what everyone can understand you digitalize the patient this positive inotropic action and from point c it will shift to the point d but the true story goes beyond it mm -hmm. what is the true story look at 240 ml of end diastolic volume heart is pumping more efficiently heart is able to produce less tension or more tension so digitalis put the digoxin here digoxin has increased the power tension in the wall now when tension will increase in the wall pressure will be increase when pressure will be increased ejection cardiac output will increase then ejection fraction will increase now look here heart will contract more strongly so it will throw more stroke volume out and if heart is throwing more stroke volume out after the digitalization if heart starting uh, throwing more stroke volume out so what will happen that end diastolic volume will start reducing heart will become more dilated or less dilated less dilated so look at the beauty that mechanism will start moving backward now i will tell you how this beautiful thing happens and somewhere heart adjust here at this point now look look this is the star point now the truly what digitalis did the direct action of digitalis was that due to positive inotropy it took the dynamics from point c to d is it clear but due to this increase contractility and increase cardiac output other deleterious effects or bad effects will be reduced how listen first of all when cardiac output will increase renal perfusion will increase when renal perfusion is increased renin angiotensin aldosterone axis start relaxing when it start relaxing salt and water retention become less when salt and water retention become less it means because it is less aldosterone na, salt and water start washing out so when salt and water is less in the body then blood volume is less then venous return is less and when venous return is less then end diastolic volume is less so at d point what really happened you can write here that increase renal perfusion relaxation of renin angiotensin aldosterone excess less salt and salt and water retention less venous return dynamics move backward number 1 number 2 of course when cardiac output will increase then baroreceptor receptor stimulation for sympathetic nervous system is decreased so sympathetic nervous system also relaxes renin angiotensin aldosterone system also relaxes so compensatory mechanisms are relaxing now it's very easy to understand when sympathetic nervous system will relax veno constriction will be less when angiotensin 2 is relaxed reduced then our veno constriction is also less so reduced sympathetic outflow after increasing the cardiac output at point d the reduced there's reduction in sympathetic outflow there's reduction in angiotensin 2 level both things reduce the veno what constriction veins dilate and veins dilate my friend veins will accommodate more blood so venous return is reduced when venous return is reduced to the heart cardiac filling is reduced 
when cardiac filling is reduced, now there are three mechanisms you should explain that at point D, cardiac filling will start reducing. One reason that at D point, uh, salt and water retention is less and venous cardiac filling is less. Number two, venodilatation is there, right, due to sympathetic relaxation and angiotensin II relaxation. So less venous return. Now look at the beauty. When less venous return is there, radius is reducing and when radius is decreasing it's a good news or bad news it's excellent news we want the pressure generation and now digitalis direct look now digitalis directly increases the tension and indirectly by relaxing the neurohumoral mechanism it decreases the radius and when radius will decrease increasing tension and decreasing radiation uh, sorry radius not radiation radius the pressure generation will be less or more increased. increased. Is that right? That is a secondary effect it produces. The story is not yet over. The very important point, the most wonderful point, that sympathetic nervous system when it goes down and angiotensin goes down, arterioles relax. And when arterioles relax, the pressure required, pressure required to maintain the cardiac output is more or less. Listen, if arterioles relax. Now heart is beating against more resistance or less resistance? Less, less. less resistance. So it has to generate more. less pressures. So now the whole dynamics are changed in Laplace's law. Pressure, tension over radius. Now go step by step. When you digitalize the patient, first tension went up. Look at, you have to talk about all these three things. The tension went up. When tension went up, cardiac output became more. Right, it was able to produce more pressure. So the result was here, there was more pressure. When pressure generated were more, cardiac output was more, sympathetic nervous system started relaxing, renin angiotensin system started relaxing. So sodium load in the body is reduced and venodilatation is there. So blood volume is reduced and venous pooling is more, venous return is less, so radius is reduced. Right, when radius is reduced, now, Increasing tension, reducing the radius, produces very efficient what pressure. This was pressure was this was increase in pressure due to increased tension. This is increase in pressure due to reduced radius. So dilated heart turn back to smarter heart. A smart heart is more efficient heart. Is that right? Now look at it. Now pressures you are generating more, but the pressures are required to overcome the resistance against the blood flow in the arterial tree. The pressures were required for what purpose? So that you can th maintain cardiac output to the peripheral tissue. That was the purpose, no? But when sympathetic nervous system went down, when angiotensin II went down, even arterioles relax. So with this pressure, blood flow will be really very good and cardiac output will be maintained excellently. So what really happens? Now here, where it was originally 140 ml, it went to 240 ml, now it is about, for example, 180 ml. Now at the end diastolic volume of 180 ml, let's suppose it is maintaining 4 liter. Dynamics close are not to, normal, normal, but close to normal with less, you can say, retention salt. of salt and water. Basically all these phenomena is occurring and then it's the digitality reversing it. Yeah, first, the, look, look at it. This was a healthy heart, attention, this is a healthy heart. First cardiac output dropped, then end diastolic volume progressively increased. Then it took the cardiac output up and reduced the end diastolic volume. Is that right? This is the how digitalis alters your hemodynamic pattern, uh, parameters of cardiovascular system. Am I clear? At this stage, when heart is operating at B stage, we say there is cardiac failure but uncompensated. This is cardiac failure uncompensated. But here, when neurohumoral mechanisms are activated, it is still failing at point C, but it is compensated failure. So this is say that there is at point C, there is compensated, compensated cardiac failure. Is that right? So this is what we have integrated. Now if there is any MCQ like this, you can handle with. But right there number C, so all the sympathetic activity is going on. Yeah, this is very high sympathetic activity and there is a high renin angiotensin aldosterone activity. It is good for a while, it is very bad in the long run. 
Why it is very bad? Because with this uh, sympathetic activity, there is strong tension on the stress on the walls. Then too much fluid retained and dilated heart, strong stresses on the wall. Then angiotensin 2 and sympathetic nervous system constricting the arterioles, feeling heart, already donkey is tired. At the top you are forcing it to go against resistance. Is that right? So th this thing has done initially beneficial by increasing diastolic volume. But bad thing, all these things increase the stress on myocardium. And if failing heart, myocardium keep on working under high stress, it becomes progressively failing mechanism. Is that right? So this is what we have achieved with this thing. Now something interesting. In cardiac failure, some uh, initially we use diuretics and we use angiotensin converting enzyme. Let me tell you, integrate those drugs action on the same, what is this, graph. Let's suppose, your heart is operating here and you are a patient with heart failure and your doctor does not give you digitalis. He says, let me try first diuretics. It's not going to work. No, it is going to work. Let's see how. Why to go up and come down? Why don't you move like this? I will tell you exactly how it happened. For example, you, I, I give my patient with a cardiac failure angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor like captopril or enalapril. Right now we are giving the drugs. Renin angiotensin aldosterone excess system. I need to be needed to relax. Is that right? Or we can say simply the drugs which I am giving. I am not trying. You are at patient is operating at this point. But this time I am not going to give digoxin. This was action of digoxin direct action and then indirect action. This time I am going to give angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Now listen what will happen. When you give angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, then angiotensin 2 level in the body become less or more? Less. And aldosterone level become? Less. So what really happens when you give this drug and of course with that I have to give diuretics. Right? So we are reducing the aldo. We are reducing the angiotensin 2 and with diuretic we are reducing salt and water load. Now you imagine. These two drugs were introduced at this point. What will happen when salt and water is less? When salt and water is less, it should move in this direction. Is that right? And when angiotensin 2 is less, veins will dilate. It will still move in this direction. Is that right? It means that when we are giving this drug, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and diuretic, actually we are reducing, diuretic reduce the total blood volume. volume. And when total blood volume is there, that will lead to what? Now Laplace is law with the new drugs. We give diuretic. Total salt and water is reduced. So total venous return is reduced. And what will happen? Radius of the heart will reduced. So this is the advantage of diuretics. Now we look at the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor effect on the Laplace's law and effect on the graph. The angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor number one reduce aldo. Again aldosterone is reduced so salt and water is reduced. So radius is further reduced and both these things will move it towards backward. This is one thing. Secondly, when angiotensin 2 is reduced then we know constriction is reduced, veins dilate. When veins dilate, less venous return going. Again, radius is reduced. You get it? Again, radius is reduced. It means that if progressively radius is reducing with the given tension, press pressure generated are more. Are you understanding? Because we are reducing the radius of the heart, so with the same contractility, we have not given any positive inotropic agent. We have not given any positive inotropic agent. So with the same failing tension, when we reduce the radius, heart start producing better pressures. When it does better pressure, so it start increasing cardiac output. So it means that it, this will not truly move like this. Actually, it will initially move like this. Is that right? It's moving like this. Am I clear? Then something will happen. What is that? That when when cardiac output uh, pressures are more, cardiac output is more, sympathetic nervous system will relax. Arterial constriction will relax. Angiotensin 2 is less, or that will also further relax the arterial constriction. So when most of the arteries will relax, what will happen? 
the resistance against which heart has to pump is less. So at given end diastolic volume, at given end diastolic volume, heart will produce more ejection or less ejection if arterioles are relaxed. Less ejection, sir. Listen, again. No, let me repeat it. You people are set. Again, concentrate. We gave diuretics and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. They reduce the blood volume, reduce the radius of the heart. They uh, relax the veins, right? So again, cardiac filling was less, radius was less. Is that right? So when radius was less for a given tension, it could produce more pressure. If it was producing more pressure, if it was producing more pressure than cardiac output is more. When cardiac output is more, that further reduces the intrinsic, uh, you can say sympathetic outflow. Sympathetic outflow was high due to low cardiac output. When cardiac output will go up, sympathetic system will relax. Yeah. Now, arterioles will relax. When arterioles will relax, when arterioles will relax, relax will now the same pressure will produce more cardiac output. And at the same end diastolic volume, cardiac output will be more and it will jump like this. Will jump like this. We reach to the same point. Now the clinical saying is that when a patient comes with heart failure, first use these drugs. And if, if they are not enough, still patient develop symptoms, then you come for digoxin. You know why? The reason being, digoxin has a lot of toxicity. These drugs are not so toxic. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and diuretics are less toxic drugs. Digitalis has high risk of toxicity. This is one reason that due to concern about the safety of the drugs, rather than going through this route, rather than going from route number C to D, then to star point, it's better to come from C to, let's suppose E, and then to the star point. The safer route. The route, look, you can reach at star performance of the heart through this unsafe route or you can come through safe route. Am I clear? And actually, another beauty, that truly this route goes very fast when you use angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor than diuretic. Truly this route goes like this. Because as soon as end diastolic volume is reducing, pressures are increasing and cardiac output is increasing. So for explanatory purpose, you can say that Vector backward, then vector upward. But the net vector is upward and backward. So this is a combination of use of diuretics and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Is that right? These are the safer drugs, number one. Number two, the long term survival is increased in patients who are on diuretics and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. The reason being that these drugs reduce that tension on the wall. You know, aldosterone level when they are high, now they have discovered a new thing. Average doctor knows that aldosterone work on kidney, but excellent doctor knows aldosterone at high concentration dis disturb the genetic expression of myocardium. Now they know, every doctor knows that angiotensin 2 work on veins, angiotensin 2 work on arteries, angiotensin releases aldosterone, Right, angiotensin produces thirst, angiotensin work on kidney somewhere directly, but excellent doctor knows that if chronically high angiotensin 2 is there, it will disturb the myocardial genetic expression. That is, yeah, so neurohumoral compensatory mechanisms are bad in the long run for the heart, right, because high aldosterone and high, look, there are two things. Number one, they produce the tension on the wall, it stresses on the wall, they were bad. Number two, at this point, elevated level of ALDO and elevated level of angiotensin 2, they disturb the myocardial cells genetic expression. So these days they say that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and diuretic, right, they are excellent that not only they correct the hemodynamic, they reduce the ALDO level and reduce the angiotensin 2 level and reduce the pathological remodeling going in the myocardium. Is that clear? So what is the principle? When a patient comes with heart failure, it's better to give first ACE inhibitors, diuretics and some in some situations beta blocker. If all of them don't work well, then you go for digitalis. Why digitalis is left at the end? Because a good drug, but 
with lot of bad side effects. Now we shall be discussing about the clinical uses of digoxin. Again, it's worth reminding that digoxin is not the first line drug for cardiac failure. Right? Why? Even though it's a good drug as far as inotropic action is concerned, but it has a lot of side effects which we will be discussing shortly. Because this drug has a lot of side effects and it has a very narrow therapeutic window, due to that reason this drug is not considered first line drug in case of ventricular failure. Right? It is used only when you have used other less toxic drugs and those drugs fail. For example, you should use diuretics for cardiac failure. With that, you should also use indutensin converting enzyme inhibitors as well as in some situations beta blockers. Right? These drugs, diuretics, indutensin converting enzyme inhibitors and beta blockers, they are less toxic as compared to digitalis. Number two, because these drugs, diuretics, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, these drugs uh, you can say reverse the neurohumoral compensatory mechanisms. Because they inhibit the neurohumoral compensatory mechanism, so they reduce the long term pathological remodeling going on in the myocardium. And due to that reason, not only these drugs reduce the symptoms, they also increase long term survival. So they have an advantage because such drugs increase the long term survival. When, when, but when we talk about the digoxin, digoxin is very effective in reducing the symptoms of left systolic left ventricular failure. But along with that, it produces a lot of side effects. It increases the risk of tachyarrhythmias, it increases the risk of myocardial infarction due to such toxic effects. Uh, long term survival is not increased by use of digitalis. Digitalis is specially used in the patients with left ventricular systolic failure systolic failure and this left ventricular systolic failure uh, at advanced stage right intractable left ventricular systolic dysfunction remember this is not useful in patient with right ventricular failure and it is not used for the patient with diastolic with diastolic failure Right, so in these two situations, digoxin is not used. Write it down and put a cross on it so that you remember. The right ventricular failure, isolated right ventricular failure, this is not very effective. In case of diastolic failure, again, this drug is not effective. This drug is meant, rather all positive anotropic drugs are meant for the patient who have severe intractable systolic dysfunction. So this was one use, that this drug is used in Severe intractable left ventricular systolic failure. But there is another use. There is one more use. Second use is the patient who have heart failure with atrial fibrillation. I will explain why in that particular situation it is very useful. Right? That is second group is that patient who are having heart failure, heart failure with plus they are having atrial fibrillation, they are having atrial fibrillation, right? Now question is that what is very special about this thing where digoxin is really considered very useful? Let me explain it, right? Now, what we can say that let's suppose you just just to explain this is your heart now here is SA node I'm going to explain why digoxin is excellent drug in a patient who has heart failure with atrial fibrillation right here is SN node and this is the electrical window between the atria and ventricle that is the AV node along with bundle of his and bundle branches right 
Now, when we say someone has, let's first concentrate on atrial fibrillation. If I say someone has chronic atrial fibrillation, what is happening in atrial fibrillation? In atrial fibrillation, the electrical activity in atria is more than 350 per minute. Remember, this is not the mechanical activity, this is the electrical activity. The electrical activity in the atria is right when we say there is atrial fibrillation it means electrical activity in the atrium is more than uh, 350 per minute in such fibrillating atrium there are multiple electrical currents right patient has multiple depolarizing current which are simultaneously trying to stimulate the atrium and what you really see that the multiple electrical vectors which are present in the atrium and these multiple electrical vectors are hitting the AV node at irregular interval, at a very frequent and irregular interval. In atrial fibrillation, there is too much electrical activity in the atria and electrical impulses right from the atrium are hitting the AV node at very high frequency and at irregular intervals. Now, the major concern here is, look, the major concern here is that all this increased electrical activity from the atrium should not pass to the ventricle because if most of these electrical impulses through the AV node pass to the ventricle, they will precipitate ventricular tachyarrhythmia, a nightmare. Again, atrial tachyarrhythmia is not dangerous. Why? Because the real cardiac output is maintained by ventricles. Cardiac output is maintained by the ventricles. Ventricles are the real pumps. Atria are the primer pump. Atria just play a role in filling the ventricle only 20%. What is the role of atrium? The at that, listen, they are just acting as a primer pump. Ventricular 80% filling is passive. Atrial contraction contribute only 20% of ventricular filling. If a patient is having atrial fibrillation, then electrical activity in the atrium is so fast, the mechanical activity cannot catch up. So, fibrillating atria, even though electrically very fast, becomes a mechanical failure. So, fibrillating atria don't pump. Is that right? But still, cardiac output is maintained well due to which activity? ventricular activity. Now, if lot of electrical impulses from the AV node pass to the failing heart or ventricles, then ventricle will develop tachyarrhythmia and you know if ventricular uh, electrical activity goes beyond a certain point, then ventricles also fail as a mechanical pumps. Is that right? So, the first line line of management should be that we should terminate the atrial fibrillation. But if we cannot terminate the atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation are resistant, they are refracted, refractory, they are persistent, then we are left with only with one choice, that we inhibit the AV node, so that lower story should be protected from upper story electrical dysfunction. Again, the only choice we are left with is that we should give some drug which can inhibit the AV node. So out of 400, 400 impulses, 350 plus impulses or out of 400 impulses, only maybe 70 or 80 impulses should go down. So that ventricular response rate should be under control. So that atrial fibrillation does not precipitate ventricular tachyarrhythmia, right? So if some patient has left ventricular failure, with that he is having atrial fibrillation. Digoxin makes a wonderful drug. Why? Because already you know that digoxin loads the myocardial cell with calcium, so it increases systolic contraction, so it is good for failure. Right? Secondly, you know that digoxin, right, it stimulates vagus also. When it stimulates the vagus, vagus actually, the, when vagal tone to AV node is increased, when vagal tone, vagus stimulates, you know, digoxin increases the vagal input to SA node and AV node both, right? And when AV node is under digoxin-induced stronger 
vagal stimulation, vagus inhibits the IV node. So, until patient is digitalized, vagus is overstimulated, it is inhibiting the AV node and it does not allow the AV node to take too much impulses from the atrium to the ventricle. So, right? Vagal stimulation will inhibit the AV node. Yeah. So, what we learn now, digoxin has primarily two function. It is a positive inotropic drug as well as this is vagotonic drug. And this special combination of use Right, this combination of action of the digitalis or digoxin can be used very successfully in the patient who has heart failure along with atrial fibrillation. So, heart failure will be managed by positive anotropic action of the drug and uh, atrial fibrillation, if it cannot be corrected, then vagus is of course stimulating the vagus so that AV node should be inhibited through the vagal action and if AV node is kept inhibited constantly, then even if atrial fibrillating, there are very few impulses going down and ventricular response rate is under control and the risk of that atrial tachyarrhythmia will precipitate ventricular tachyarrhythmia is reduced. This risk is reduced. Am I clear? Right? No confusion? Right. Then another situation which is very interesting. Uh, you know that when you are digitalizing the patient, attention please, when you are digitalizing the patient, you are loading the even atrial cell with the calcium. Not only myocardial cells are loaded with calcium, uh, myocardial ventricular cells are loaded with calcium, but atrial, <coughs> but atrial myocardial cells are also loaded with extra calcium. And this extra calcium which is loaded over here, right, that irritate electrically the atrium. So, sometimes a very strange situation occur that patient who come with atrial flutter plus patient has ventricular tachycardia, right? If you give him digitalis or digoxin, then atrial flutter may convert into, because atria is irritated, so it may convert into atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter is electrical activity around 250 to 350 minutes. Again, atrial flutter is when electrical activity in the atrium is somewhere between 250 to 350 per minute. And atrial fibrillation is that electrical activity in the atrium is more than 350 per minute. Is it clear? Now, there is very interesting situation. When you give digoxin, atrial flutter may convert into atrial fibrillation, but but ventricular tachycardia may be reduced. Response rate, response rate in ventricle is reduced. So, if patient was having atrial flutter after digitalization may convert into atrial fibrillation. Apparently, it looks bad. But at the same time, digoxin inhibits the AV node due to that reason, a ventricular tachycardia, let's suppose it was 180 beats per minute, right? It becomes only 80 beats per minute. So, this is one of the very classical situation in which patient come with atrial fibrillation with ventricular tachycardia, right? You give, you digitalize the patient and then what happens that atrial flutter may convert into fibrillation right apparently it looks as if patient is deteriorating but actually the real aim of therapy is not at the atrial therapy is aiming at controlling the ventricular response rate right so by by inhibiting the av node digoxin inhibits the uh, impulses going from the atria to the ventricle right so what we see look here here atrial flutter was leading to ventricular tachycardia after the drug it it has gone to atrial fibrillation, but there is no ventricular tachycardia, rather ventricular rate is controlled. Am I clear? Response rate in ventricles. The response of the ventricle to the uh, electrical impulses coming through the AV node, right? Now we come to the adverse effects of digoxin. What are the side effects of digoxin? Already you know that digoxin has two mechanisms, it is worth repeating again and again. It loads the myocardial cells with calcium, so it has a tendency to overstimulate the electrical activity in the atrium and ventricles. 
but at the same time it stimulates the vagal output due to that reason it slows down the acenoidal electrical activity and inhibits the electrical activity in the AV node. Digitalis toxicity or side effects right adverse effects or side effects of digoxin. Now this topic is very important. The reason being if some a patient develops digitalis toxicity, it is potentially a fatal complication. And with proper management, you can save the life of the patient. Right. When we talk about side effects of digoxin, uh, number one, side effects may occur in the GIT. Right. As you know, it stimulates the vagus, it produces autonomic upsets, right? So autonomic supply to GIT is also irritated and it may produce anorexia nausea and vomiting right this drug may produce anorexia nausea and vomiting again no need to remember it most of the drug do that the second is the most important problem this side effect everyone there are so many drugs which do but second side effect is the most important these are cardiac side effects right cardiac side effects now let me draw a heart here and let me tell you what are the cardiac side effects. Now what are the cardiac side effects? Again, basically on SA node it acts as inhibitor. You know by, by vagal stimulation SA node is inhibited. And again, by vagal stimulation, it acts as inhibitor to the AV node as well, right? These two actions are due to vago, increased vagal activity, right? But because it loads the myocardial cell with the calcium, due to that reason, it uh, stimulates, stimulates atria, atrial myocardium as well as it stimulate ventricular myocardium. Of course, this stimulation is mechanical as well as electrical. This mechanical stimulation is useful for us. This mechanical stimulation, right? Myocardium will contract more strongly. And there is also electrical stimulation because when myocardial cells are loaded with the, yes please, Calcium, the resting membrane potential, when these cells are loaded with cations or calcium, the resting membrane potential become more near to threshold. And sometimes resting membrane potential touches the threshold and myocardial cell develop abnormal automaticity. They develop an increased tendency for abnormal automaticity. So in the atria and ventricle, abnormal electrical impulses start or ectopic foci start and these ectopic foci start in the atrium and ventricle, right? These ectopic foci we start in the atrium and the ventricle, they may produce atrial tachyarrhythmias, right? Now listen, that they can produce atrial tachyarrhythmias, atrial tachycardias, rather atrial premature beats, right? Atrial tachycardias, atrial flutter, and even flutter may convert into atrial fibrillation. So this is progressively getting more worse because if few atrial myocardial cell occasionally fire, this is atrial premature beat. If they start regularly firing fast, then we say there's atrial tachycardia. But if firing rate is more than 250, between 250 to 350, then we say there's atrial flutter. Is that right? Then we say there is atrial flutter. And if a, a rate becomes, electrical stimulation become more than 350 per minute, then we call it atrial fibrillation. In the same way, when ventricles are electrically stimulated, patient may develop increased ventricular premature beats. For example, there's an ectopic foci, right, overloaded with calcium and occasionally firing ventricular premature beat. Or if it is regularly firing fastly, this ectopic foci, this may lead to ventricular, yes, tachycardia. That may lead to ventricular 
tachycardia and stimulation electrical stimulation become faster and somewhere between 250 to 350 per minute then we say there's onset of ventricular flutter but if do if there are multiple ectopic foci and all of them are firing simultaneously and there are 100 more than 350 electrical impulses in the ventricle per minute then we say there's onset of ventricular fibrillation which can be fatal onset of ventricular fibrillation which can be fatal is that right now at the same time if there is too much effect on SA node right then it may produce sinus bradycardia bradycardia because SA node is inhibited or if it's too much inhibited it may produce sinus arrest that there's no SA nodal activity SA node failed to fire in the same way when there is too much AV nodal inhibition, what will happen? It may lead, lead to nodal blocks, nodal blocks, because current from AV node is not going down appropriately. You know, normally current from the atria go to the ventricle through a normal AV nodal delay. Normal AV nodal delay is about 0.1 second. But when AV node is inhibited by increased digoxin-mediated vagal activity, right then inhibited AV node may pass less current from atria to the ventricle it may produce heart blocks nodal blocks or other name for the same situation is yes heart blocks or another name for the same situation is junctional block junctional blocks so we can say that digitalis by increasing the vagal activity on the AV node can produce nodal blocks or hard blocks or junctional blocks. Now, in this particular case, one point which, you, which we need to understand is that if every impulse from, listen, if every impulse from the atrium goes to the ventricle, if every impulse from the atrium is going to the ventricle but with undue delay, but with undue delay, right? Because the situation is called first degree hard block. So what is first degree heart block? When every impulse from the atrium is going to the ventricle but with undue delay. For example, normally impulse which is coming from atria and going to the ventricle should be held at AV node only for 0.1 second. But if every impulse which is going from atrium to the ventricle, if it is held here for 0.2 second but always released, then it means this is first degree heart block. So when digital toxicity start, first initially, uh, first degree heart block will start. After that what will happen? That some impulses will be allowed to go down from atria to ventricle and other impulses may be totally blocked and not allowed to go from atria to the ventricle. It means block has increased. Right? For example, out of 100 impulses, 30 impulses or 50 impulses go down and 50 do not transmit through AV node. Right? So it means now block is increased and some of the atrial impulses are conducted through, through the ventricle and other uh, other atrial impulses could not pass through the inhibited AV node, right? So this is called, yes, second degree heart block. So what is the difference in first degree and second degree heart block? In first degree, every impulse from atria passes through the AV node and goes to the ventricle. But every impulse is, most of the impulses are unduly delayed, right? But in case of second degree heart block, some of the impulses will reach from, uh, from atria to the ventricle through the AV node and other impulses will be aborted or other impulses will be failed to pass through the AV node. Then if uh, more toxicity develop, AV node become too much inhibited, then none of the atrial impulses will be going down. If none of the atrial impulses go down to the ventricle, this is called, yes please, third degree heart block. In patient with a third degree heart block, we will usually we need artificial pacing of the heart, right? We need the pacing of the P-A-C-I-N-G, pacing of the heart. Now, by all this discussion, what you really see that the positive point was that it was increasing the mechanical activity of atrium as well as increasing the mechanical activity of ventricle. These were the two positive things. But overstimulation of atrium and ventricular thing, right, that lead to tendency of atrial tachyarrhythmia and ventricular tachyarrhythmia. 
right? So atrial tachyarrhythmia and ventricular tachyarrhythmia are direct action of digitalis by loading these cells with the cations. But there is also a tendency for sinus bradycardias as well as nodal bradycardias. In case of sinus bradycardias and nodal bradycardia, why it is there? This is indirect action of digitalis or digoxin by stimulating the vagus, vagus, vagus which inhibits that, right? So these, this is then third type of side effects are in the central nervous system. Even though the major action of this drug is in the major action of this drug is on the heart, but Digitalis also disturb the electrical activity in the central nervous system. And when electrical activity in the central nervous system is disturbed, that may produce central nervous system side effects. For example, it may produce fatigue, right? It may produce fatigue, it may produce headache, right? Confusion. Delirium, okay, let's clear these terms. What is meant by confusion? What is meant patient by confusion? Know where they are. Yeah, where patient is disoriented in time, place and person. Patient is disoriented who they are, who are the people around them, where they are, uh, what is the time, what is the day, right? So patient is confused or we say that the patient is disoriented in time, place, and person. And what is delirium? What is delirium? Yes, Victor? Delirium is a trust to... What is delirium? When the people feel uh, a panic. No, no, no. Panic is not delirium. Yes, Jamie? What is delirium? It is transient acute confusional state with hyper excitability. Write it down. Someone is acutely confused with hyper excitability. Then we say he is delirious. Yes. No, yeah, they are more confused. And they are acutely confused. And with that they are hyperactive. Right? For example, if a person is delirious, he look at you and he feel you are a very big loin coming to him and he jumps away from the bed and run away. Right? It means he is delirious. He, because he was confused, he could not, could not perceive you well. Right? Even the doctors may be perceived as angels in confusion or they may be perceived as uh, something very dangerous and uh, patient may run away from the bed or even from the operation table when he is delirious. Or uh, once I have seen a patient who was delirious that he put a big slap on the person who was doing physical examination of the patient because he thought that maybe doctor is exploring something inappropriate in an inappropriate way, right? So patient was confused, so he really had a chance to misbehave, right? Sure. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, if uh, one person has a delirium, can we feel the panic? Uh, look, a panic is a medical term uh, which is used for very severe acute anxiety. Panic is a medical term which is uh, used for very severe acute anxiety. But during the panic, patient is well oriented in time, place and person. In delirium, patient is not aware what is the time, what is the place, what are the persons around. Right? He is misperceiving everything. With that, he is severely acutely confused and he is hyperactive. Some patients are acutely confused and they are drowsy. They are not going to beat you. But if there is a patient who is severely confused, and hyperactive and he perceived Victor as a big cat, then either he will run away or he will jump on you, depend on his cat lover or not. Is that right? So what I'm saying, the delirious patients are acutely confused, hyper excitable, hyperactive patients. Right? Then another thing is that these patients may develop blurred vision. Blurred vision. This is this blurred vision may be due to autonomic disturbance to the ciliaris and with the blurred VN, some patient may develop even yellow VN. Yellow VN, that they think that every color shade has some yellow shade, right? And even sometimes, some patient under the digitalis toxic, uh, toxicity, they may perceive things are too small, we call it micropsia, or they think 
if they perceive the things which are too big than their original size, we call it macropsia, right? So what really happens is that sometimes some of the patient micropsia or macropsia, macropsia, right? Macropsia, for example, you are six feet tall, but if patient is having macropsia, he may feel you are only four feet tall. Or if he has a macropsia, he may feel that you are nine feet tall. Is that right? So these are, again, distortions in the processing of visual information in central nervous system. Is that right? So these were the side effects. But discussion of side effects of digitalis should never be completed until you don't know that under what circumstances patient has high chance to develop toxicity and how to treat and prevent toxicity and how to treat toxicity, now, right? So now I will talk about the circumstances which act as a predisposing situation for digitalis toxicity. As I told you that digitalis has a very, very narrow, you can say therapeutic window and the difference between the therapeutic dose, uh, therapeutic concentration in the blood and the toxic concentration in blood is very less because therapeutic concentration and the toxic concentration are very near. So if you don't manage these patients carefully, they tend to go under toxicity and again toxicity is having risk of death due to these ventricular tachyarrhythmias. Is that right? Now, we will learn that why some people have more chance to develop digitalis toxicity and how we can prevent that. And if toxicity develops, how to manage it. Manage it. Right? So now we shall talk about you know, what are the conditions in which, which act as predisposers for digitalis toxicity. The most important, single most important point if you have to remember is the potassium level in the blood. Let me explain how. You remember in the beginning I told you that if this is myocardial cell and this is sodium potassium, ATPase. Is that right? And I told you that digitalis will bind here and do its action. Digoxin. Digoxin will bind on the sodium potassium ATPases and you can imagine uh, just for remembering purposes that potassium and digitalis compete at the sodium potassium ATPases. It's one of the very easy way to remember that Potassium and digitalis are in competition. Digitalis means digoxin, right here. So they are in competition to bind with it. Now due to any reason, if patient develop hypokalemia, if your potassium levels go down, what will happen? Digoxin has less chance to work or more chance to work? More chance to work. Yeah, and if digoxin is working more, it will overload with cell with pathological amount of calcium and that may precipitate uh, dangerous arrhythmias. Is that clear? It's so easy to understand that potassium levels are extremely important in these patients because patients who are in heart failure, if their potassium level is fluctuating too much, you cannot digitalize the patient in a uh, stable way because if due to some reason they develop hypokalemia, then with the same concentration of digoxin in the blood, there will be extra action of digoxin. For example, if my uh, potassium level is 5 milli, what is the normal potassium level? Normal potassium level is between 3.5 to 5.5 milli equivalents per liter and you must know all of you, right? as you know your own names because a little fluctuation in potassium level can be fatal for the patient, right? What is the normal potassium level? It is somewhere between 3.5 to 5.5 milli equivalents per liter. Now let's suppose if my, attention please, if my potassium level is 5 milli equivalents per liter and you digitalize me and then my blood concentration of the drug is okay and you get the desired action. But after three weeks, due to some reason, if my potassium levels go up, the same therapeutic dose and therapeutic concentration of the drug may convert into toxic concentration. Because when potassium will go down in my blood, then digitalis has extra chance to work on these sodium potassium ATPases, load these cells with extra amount of calcium and too much calcium, uh, you know that it electrically irritates these cells 
and there's a higher risk of tachy arrhythmias. So the question is this, that why, uh, why the question uh, potassium level will fall? Answer is most patient who are uh, heart failure patient, they are already under the yeah, diuretic. So whenever you digitalize the patient, the chances are patient is already on diuretics. And if you really know loop diuretics and thiazides, they are potassium wasters. Do you know that or not? Loop diuretics and thiazides, right? These diuretics uh, lead to kaleuresis. They lead to loss of potassium in the urine. So a patient who are on loop diuretics and thiazides, they have a tendency to develop hypokalemia and if at the same time these patients are digitalized and patient develop hypokalemia then uh, digitalis toxicity will set in. Am I clear? You are not clear. Listen, I am a patient with cardiac failure, right? My uh, uh, potassium is 5 milliequivalents per liter and you adjust the digitalis dose and get the good therapeutic action and my heart start working good, right? You are happy and I am also happy. Now, because I'm a cardiac failure patient, so I must be already on the diuretics, diuretics also. And if I'm using diuretics, there's a probability that uh, if you are not giving, if you are not taking care of my potassium level, or if you are giving me loop diuretics or thiazides, there's the tendency that I will develop hypokalemia, right? Because these are potassium wasting diuretics. And uh, when my potassium level will go down from five to, let's suppose, uh, 3 milli equivalent per liter, then the previously good concentration, previously the therapeutic concentration of digitalis will now convert into toxic concentration because potassium level has gone down and potassium is no more opposing the action of the digoxin and digoxin will work more and it will produce toxicity. Is that right? Am I clear? Yes? So you have to maintain the potassium level in order to properly Digestion. Excellent. So, Hadayat understand it eventually that we have to maintain potassium level very carefully within the normal range without much fluctuations if you really want a very good digital section. Excellent. Uh, neither potassium should be high. Yeah, should potassium should not fall down, even should not go up. Even hyperkalemia is bad, right? But hypokalemia is more dangerous. Hypokalemia. And how you can prevent hypokalemia? Hypokalemia can be prevented by giving supplemental potassium or to loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics, you can add potassium sparing diuretics. You know potassium sparing diuretic? We do not allow the potassium wastage, rather retain some potassium in the body like spirinolactone or amyloride or triamterene, right? So spirinolactone or triamterene or amyloride, these are potassium sparing diuretics. So it's very wise that when a patient has severe heart failure and you are going to digitalize the patient, it's wise that uh, with the potassium wasting diuretic, either you give supplemental, oral supplemental potassium or you combine these potassium wasting diuretics with the potassium sparing diuretics. So their potassium re level remain stable. Another ion is that which is like potassium competing with digoxin is magnesium. So magnesium level should not fall also. And magnesium is usually wasted when you have very severe vomiting. For example, if a patient start digitalis toxicity, he will develop nausea and vomiting. And if he is vomiting, he starts losing magnesium out of the body. And reducing mag magnesium also increases the toxicity of digitalis. Right? So we have to take care about the potassium level as well as we have to take care about magnesium, magnesium level. Then another important point. Are you understanding? Are you going conceptually or you are just, yeah. you are really going. Yeah. Now another thing. It is written that, it is written that even calcium level in the blood influence the toxicity. Of course, digoxin loads the calcium. And if you develop hypercalcemia, toxicity is more or less? More, yes. You are so intelligent to guess it that patients who have hypokalemia or hypercalcemia have higher chances to develop toxicity. 
right? Okay. So if you're, why? Because if you have high level of plasma calcium, then digitalis will extremely overload the cells and precipitate tachy arrhythmias. Is that right? Which may be fatal. So yes, please. What's your question? Excellent. He has a very intelligent comment. He is saying before digitalizing a patient, mm -hmm. is it good to take potassium level and calcium level and magnesium level? I don't say it's good. It is absolutely mandatory to take the potassium level. No wise doctor ever starts giving the digitalis to the patient without, the without knowing the baseline potassium level. Is that right? I told you in these lectures, I'm teaching you step one as well as step two as well as step three plus I'm making you a good doctor. And step four is coming about. Yes. Um, I think all of you love digital toxicity. Is there any special relation with you? Yes, Jamie, you have any special question? Yes. If the magnesium levels are too high, the mutation can have what? Uh, no, magnesium level usually the risk is too low. Potassium level can be high and low. Calcium level can be high and low. Usually there's hypomagnesemia and that is due to vomiting. Is that right? So when we'll manage the toxicity, vomiting will be okay and magnesium will be corrected. Now, so now you understand that what can produce toxicity? Number one, by reducing the electrolyte competition for digoxin. By reducing the magnesium and potassium. Number two, toxicity can be done digitalis mediated arrhythmias can be precipitated by helping the digoxin to load extra amount of calcium. For example, you increase the calcium in the plasma. Any person who develop hypercalcemia with a higher risk of developing digitalis toxicity. Is that right? Then of course, one more thing. Do you know some other condition which can load the myocardial cell with calcium? Why don't you tell me? Yes. Other beta-1 stimulant, beta-1 receptor stimulant. In a very After a few minutes, I will told, told, I tell you that a patient, right, patients uh, who are heart failure patients, they can be treated with dopamine or dobutamine. Last time we discussed, the heart failure patient can be treated with dopamine and dobutamine. Both of them can stimulate beta-1 adrenergic receptor and overload the cells with Calcium, you remember pathway? Uh -huh. Dopamine and dobutamine or epinephrine will stimulate beta-1 adrenergic receptor, stimulate G-stimulatory, then adenylyl cyclase, increase intracellular cyclic AMP, that will stimulate protein kinase A, and, and protein kinase A will phosphorylate the calcium channels and more calcium will be coming in. Yeah. What does it mean, whole story? It means that with digoxin, which is already loading the calcium, if other calcium loading conditions are combined, toxicity will be precipitated. So, patient who is digitalized, if he develop, you can say very severe, a sympathetic overflow, he has a chance to develop tachyarrhythmia. Or he is given other sympathomimetic drugs, which are beta-1 stimulant, like dopamine or dobutamine, he has a very high risk of developing toxicity. So, we can say, Sympathomimetic activity, sympathomimetic activities, right? Because sympathomimetic activity also loads the myocardial cells with calcium, especially if it stimulates beta-1 adrenergic receptor. We stimulate beta-1 adrenergic receptor. When they stimulate the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, like this may be endogenous epinephrine, Okay, let me write it. This may be endogenous epinephrine or norepinephrine or it may be, yes, dopamine which is used in cardiac failure, severe cardiac failure or dobutamine. Dobutamine. Right? So, these can also load, these are also calcium loaders. Right, and if somehow unfortunately they are combined with the digitalization, then naturally the risk of digitalis toxicity is very high. Can you tell me one more condition which can load the cells with cations? Please tell me myocardial ischemia. You remember that? Myocard during severe myocardial ischemia or infarction, myocardial cell membranes are disrupted. A lot of calcium and sodium may be loaded inappropriately in the injured cell. 
at the top, if patient is already digitalized, there will be onset of very, very dangerous ventricular tachyarrhythmias. Am I clear? Let me repeat it. Ischemia can load small cancer. Yeah. So, ischemia, you know, disrupts the uh, cell membranes. Right? And when cell membranes of myocardium are not working well, then they accumulate a lot of sodium and calcium. And at the top, if you are dig uh, digitalizing the patient also, then both things together put so much cation in the cells that dangerous tachyarrhythmia may be precipitated. Yes, please, Jamie. Sure, hyperthyroidism. Of course. Now, Jamie comes with a very, very wonderful idea. He says that should he digitalize the patient with hyperthyroidism? Answer is no. Because in patient with hyperthyroidism, increased T3, T4, he has a very big trouble. What is the trouble? Yes. Patient, no. Patient who have hyperthyroidism, T3, T4 go into myocardial cell and stimulate the genes of adrenergic receptors. So under the influence of increased T3 and T4, Myocardial cells express extra amount of adrenergic receptors and they are oversensitive to adrenergic drive, endogenous adrenergic drive and they are already overloaded with calcium. At the top, if you digitalize, ventricular tachyarrhythmia will start. So patient with uh, thyroid toxicity, right, or patient with thyrotoxicity is, should not be given, you can say, digitalis. So we can say for digoxin, thyrotoxicity is contraindication. Why? I can repeat it that if a patient has right high level of uh, thyroxine, circulating thyroxine, if mean patient has thyrotoxicosis, this T3, T4 can go into myocardial cell, even go into myocardial nucleus. In myocardial cells nucleus, T3, T4 bind with the receptors and those receptors overexpress the genes for adrenergic receptors. So actually, under the influence of excessive T3, T4, myocardial cells express ex extra beta-1 adrenergic receptors on their surface. So myocardial cells become sensitized to the endogenous epinephrine and norepinephrine. Is that right? With normal level of endogenous epinephrine and norepinephrine, myocardial cells, by virtue of having more receptors, are oversensitized and loaded with the calcium. Right? At the top, if you digitalize the patient, I think it's a formula to kill the patient. Is that right? Any kind of uh, cat iron hmm. increase will increase in a tachycardia. Yeah. And also uh, will a contraindication for the digital. Yes, it's you are simple, right. Simple. It's a very simple thing that anything which loads the myocardial cell with cation is contraindicated for use of digitalis. Why don't you tell me myocarditis? If someone has inflamed myocardium, if someone is suffering with acute myocarditis and heart is failing, please in this failure don't give digitalis. Because when there is myocarditis, myocardium is inflamed, then myocardial cells are again getting more, they are injured. If myocardium is inflamed, it means myocardial, for example, you develop very severe viral myocarditis or you develop very severe rheumatic fever myocarditis. Is that right? Now myocardium is severely injured and inflamed. So it is loading less cations or more cations? More cations. More cations. Should we use digitalis? Answer is no. Right? So in patient with myocarditis, a patient with rheumatic fever related myocarditis, a viral myocarditis, a patient who are having a severe uh, ischemia to the heart, a patient with thyrotoxicosis, uh, we should not use digitalis as inotropic agent. Right? Then, so what we really see, that we have to see, when you use the digitalis, remember, this drug is very dangerous. This drug is very dangerous. So you have to always look at electrolyte balance. Electrolyte balance. You need to look at concurrent illnesses. illnesses like there should not be rheumatic fever, there should not be thyrotoxic courses, there should not be any situation which can stimulate the heart and with that you must uh, look for, yes, you must look for other drugs which are contraindicated, other drugs used, other drugs used. For example, 
quinidine should not be used quinidine i will explain why quinidine is what it's like blood thinner it is uh, uh, quinidine is anti arrhythmic drug in patient with the which are digitalized quinidine should not be used amiodarone should not be used verapamil should not be used amiodarone and verapamil there are multiple reason number one these drugs can reduce the renal clearance especially quinidine so digitalis will accumulate in the body these drugs can reduce the renal clearance of the drug so drug cannot go digital digoxin cannot go out of the body through kidney and it accumulates in the body secondly these drugs can displace the digoxin with the plasma protein binding so if you give these drugs and they rapidly displace the digoxin from the plasma protein then toxin level of digoxin will be free to work on the myocardium and precipitate toxicity right and precipitate toxicity after having said all about you know that what happens in digitalis toxicity why they develop tachyarrhythmias and you know and what are the special precautions when you are using digoxin now we come to that if you come across a patient who is already having digitalis toxicity or digoxin toxicity how you are going to manage that patient now how you are going to manage that particular patient of course the very one very first step should be stop digoxin don't give any more right management of digitalis toxicity management of digitalis toxicity first of all stop digoxin and of course at the same time check the serum electrolytes check serum electrolytes especially potassium magnesium and calcium right and correct the electrolyte balance sometimes simply correcting the electrolyte balance for example if patient has severe hypokalemia and you correct the potassium level right digitalis toxicity will be under control right if there is mild toxicity then if patient has already developed severe tachyarrhythmia you can use anti arrhythmic drugs you can use anti arrhythmic drugs and drugs which are most commonly used are phenytoin drugs which are most commonly these are sodium channel blockers phenytoin or the you can use lidocaine or lidocaine this is also sodium channel blocker because if you block the sodium channels then action potentials cannot be produced voltage gated sodium channels are blocked by so you can say phenytoin and lidocaine are so voltage gated sodium channels plug they plug the or block the uh, channels so that action potentials cannot be propagated well and generated well so they reduce the generation of action potential as well as propagation of action potentials right and of course you will not use quinidine as anti arrhythmic should you use quinidine as an anti arrhythmic here no because that will displace the further digoxin and put uh, uh, produce a very big trouble right then you need to if there is very severe third degree heart block right then you need to pacing for the pacing artificial pacing pacing for third degree heart block pacing for the third degree heart block but before pacing we we'll try atropine sometimes simply given giving 0.6 mg of atropine uh, atropine you know what it is doing what is the function of atropine yeah it block the muscarinic receptors and when it block the muscarinic receptor then increase with vagal activity cannot work on s node and av node right you know vagus releases acetylcholine acetylcholine work through uh, muscarinic receptors so atropine is a muscarinic receptor anticholinergic drug muscarinic receptor blocker and when muscarinic receptors are blocked that will end up into what loss of action of vagus on the av node and s node and heart block will be 
terminated if AV node does is uh, no more under influence of acetylcholine, right? If atropine does not solve the problem, then you need to go to the patient. So and you know, look, Vegas uh, digital stimulates the Vegai, and Vegas stimula uh, uh, stimulated Vegas releases too much acetylcholine on SA node and AV node. And acetylcholine work on muscarinic receptors. And muscarinic receptor, when they are stimulated, they inhibit SA node and AV node. And if AV node is too much inhibited, cardiac block or heart block will occur. Is that right? Now, one way is that you block the muscarinic receptor so that increased vagal activity and increased acetylcholine cannot work on AV node. Is that right? To block the muscarinic receptor, the drug is atropine. Am I clear? Right? Then we can talk about immunotherapy, a very special type. You know, the, we have made antibodies. This is a structure of antibody. Uh, these are, what is antibody? Antibody has two heavy chains and light, two light chains held together by, yes, disulfide bonds. They are held together by disulfide bonds. Is that right? Actually, uh, scientists have developed antibodies against the digitalis. They have developed antibodies against the digitalis. Now, this portion of antibody is called FAB, the fragment which binds with the antigen. And this is called FC fragment. Now, what we really do, that scientists have developed antibodies against the digoxin so that these antibodies can bind the digoxin here and bind the digoxin here, right? And this tail, FC portion, is digested away. So this antibody is available like this, right? This antibody is called that DG bind. What is the name of this antibody? DG digoxin bind. DG bind, right? What are these? These consist of uh, FAB portions, fragments, antigen binders, right? And what is antigen? Digoxin. So you give injection of this immune material that is FAB antibodies or DG bind to the patient, right? So that it can go and bind with the digoxin and then digoxin no more available to act on the myocardium. Is that right? There is one problem. The digoxin has a long half-life and DG bind has a relatively shorter half-life because DG bind has shorter half-life. So what really happens that we have to repeat this injection of this uh, DG bind again and again until digitalis toxicity is really terminated. Am I clear? So again, in a nutshell, how you manage the digitalis toxicity? First of all, stop digitalis. Number two, correct the electrolyte balance. Number three, that if they are tachyarrhythmias, control them by phenotyne or lidocaine. If they are bradyarrhythmia, then you control them with atropine or by pacing. And if uh, there is, you can say, too much toxicity, then you will go for what thing? Uh, DG bind, right? And they will neutralize the digoxin, which is there, what is right? Pacing, pacing no, some patients may be in severe tachyarrhythmias. Some patient may be in cardiac block. Some patient may have atrial tachyarrhythmia with nodal blocks. The classical presentation is, the classical and characteristic situation is that patient who come with atrial tachycardia with AV nodal block. If patient has atrial fibrillation with AV nodal block, it is digoxin toxicity until proved otherwise. Am I clear? Now we shall talk about other inotropic agents, right? Other inotropic agents are basically two classes. One class is the other inotropic agents which work through beta adrenergic receptors. We call them beta adrenergic agonist. Beta adrenergic agonists, right? Uh, for example, dopamine and dobutamine. Dobutamine, dobutamine, and dopamine. 
right? And another group which is there is, that is called phosphodiesterase inhibitors. They are called phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Right? And the drugs in this group are amrinone and milrinone. And milri. The point which I want to highlight that these two groups, beta adrenergic agents, agonist, and phosphodiesterase inhibitors, these are used parenterally. The only orally active inotropic agent available in USA is digitalis group, digoxin, right? And these drugs are used parenterally. First, I will talk about their mechanism of action and then few important points. You already know the parenteral means that by not orally, they are given either intravenously or intramuscularly, right? Now, let's talk about how the beta adrenergic drugs work. You know that here is beta adrenergic receptor. We have already discussed just a little repetition, right? That this will stimulate G stimulatory protein. G stimulatory will stimulate, yes, this will stimulate G stimulatory protein, especially alpha. Stimulatory and alpha stimulatory will stimulate, yes, adenylyl cyclase. That will stimulate adenylyl cyclase. And this adenylyl cyclase will convert, yes, ATP into cyclic AMP, right? So whenever there is adrenergic receptor stimulation, what is this receptor? Beta 1 adrenergic receptor, this one. Whenever beta-1 adrenergic receptor is stimulated, intracellular cyclic AMP goes up and this cyclic AMP stimulate, what is this? Protein kinase A and this protein kinase A will phosphorylate, this protein kinase A will phosphorylate which channels? This will lead to phosphorylation of calcium channels, this will lead to the phosphorylation of calcium channels and phosphorylated calcium channels remain open for longer time and there is increased intracellular loading of calcium. And you know anything which loads the myocardial cell with calcium will have eventually positive inotropic action and increase in contractility. Now the drugs which work through this pathway, these are, yes, these are the two drugs. One is dobuta mean another is dopa mean both of them are beta 1 adrenergic receptor stimulant in this way that they stimulate the g stimulatory adenylyl cyclase which increases intracellular cyclic amp rising intracellular cyclic amp overdrive protein kinase a which lead to phosphorylation of calcium channels and there is excessive calcium coming into these myocardial cells and you know that excessive calcium will lead to positive contractility. The black one is inhibiting, right? Uh, this, this is leading to phosphorylation of calcium channels. You know, uh, they are leading to phosphate binding. Calcium channels, phosphorylation. And when calcium channels are phosphorylated, there is increased calcium and flux. Is that clear? Now, as good doctor, you must know what is the difference in use of dobutamine and dopamine, right? What is the real? Dobutamine and dopamine are different that dobutamine has only action, mainly, mainly action on beta-1 adrenergic receptors. Is that right? But dopamine has number one action on dopamine receptor, less than that action on Yes, major action is on the dopamine receptor, less than that action on beta 1 receptor and least action on alpha 1 receptor. This should be very, very clear concept. Let me tell you why. Dopamine act on dopaminergic receptors as well. And dopaminergic receptors are present on renal artery smooth muscle. Dopaminergic receptors are present on renal artery smooth muscle. So. This drug stimulates the dopamine receptors and produces 
renovascular dilatation. Dopamine can produce renovascular dilation and it increases renal blood flow. So the very unique quality of dopamine is that not only by beta 1 action, attention please, that dopamine not only by its beta 1 action stimulates the heart, but due to its dopa, do, it that it, it's not really diuretic, uh, it, it is increasing the blood flow to the kidney, right? Diuretics are increasing the loss of sodium through the nephron. Now, so dopamine has an added advantage over the dopamine that it can act on the dopamine receptors and lead to renal vasodilation and improve the renal blood flow. So usually dopamine is a magic drug, it's a very useful drug when you have severe cardiac failure with hypotension because someone has severe cardiac failure with falling blood pressure and hypertension, he is going into shock. You know in shock, renal vessels constrict and renal blood flow become very less and that may lead to acute tubular necrosis, necrosis in the kidney. Again listen, let's suppose patient develop cardiogenic, he develop cardiogenic shock and due to cardiogenic shock, cardiac output become extremely low. It becomes so low that patient has rapidly falling blood pressure. If blood pressure is going very much down, intense sympathetic activity will be stimulated and this will produce strong renal vasoconstriction. If there is strong renal vasoconstriction, that will lead to dangerously reduce blood flow to the kidney and that eventually result into acute tubular necrosis. That uh, proximal convoluted tubules of the nephrons may undergo necrosis due to extremely low blood flow and oxygen supply, right? And that may precipitate renal failure. So again, listen. Any patient who has very severe hypotension has a risk of renal failure. You understand it? If someone has cardiac failure plus he has hypotensive episode, with that risk of renal failure, immediately give dopamine. dopamine. On one side, dopamine, dopamine will stimulate heart. So, dopamine as double action drug. Number one, it is good for heart and number two, it is good for the blood flow to kidney. Right? So next time if someone says that your patient has very severe cardiac failure with hypotension and you want to give inotropic support to the heart, which drug you will give? Dopamine. Dopamine. But if another patient, very severe cardiac failure but hypotension is not there, the drug is dobutamine. So these are the minimum you should know about them. The most important clinical point, it's worth repeating again and again. Severe cardiac, intractable severe cardiac failure without hypertension, dobutamine. Severe intractable cardiac failure, systolic cardiac failure with severe hypertension, drug of choice is dopamine. Drug of choice is dopamine. Now, these beta-1 adrenergic drugs, they are used in certain special clinical settings. For example, these drugs are used when there is severe and reversible heart failure. For example, in patient who are in the cardiac surgery, right? Post cardiac surgery patient. Post cardiac surgery. Suppose you have done the cardiac surgery and after the surgery, heart is beating very poorly, right? For a while, you can really put the heart on Dobutamine or dopamine? dopamine? No, it depends on the blood pressure. If patient has been under cardiac surgery and heart is having low cardiac output, check the blood pressure. If blood pressure is not less, not falling, dobutamine. If it is falling, dopamine. Other condition is post MI. Patient gets severe myocardial infarction and then he goes into shock. If a patient after myocardial infarction goes into shock, the drug of, now what you have to do? You have to support the patient, is that right? Inotropically, right? And again, if with the shock he has developed the risk of, uh, there is too much hypertension, then the drug of choice is dopamine, right? Yes, please. If a patient has high blood pressure, post cardiac surgery, don't use these drugs because increasing the Increasing the cardiac output will further increase the blood pressure, 
Is that right? Okay. Then third situation is another patient who has very severe intractable cardiac failure and you have decided for the transplant. Right? So he is waiting for transplant maybe after two weeks. During these two weeks, you can bridge this time by supporting the patient inotropically by dobutamine or dopamine depending upon the blood pressure. Right? So third indication is that in refractory heart failure, these drugs can be used as a bridge to cardiac transplant. These, these drugs can be used as a bridge for cardiac transplant. Is that right? Now, the major problem with these drugs. The very major problem with these drugs is that if you are using these drugs for longer time, beta-1 adrenergic receptors will undergo down regulation. Look, any receptor, if you stimulate it too much, this may undergo down regulation. So if I have a severe heart failure and you are treating me by dopamine or dobutamine intravenously, these drugs are given as intravenous infusions, right? Sooner or later, uh, there will be severe down regulation of adrenergic receptors and when receptors undergo down regulation, do you think drug will be effective? No. no. So problem is, the real serious problem with these dopamine and dobutamine is that uh, by using these drugs continuously, you lead to the down regulation of beta adrenergic receptors and when these receptors are down regulated, that leads to failure of drug action. That is why these drugs are mostly used intermittently. They cannot be used regularly over the months and years. They are used intermittent, intermittently. Intermittently means they are used off and on. When patient gets into very severe failure, you use these drugs. But you have to wean off the patient from the drug. You have to take off the patient from these drugs. Beta adrenergic receptors, and if these receptors are down regulated, they disappear from here and they are not functional. Can these drugs work? No. So, that is why you use this drug for one week, then you stop using it. Then, later on, whenever patient goes into severe cardiac failure, again you use it. They cannot be used on a regular basis. The drug which can be used, for a positive anotropic drug which can be used on a regular basis and orally, uh, that is the digoxin. Clear? And again, I told you you have to be careful with that drug. Now, Phosphodiesterase inhibitors, let's talk about this, emerinone and milrinone. They are used only for very short time in very, very severe cardiac failure. They are never used these days for very long time. Long term use is absolutely contraindicated. Why? They have seen that long term use of milrinone and emerinone increases the mortality. Probably it loads the myocardial cell with too much calcium. You know the mechanism of action of milrinone and emerinone? That cyclic AMP is destroyed by an enzyme called into AMP. The enzyme is phosphodiesterases. These phosphodiesterases are inhibited by these phosphodiesterases which break down the cyclic AMP. These phosphodiesterases are Inhibited by, yes, inhibited by melrinon and, and emery non. Right, yes, coffee can also do the same thing. That coffee, caffeine can also inhibit some of the phosphodiesterases. Uh, that inhibits very mildly and increase, uh, slight increase in cyclic AMP, right, when you use coffee, caffeine. Right, but they inhibit phosphodiesterases strongly and increase intracellular cyclic AMP, which again translates into more phosphorylation of calcium channels and further loading of the calcium, which will act as positive anotropic situation. Right? So this was all about the positive inotropic agents. All the positive inotropic agent increase intracellular calcium load in the myocardial cell. Only orally available is digoxin and others are available parenteral juice, right? Among them, these are used intermittently. These are used only when patient is intractable failure where dopamine and dobutamine are not working well and we add this drug, milrinone and emerinone, 
phosphodiesterase inhibitors are always used for short term because long term use increases mortality.